the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is top, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Dark Future. The feeling of foreboding Hal Parker had felt when he'd entered the fortune teller's tent was stronger than ever when he left. And as he shouldered his way down the Tanbark Lane between the carnival concessions, he tried to put his finger on it. After all, he was in the clear, comfortable and sure of himself in one of the new suits he purchased. And there was still well over $29,000 in new bills back in his hotel room. Twenty-nine out of the 30,000 he'd uh, withdrawn from the Midland Bank. So it was ridiculous to feel this way. Crazy to imagine he saw something strange and accusing in the dark eyes of Jaru, the Hindu fortune teller. But as he walked up to Millie at the orange age stand, the nervous, depressed feeling was still there. Right. Put the orange What's the matter with you? Nothing. Why? You look like some bad man stole all your marbles. How about some orange aid? Extra special tonight. We're using orange. <laughs> okay. Do you want a Cupid doll? Yeah, it costs me five bucks. You want it? Mm, thanks. Here you are. One dime. Okay. Oh, gosh, you seem to be out of change. Uh, can you break a ten? Yeah, I guess so. The carnival keeps us in change. They have to. The customers sure don't. Fifty, one, two, three, four, five, and ten. Millie. Yeah? About our day tonight. Would it be all right to make it tomorrow night instead? Uh, oh, I thought you had something on your mind. It's a, a business appointment. I'm sorry to do it. Oh, but... don't mind me, Angel. I'll make out. Lorana and I will go to our room together and she can tell my fortune. Ought to be an exciting evening. <laughs> Of course, you couldn't tell her what made it so important, could you, Hal? That when Jaru, the crystal gazer, suggested you see him after closing time, there was a look in his eyes, something in his deep, quiet voice that cut through the gloom of his tent like one of the oriental daggers hanging on the wall. The lights of the carnival concessions are winking out one by one when you walk up to the entrance to find Jaru waiting. Salam, Sahib Parker. I am grateful you have decided to honor me once more. You, uh, you said you had something more to tell me. Yes. Here is the inner chamber. You will sit on the chair, please. What is it, Jaru? Perhaps it is not important. But then that is for the crystal to tell. Go on. As you wish, Sahib. When you were here before, I tell you many things. I see in the crystal a house of money. Is that so important? Patience, Sahib. Also, crystal gave me a name of bank. A name like Midland Bank, yes? The crystal? 
Why don't you be honest, Joe Rue? I mentioned to Millie Olmstead. She told her roommate, Marana. Marana told you. So let's forget the hocus-pocus about the crystal, shall we? Your manner has changed since you were here before, Sahib. But we will go on. I see now in crystal the face of another man who worked in the same bank. I see also a name like, how you say, Macy. John Macy? What about him? He is being punished for stealing much money. Thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. That was in the paper six months ago. So what? You spend much money, Sahib. Too much for men who work for other men. That is funny thing, yes? Yeah? Is that all you have to tell me? For the present. But Jaru is hopeful you will be interested in further reading. The crystal never rests. Are you asking me to come back? Tomorrow night, at this hour. Sorry, Jaru, I'm afraid I... You can't... will be here tomorrow night, Sahib? I see. Uh, what do I owe you for the reading? Mm, nothing, Sahib. This is... How you say? On the house? You manage to appear calm as you leave the tent, hoping somehow that Jaru doesn't realize how close he is to the truth. It's unbelievable, Hal, that now, six months after you told yourself it was all over, Six months after you watched John Macy go to prison for the money you embezzled, this man can smile across the table and tell you things that no one, even at the height of Macy's trial, even suspected. Almost as if Jalu actually saw it in the crystal ball. The next afternoon at the bank, Mr. Wilsey, the manager, calls you into his office. And you find there's a more concrete basis for Jaru's revelation. Yes, Mr. Wilsey. Oh, oh, Hal, uh, this is Inspector Dale. How do you do? Inspector? And uh, Mrs. John Macy. Mrs. Macy? Oh, oh, uh, oh, yes, how do you do? My husband, John, he told me a great deal about you, Mr. Parker. Yes, we, uh, we were good friends. I know. That's why I suggested to Mr. Wilsey that you'd be the best one to help us. Oh, Inspector Dale here has run on to something, Hal. I want you to take this list of serial numbers, have it mimeographed, and distribute it to all the tellers. Yes, sir. Now, you don't have to tell them why, but uh, all currencies to be checked against the list immediately. And if any bills are taken in carrying those numbers, I'm to be notified right away. Well, of course. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilsey, I, I don't mean to be inquisitive, but... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. We didn't intend hiding anything from you. Uh, these serial numbers were taken from some of the stolen bills. The first we've been able to locate. Don't you see, Mr. Parker? If we can find out who turned them in or, or trace them back to him some way, John will be cleared. Well, I, uh, I hope so, uh, Mrs. Macy, especially for your sake. But I, uh, well, frankly, I went over your husband's records myself at the time. And the evidence was so conclusive. The records were doctors. Someone else right here at the bank now, must have... Now, now, Mrs. Macy, please. We're all trying to help. The inspector here is working hard in the case, and Hal and I will do everything we can to help. Won't we, Hal? Yes, yes, I will personally take care of everything, Mrs. Macy. We'll do everything we can. With the prologue of Dark Future... The Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now here's some hot weather mathematics for drivers. Take the temperature of the day, add 2,800 degrees, the temperature inside the cylinder head of the average motor. That adds up to a lot of heat. Good reason why the cooling system of your car has to be in top condition for summer driving. If yours hasn't been checked recently, why not drop by your signal dealers for an inspection? Perhaps your radiator has become choked with sludge and rust. If so, signal stations have special radiator cleaning compound to restore cooling efficiency. To stop small leaks, signal dealers have radiator sealers. And even new cars should add rust preventive to the radiator to guard against future corrosion. 
Also, signal dealers have finest quality fan belts and radiator hoses and will install them while you wait. You see, signal stations are much more than places to fill up with signal's famous go-farther gasoline and signal premium motor oil. Wherever you see signal's circle sign in yellow and black, there you'll also find complete signal service and fine quality accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the whistler. a better explanation for Jaru's vision in the crystal ball, wasn't there? A more concrete one involving the discovery of several of the bills you passed in a nearby town when you bought those clothes. And a small item in the newspaper Jaru must have seen before he called you in for the uh, private reading. Yes, pal, you were careful. And you're still pretty sure that the bills you spent in other cities cannot be traced back to you. You leave the corridor outside Mr. Wilsey's office, walk back toward your teller's cave, and then with your hand on the door, it hits you. The bill, Hal. That $10 bill you gave to Millie last night. The only stolen bill directly traceable to you. It's Connor. Yes, Mr. Parker? If anyone asks for me, tell them I'll be back in a few minutes. Get Reeves to take over. The carnival is just beginning to come to life, making preparations for opening when you arrive 15 minutes later and run up to the orangeade stand. Millie! Well, what are you doing here in the daytime? Millie, will you do me a favor? Huh? Uh, you remember the orangeade I brought here last night? Yeah. Uh, I paid, it, paid for it with a $10 bill. Oh, broke, huh? Well, it serves no, you no, like... No, 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 listen, I've got to have it back, that bill. I'll give you singles for it. But I don't carry cash around with me. What did you do with it? Think, Millie, what did you do with all it? All right, all right, I'm trying. Gee, that ten. Oh, I know, I, I gave it to Marana. Marana, your roommate, you gave it to her. Well, what's so terrible about that? She had a lot of change and she wanted to change it for a ten. Why? How should I know? Why not ask her? Here she is now. Marana, you want to speak with me, Mem Said? Yes, Marana. Remember that ten spot I gave you last night? Ten spot? The ten dollar bill. Oh. Oh, yes. Have you got it with you? No, Saeed. Where is it? I give it to Jaru, Saeed. Jaru? He asked me for it, Saeed. Is it something wrong? I, uh... No, 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 no. It's, it, it's nothing. I'll ask Jaru himself about it. Uh, if I see him tonight. Well, Saeed. You have honored me for a third time. I'm grateful. You asked me to come back. Suppose we don't waste time on this Hindu magic. What do you got to tell me? I will not, as you say, waste time. It is my business to read future in crystal. But... Yeah. But in your case, Sahib, I find future is not clear. You see, trouble is not child of future. She is child of past. And Cristo shows past very clearly. I see. Much more clear than last night, Saeed. I see last night man taking money. Perhaps man was Macy. Perhaps man was you, Saeed. Now it is clear. Man was you. You might be making a bad guess, Jaru. No, Saeed. Jaru only tells what he sees. Is that uh, all you have to tell me? Perhaps. I think, Sahib, police will have more faith in Crystal than you. Sorry, I'm not playing. Uh, is this, uh, this reading on the house, too? No, Sahib. There is a charge. How much? Fifteen thousand dollars. You must be crazy. For such money, Crystal will show brighter future for you. I don't know what they call this in India, but it's blackmail here. 
Over here, you got to have more to go on than a crystal ball, Sahib. I have more than crystal balls, Sahib. Oh? I have $10 bill. In late paper tonight, you will find list of numbers. The police are seeking further clues, Sahib. Perhaps this will... All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. All right. All right, you win. When do you want the money? Perhaps at an early hour tomorrow. I'll have it here tomorrow night. What about 7 o'clock? That would be a quiet time. We could be alone. Is this the end of it now? How do I know you won't be back at me again? You know that? Because you trust me. Yes, Sahib. In the crystal I see after tomorrow night, for you there is bright future. <laughs> You haven't much choice, have you, Hal? Jaru knows as surely as if he actually could look into the past. And that means you must pay him $15,000 to buy his silence. It's on your mind the next day at the bank. You're nervous, jittery, almost unable to do your work. But somehow you get through the day. And that night at 7, you arrive at Jaru's tent as agreed. The evening rush has not yet started, and the carnival grounds are almost deserted. You have the money under your arm and a cardboard shoebox as you slip into the tent, and Jaru rises to greet you. Salam, Sahib. For the fourth time, you have honored Jaru. Yes, Jaru. For the fourth and last time. Yes. The last time, if everything is as agreed. The money is here in the box, $15,000. I hope you never live to spend a penny of it. You should not hate the Charu. He has been, how you say, very reasonable. You stole thirty thousand dollars, I hear. Yeah, here, yeah. Fifteen thousand in new bills. Count them. I want to be sure you get every last dollar. New bills. But no, Sahib. These are the same bills you embezzled. Naturally. But I, I cannot accept these. What? I cannot be in possession of stolen money, Sahib. I could never stand it. No, Sahib, this will not do. Well, it'll have to do. I can't pay any other way. I am afraid you must find another way, Sahib. How? Where can I get $15,000 in different bills? In the bank where you work. You can make, how you say, an exchange. What do you take me for? That'll be a dead giveaway in my finish. No, that's out. It is the only way, unless you desire to go to prison. Oh. Oh, if I don't do as you say, you'll go to the police. You leave me no choice, Sahib. You've gone too far, Jaru. I'm caught either way. You give me no choice. I have no. Put down that knife. Convenient to you to have these daggers hanging around your tent, Jaru. Perfect for what I have to do. Stop. You are insane. Get away. Oh, Jaru, you saw too much in that crystal ball. Much too much. No, I... You've done it, Hal. Added murder to theft. And you stand there trying to collect your senses. You gaze around vacantly, then wipe your fingerprints from the knife, put it back in its scabbard, and all the while your mind gropes for a way out of this, a means of escape. Suddenly you remember your date with Millie. You were to pick her up at 7.30, drive her to the carnival ground. You look at your watch, your mind forming an idea. You stoop down, take the incriminating $10 bill from Jaru's pocket. Toss it into the shoebox with the new bills Jaru refused. As you slip outside and walk to your car, you know exactly what you must do. And speeding toward Millie's apartment, you pray that you can get away with it. At 7.30, you stop the car a block away from Millie's apartment and hurry into a drugstore phone booth. This is the important step, Hal, the move that will count the most. I wish to please talk with Munsahid Mirana. Mirana? Oh, sure, just a minute. Mirana is for you. I think it's your room. For me? Thank you. Hello? This is Mirana. Salam, Munsahid Mirana. This is Jaru. Jaru? Yes, Munsahid. I'm calling from uh, what you call drugstore. The one near the carnival. I have an appointment with Sahib Parker for crystal reading at 7 o'clock. Oh? It is now half past the hour. Have you seen him, Marana? No, Sahib. But he is to be here soon. 
Then Sahib Parker did not intend to keep appointment. Jarrod does not like this. Shall I say you call? It is of no matter. Goodbye, Mung Sahib. You smile as you hang up, don't you, Hal? Because the trick, your imitation of the dead Jaru, seemed to work perfectly. And you've established the fact that Jaru was alive at 7.30. It could be impossible for you to have killed him and then call for Millie far across town only a few minutes later. You hurry to your car, drive the one block to Millie's apartment. Your hand trembles as you knock on the door. If Millie and the Marana are convinced that it was Jaru they spoke to, you've nothing to worry about. Oh, come in, Hal. I'm almost ready. Ah. I'll be with you in a moment. Oh, you coming along, Marana? No, I have called for taxi cab. What for? There's plenty of room in the car for three. No, and Saeed. You have proverb here. Two is company, three is crowd. Marana takes taxi. It will be here soon. Marana sees it, you Hal. Oh? What is it? What have I done? Tell him, Marana. To me, Saeed, you have done nothing. To Jaru, you have failed to keep appointment. He's angry. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I forgot, and then I had something to do with my apartment, and before I knew it, it was past seven. I barely had time to make it here. Jaru phoned Marana a few minutes ago. He said you didn't intend to keep the appointment. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll apologize when I see him. I will leave you now. Taxi will be waiting. Okay, Marana. See you in about half an hour. <laughs> You know, Millie, they're funny people. Marana and Ja Ru. Uh, I wouldn't worry about them. You said you were sorry. Yeah. What have you told Marana about me? Oh, this is to work at the Midland Bank. She didn't know what to tell her was. I had to draw a picture. Put you in a cage. <laughs> How well do you know Marana? Oh, just since the carnival came here. I got the soft drink concession by offering to share my apartment with Marana. Sort of a bride, but with rooms as scarce as they are. Yeah. Uh, what kind of a girl is she? Mm, hard to tell. Doesn't say much. Sensitive about her accent, I guess. Anyway, she goes her way and I go mine. Oh, here we are. Yeah, 8 o'clock on the dot. How? How look over there. What's wrong? Huh? There's a loose tent. There's a crowd gathered. Business can't be that good. I wonder... Hey, come on, let's get over there. <laughs> Come on, Hal, inside. Right with you, Millie. Well, hello. What is it? What's happened? You're Millie, eh? Millie Olmstead, that's right. And you're, uh, Parker? Yeah, why? What's it all about? I'm Lieutenant Adams. Adams, homicide. There's been a murder. Murder? Not so Yeah, that's his name. He was stabbed with one of these oriental daggers. Happened sometime within the past hour, as far as we can tell right now. I understand you people knew him pretty well. Who told you that? I never knew him before the carnival got here. I know. Your roommate, that Mirana, told us about you. How about you, Parker? Oh, I didn't know him very well either. He gave me a couple of readings, that's all. Uh Uh-huh. As a matter of fact, I had an appointment with him tonight at 7. I didn't keep it. No? Can you prove that? Of course he can. It's all for me at 7.30. You wouldn't have had time for a reading and then drive all the way to my place. Yeah, and Ja Rule was alive at 7.30, Lieutenant. How do you know that? Well, when I got to Millie's, he just phoned. Millie spoke to him. So did Marana. I see. Well, that leaves us exactly nowhere. And I'm afraid we won't find the answer to Ja Rule's murder in a crystal ball. <laughs> return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since most of us do a lot more driving during this warm summer weather, I'd like to say a word about an item that has a lot to do with your driving pleasure, gasoline. Wherever you travel on the Pacific coast, from Canada to Mexico, you'll find Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Almost 2,000 friendly dealer-owned Signal stations stand ready to serve you and honor your Signal credit card. And remember, when you power your car with Signal, you not only enjoy Signal's famous mileage, but also the thing which makes that mileage possible, 
extra engine efficiency. And, of course, extra engine efficiency means more thrilling performance from your car. That's why Signal says, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two points to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. It's almost over, isn't it, Hal? The terrible nightmare you've been going through since the first time you talked to Jaru. Discovered that he knew of your embezzlement at the Midland Bank. That he would turn you over to the police unless you gave him $15,000. A little more than an hour ago, you were here in the tent with Jaru. But Lieutenant Adams doesn't know that. And you're certain that he never will know, aren't you, Hal? Because your imitation of Jaru's voice in a phone call to Millie and Marana brought the dead crystal gazer to light, placed the time of his murder a half hour later than when you actually killed him. And that half hour gave you time to get back across town to pick up Millie. And so you've won, Hal. The lieutenant has eliminated you as a suspect. You stand by calmly, watching as he continues his routine check. The lieutenant leaves, and you talk quietly with Millie. Then the lieutenant returns with Marana. Oh, glad you waited, Parker. I have a few more questions, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. I'll do whatever I can to help. Now, on this appointment you had with Jeru, why didn't you keep it? Well, I was late. I had to be at Millie's by 7.30. Uh-huh. He was there right on time, Lieutenant. At 7.30 sharp, huh? Just before Jaru was murdered. That's right. Like I said, Jaru called Millie and Marana here. He was talking to them practically as I arrived. Isn't that so, Marana? It would seem to be so, Sahib. What do you mean, seem? You were annoyed at me because of what Ja Ru said. You wouldn't even ride down here with us. Marana was more than annoyed, Parker. She was puzzled. After that call, she wanted time to think. Figure things out for herself. That is right, Sahib. I have to know why this was done. Why what was done? What are you saying, Marana? You talked to Ja Ru, didn't you? No, Sahib. I talk to you. What? Me? I don't talk like Ja Ru. You did on the telephone, Parker. What was it he said, Marana? He say, like Ja Ru always talk, Salam, Men Sahib, Marana. I am calling from what you call drugstore. But, but Hal doesn't talk like that. What are you telling us, Marana? Yes, that's ridiculous. Couldn't have been anyone else but Ja Ru. You better explain, Marana. All these people, Sahib, you will make them step back. Sure. Jim, yeah? move the crowd back, will you? Get them away from here. I don't know what this is all about. What Ja Ru said, that's exactly how he talks, isn't it, Marana? Sure, to the general public, but not to me, you dope. All this lingo's been an ass with us. He'd never talk like that to me. His name wasn't Ja Ru, it's Joe Thompson, and he was my uncle. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life. Possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Stanley Waxman. Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Gene Fomhurst. Music by Wilbur Hatch. 
and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Bonnet Margarine and Tender Leaf Tea present the Fred Allen Show with Fred's guest, Mr. James Mason, Portland Hoffa, Minerva Pius, Peter Donald, Parker Fenley, the DeMarcos, Al Goodman, his orchestra, and Kenny Delmar. Here's one of today's shopping problems easily solved. Just remember this. If you're worried because your children aren't eating enough vegetables, because you realize how important vegetables are in a well-rounded diet, Listen carefully. You can now give your children the goodness of eight different vegetables in a delicious drink they'll love. Just give them B8 vegetable juices. B8 is one of the most enticing drinks that's ever been concocted. And here's the important thing. Every tempting sip of B8 contains the goodness from eight different vegetables. Tomatoes and beets of the red variety, lettuce, spinach, watercress, parsley, and celery of the leafy green variety, carrots of the yellow variety. Thus, when you serve V8, your children get both the goodness and variety of eight different vegetables. Get V8 vegetable juices tomorrow. Give it to your children for lunch, dinner, between meals. They'll love V8, and it's really good for them. Ladies and gentlemen... Statistics show that today, American colleges are crowded worse than ever before. Tonight, we present a man who never went to college, and he still has no class. He's Fred Allen. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At Portland, I heard your news scoop at the opening of the program there about the colleges being jammed. Oh, Mama says it's a good sign. Colleges being crowded is a good sign. Mama says if enough people go to college... They'll get smart. Everybody will know what Philip Morris smokers know. You really? <laughs> You mean in just uh, four years you could acquire that? Huh? Say, I wonder... I wonder... I wonder how many packs of Philip Morris's you have to smoke before you know it all. Well, Portland... I should have quit when there was nothing going on. Well, <laughs> well Portland, apart from food conservation, what is in the news this week? Somebody invented a meat substitute. It's called a Truman Burger. Oh, I saw that. A Truman Burger. I saw that. I wonder how they make a Truman Burger. Well, I... Don't let this get out. But I got the recipe from Charlie Luckman. The, uh, this is the recipe for the Truman Burger. The president puts two slices of bread on the piano, and then he plays one meatball. It's funny. Today, food is important. What's funny? Well, they used to throw it at actors. Well, <laughs> that's what chased Jack Benny out of vaudeville, you know. Who? When they started to can it. <laughs> uh, speaking of Jack reminds me, did you hear Jack Parr this week? You mean the mad, mad thing? <laughs> uh-huh. He said you were so old, Boy Scouts had to help you across the street. Well, I hope that got a better laugh on Pa's program where he could... He uh, said you were mad at the younger generation. Well, Brother Pa may be a member of the younger generation, Portland, but he's telling the older generation's jokes. But enough, enough about the male Joan Davis. <laughs> this is getting to sound, you know, the, the East may fight the West before this is... This is uh, this is uh, uh, getting to sound as though the program was coming from another network, which it may any minute, the way it looks. <laughs> I think I had better start for Alan's Alley. What is your question tonight? Well, this week, as you may have read, the Better Business Bureau is completing its 25th year of service. 
Thousands of cases of fraud in real estate, stocks, and other get-rich-quick schemes have been prosecuted. And so our question tonight is, have you ever been swindled by a disciple of sharp practice? Shall we go? As the man said when his wife grabbed his money at the racetrack, you bet. <laughs> Here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. Senator Claghorn's gavel is on the front steps. I guess he doesn't give a rap tonight. Well, uh, well, let's knock. Who is it? I say, who is it calling on old Senator Claghorn? Oh, it's you, well, son. Well, Senator. Speak up, son. I got to hop to it. I'm busier than a pump handle during a temperance picnic. <laughs> You, uh... I'm uh, writing a book. Writing a book? Well, uh, Senator Wiley of Wisconsin wrote a book called Laughing with Congress. Yes. My book's called Chuckling with Claghorn. Chuckling well, with Claghorn. I got one joke in my book. It's about the farmer. His land was so poor, he had to spread it with fertilizer before he could raise a fuss on it. Do well, you mean that? <laughs> well, that's a belly whopper, son. Well, Start hooting and hollering. Yeah? Lean against something and watch your buttons pop. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Look, Senator, about this fraud business, have you ever been swindled? Well, son, back in 42, I was rooked to a fairly well by the slickest flim flamming Tom Pepper that ever wore sideburns and bear grease on his hair. Well, how, this is one man you're describing now. Uh. How did, uh, how did, <laughs> how did he cheat you, Senator? Well, I was running for office. This thimble rigger says, Flaghorn, if you want to get in, I'm your man. He could fix the election? I had a ballot box with a fire going in it and built in votes. A fire? As they were deposited in the ballot box, the fire burned up all the other candidates' votes. And the built-in votes? They was all for me. You, uh, you couldn't lose. I was going in like Happy Chandler at a ball game. Oh. Fine. I bought 200 ballot boxes with the built-in votes from this jack leg. Yes. The day of the election, something went wrong. With your fake ballot boxes, you didn't go in? I went in, son. Yes? I went in for 30 days. So long, so long, I did. Well, that probably explains the senator's pallor. Well, I wonder if Mr. Moody's still up. Howdy, Bob. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Moody, have you ever been the victim of a fraud? Why, only once. Uh, what happened? Well, one time I had to go up to New York to buy some new sport jackets for my scarecrows. <laughs> well, I was gimping up Broadway with a big wad of money in my shoe. Uh-huh. And the fellow... A fellow wearing a checkered suit and a jazz bow tie, he pulled me into a doorway. I see. He says, Charlie, how'd you like to have security in your old age? Security, huh? Yeah. He says, Charlie, how'd you like to own your own toll bridge? <laughs> your own toll bridge? Yeah. When they're coming across, he says, Charlie, they'll be coming across for you. You, uh, you... <laughs> You fell for it? Yeah. I took off my shoe, and I give that oily cuss all my money. For nothing? Well, he gave me a blue uniform, a whistle, a rocking chair, and a collapsible turnstile. A (laughs) A turnstile, eh? Took me to a bridge. It was uptown, 175 streets. 170... Why, that's the George Washington Bridge. Yeah, named for president. Yes, it was. I set up my turnstile, sat back in my rocking chair, and started blowing my whistle to collect my toes. What, uh, what happened? Why, cars kept shooting by me. Nobody stopped to pay nothing. You were on the New York side? Yes, yes. What did you do? Well, when I closed up my turnstile for lunch, I walked to the other end of the bridge. Uh-huh. And I seen right away what the trouble was. Well, what was the trouble? Three fellas with turnstiles at the other end was collecting all the toes. <laughs> The Jersey end? And it only goes to prove... To prove what? If you're thinking of opening a toll bridge across the Hudson... Yes? Don't open up on the New York side. You mean the money... The money is all at the other end? Yeah. People will pay anything to get out of Jersey. So long, <laughs> Well, Titus has something there, and he's sure welcome to it. Hey, let's, uh... Let's try this next door. 
Mrs. Nussbaum, have you ever been involved in a swindle? Only once. Uh Uh-huh. Like a greenhorn, I'm getting hoodwinked. Well, how? I'm seeing advertised the contest. Uh Uh-huh. Write a jingle winner cash prize. Oh, do you write music, do you? Mostly a ballad. Oh, but what... (laughs) What are some of your ballads? It shouldn't be nothing fancy. Just a little grass shack on the Lancy. (laughs) I, uh, I see. I am sending you best wishes with this little dish of knishes. Very (laughs) nice. And then I wrote... Then you wrote? (laughs) A herring, a hacienda, and you. Oh, that sounds... (laughs) Tell me, what, uh, what about this jingle contest? I am writing... Remember the letters F and E for Fafel, Noodles, and Epstein's Tea. Lindy's Restaurant saves all three. Fafel, Noodles, and Epstein's Tea. Tell me, what, uh, what happened when you mailed in your jingle? Monkey business is ensuing. <laughs> My jingle they are taking. Someone stole it? They are altering a bistle. Well, how do you... How do you know? Tonight I'm turning on my radio, I'm hearing... Remember the letters F and E for flavor, nutrition, economy. Now, wait a minute. Wait, why, that's a direct steal. What program was it? Who knows? Just as I'm listening, you are knocking on my door. Thank you. (laughs) Well, that brings us that brings us to the little shanty at the end of the alley. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Well, Mr. Cassidy, you look tired. Oh, I was up all night at the U.N. I talked with Vyshinsky for eight hours. What could you possibly talk to Vyshinsky about? Oh, we had one thing in common. One thing? I couldn't understand Vyshinsky. And? Vyshinsky couldn't understand me. Well, tell me, Ajax, have you ever been the victim of a hawks or a swindle? Well, no, not personally, me boy, but a friend of mine was homogenized through the mail. <laughs> homogenized? The milk of human kindness was soured in his veins. <laughs> Who was this friend? Dr. Princess McGee, the famous surgeon. Oh, I've heard of him. What happened? Well, a nefarious operator of a bucket shop in Brockville Center. Yes. He sold Dr. McGee sight unseen a Texas oil well. Well, where did the swindle come in? Well, the minute Dr. McGee bought the oil well, he started receiving urgent telegrams collect from Texas. Important messages? Oh, the first one said, send $2,000, Derek fell down. The next? Send $3,000, drill is bent. And then? Looks like a gusher. Send $5,000, need battles. <laughs> well, after the doctor sent all this money for his well, what happened? With the suddenness of a crescendo, the telegram stopped. Oh, gosh. Oh, the doctor called in the FBI. Yes. The well was non-existent. So the doctor lost $10,000 in the phony well. Oh, sure, it served him right. How come? The doctor should take care of the sick and let the well alone. Good morning. <laughs> well, to do, we turn to greet the five DeMarco sisters, ably abetted by Maestro Al Goodman, the DeMarco sing Kate. Girl? How much longer must he wait, Kate, till you let him know his fate? Hey, Kate, the sun's down, the moon's out, there's no one inside. My question, the answer, tonight is the night at nine o'clock. You know you had a date, Kate. He's been here since half past eight, Kate. He came a little bit early, just couldn't wait. Has he come too early, too late?
And now, ladies and gentlemen, a few hints for assorted weather. Rain or shine the year round, the all purpose, always appropriate beverage is delicious tenderleaf tea. And the way to get even more pleasure from it is in tenderleaf tea balls. That's why tenderleaf tea balls outsell all other kinds. They are America's favorites because they are better in every way. The best part of it is that all these advantages are so practical in daily use in your home. The flavor of the tea comes first, of course. And that's famous for flavor tenderleaf brand tea. Richer, more fragrant, more delicious. The crisp, clean, white individual packets are tasteless filter paper. That gives you convenience, efficiency, ease in serving, and flawless, crystal clear tea in your cup, filtered as it's made. Keep a supply of these better tea balls on hand for every occasion, for family meals, for guests, and especially for those dark blue days when you need quick comfort in a hurry. One tenderleaf tea ball in your cup, boiling water, and there you are. Yes, for every good reason, ask for tenderleaf brand tea ball. That was just a sample of Almost Like Being in Love, played by Maestro Al Goodman and his U.N. Orchestra. U.N. meaning Union Nudniks. <laughs> now, say, uh, Portland. Yes? Will you keep things going until they get the horses set up on the Manhattan merry-go-round? Where's my beret and my bamboo cane? Where's Are you my... going out? Yes, I have to run over to see James Mason. I've written a movie for Mr. Mason. You know, it may be his first American picture. How did you ever get James Mason to go into your picture? Well, la if you won't let this get out, I'll tell you. Last Tuesday, I finished writing my scenario, and I started over to the Mason apartment. I was... This must be the place. I guess Mr. Mason is at home, too. This sign on the door says, Odd Man In. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll knock, see what happens. Hello, Fred. Well, James Mason. <laughs> James, I, uh, I haven't seen you since you were on my program last June. What have you been up to? Well, I spent a very nice summer out on the island. On the island? Long Island? Coney Island. <laughs> you spent the entire summer at Coney Island? Yes, it was thrilling. Thousands of people milling around on the boardwalk. Millions of people sitting on the sand and on each other. <laughs> did, did, uh, did you go into the water? They have water there? <laughs> oh, yes. I must tell my wife. She will be surprised. Oh, yes, some Sundays at Coney Island, it's so crowded, the tide uh, can't even come in. The tide has to go over to Far Rockaway and come in twice. <laughs> but tell me, what, uh, what else have you been doing? I attended the World Series. An Englishman at the World Series? Did, uh, did you like it? Yeah, I've never, never had such music in all my life. M music? Yes, Guy Lombardo's orchestra, excellent. And the way that Lucy Monroe sang your national anthem, it brought me to my feet. It did, really? What, uh, what happened after Lucy finished singing? Oh, a lot of chaps in bloomers started running around. <laughs> there was no more music, so I went home. Well, tell me, while you were in the park, did you try one of our American hot dogs at the no, park? No, no. To me, a hot dog on a roll looks like an Indian's finger lying in state. <laughs> Did, uh, didn't you eat anything at the World Series? As I was leaving the park, the whole Brooklyn crowd was yelling, Cookie. Cookie? And you didn't turn back? I never eat dessert, old boy. <laughs> Well, James, I'll tell you why I'm here. Now, you, you haven't been working lately, have you? No, not in pictures, but I've been on several radio programs. Oh, really? What uh, programs? Well, I appeared on Take It or Leave It. Well, how did you make out? Just as I was about to try for the $64... Yes? Some chap in the audience shouted, You'll regret it! <laughs> you, re you tried for the $64? Yes. And what happened? That chap in the audience was correct. <laughs> You regretted it? I also regretted the giant jackpot. You regretted it? <laughs> Tell me, were you on any other programs? I'm going to be on another program this week. Oh, with uh, Jack Eigen? Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't come to that, sir. Yeah. Um, it's a little thing called Information Please. Oh. 
I'm worried about answering those questions. Oh, it's nothing, James. I've been on information, please, ten times, and I don't know anything. Yeah, but with me, it's different, Fred. Different how? I'm stupid. <laughs> well, look, James, if you want to be able to answer every question on that program, why don't you try my system? What's your system, Fred? When I'm on information, please, I go to the studio ten minutes early. I walk in, hang up my hat, go over to the guest table, sit down in a big chair, lean over to John Kieran, and I say, John, what do you know? <laughs> Well, by the time John Kieran gets through telling you what he knows, you can't miss a thing on that program. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. I'll try that. Well, now, now let's get down to business, James. I, uh, I have written a picture for you. Now, I'm only good in certain types of stories, Fred. Well, I sense that, James, and my picture is definitely for you. It will be bigger than I married a zombie. Ah. <laughs> What's the story about, Fred? Well, the picture opens with a fanfare. <laughs> J. Arthur Allen Pictures Limited presents James Mason in The Perfect Crime. I am Norbert Nottingham, known to Scotland Yard as Nobby the Nark. <laughs> Sitting here in Old Bailey waiting to be hanged, I cursed the fate that sealed my doom. I had planned the perfect crime. Something went wrong. What? <laughs> That day at home, after I'd worked out my crime in detail, I rang for my faithful houseboy, Chung. Oh, you ring on Mr. Nottingham? Yes, Chung. Sir Stafford Pipps, the inventor, will be here any minute. Oh, very good. When he comes, Chung, I want you to go out into the garden and peek through the window. Oh, very good. Chung, I'm going to kill Sir Stafford. When the police arrive, you will be grilled. I want you to say that you saw Sir Stafford come in, place a paper on the table, take out a gun, and shoot himself. Do you understand? Oh, Chung, you recap. Chung, go outside, peek in the window. Please, the grill Chung. Chung, say Sir Stafford put paper on desk, uh, take out gun, and uh, shoot self. You won't forget. Not a China much a chance. My alibi was perfect. I knew I could depend on Chung. There was that little affair at Limehouse he'd rather I didn't mention. <laughs> Three o'clock. Sir Stafford would soon arrive. He was bringing the plans of an invention that would make me the richest man in the world. Someone was at the door. It was Sir Stafford. I'll open the door, Mr. Nottingham. No. Can't. I thought it was the maid's day off. It was too late to turn back. I had to commit the perfect crime. And now, King, Sir Stafford Pips. Oh, Nobby, old fig. Sir Stafford, old prune. <laughs> Have you brought the plans? Oh, right, oh. This is my greatest invention. Here are the plans. I'll take those plans, Sir Stafford. I say, Nobby, put down the gun! <laughs> the perfect crime had been committed. The plans were mine. And quickly wiping off my fingerprints, I placed the gun in Sir Stafford's hand. The maid opened the door. Mr. Nottingham, I heard a shot. I know. Blimey, it's Sir Stafford. It's suicide. You better call the police. Right, oh. I chuckled as I heard the maid on the telephone. Operator, oh, right, oh. help! Police suicide! I laughed as I heard the police on my radio. Summoning all vehicles. Summoning all vehicles. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Suicide at Norbert Nottingham Residence. Calling One Long Pan. <laughs> Greetings and shalom alakam, kiddie. <laughs> Detective, Detective One Long Pan, Oriental Dick Patrice on job. Chababa, chababa, chababa. Long, long pan, sure to get you lover. Chababa, chababa, long pan, long pan, and good voice tonight. Make Perry Como take bromo. Long pan. <laughs> Uh, I say, old boy, will you stop that singing? Who, who are you, little man? I am Norbert Nottingham. What do you do here, Mr. Norbert Nottingham? I live here. Very good. You have two dollars. You like to try for four? <laughs> this is ridiculous. You look at it. Oh, look at it. Long time solve crime in no time. What is uh, confidentially what, uh, what, uh, what is Clive? 
Sir Stafford Pipps has been shot. Very good. Long panel issue, Mr. Norbert Nottingham, for shooting Sir Stafford Nipps. Sir Stafford shot himself, you nincompoop. He, he committed suicide. Suicide. Likely story. Oh, Mr. Nottingham. Oh, ho, lady in the loom. Long pan, chuché la flemme. <laughs> Don't be silly. This is only my maid, Martha. You, you come a little closer, baby. Long pan, long pan, give you fast frisk. <laughs> Take your hands off me. You ain't no osteopath. No. <laughs> you, you fess up, Martha. What, uh, confidentially, what, what happened? I was in the kitchen cleaning a bloater. I was just reaching for the bloater's appendix when I heard a shot. Very good, very good. I ran into the study. Sir Stafford's deader than me bloater. He's done his self then. Precisely. Uh, now, can I show you to the door, Long Pan? Not so fast, Mr. Nottingham. Long Pan first examined body. Oh, ho, you see, in Sir Stafford's hand? What? A la wallower. A la wallower. A la wallower. Five, four, five, four. You bet. Long pan will ask you again, Mr. Solberg Nottingham, for murder, Sir Stafford Hoosier. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. I can produce an eyewitness. Who? Who is eyewitness? My houseboy, Chung. He saw everything. Oh, you know, Mr. Nottingham? Ho, oh, ho, China boy, Lunchman. Oh, Lunch. ho. I told you I had a perfect alibi, Long Pan. Long Pan, not entirely convinced. Story sound like bloater, practically fishy. <laughs> what did Chung say? Chung say you sent him out to tend the garden. That's right. I have two meat-eating plants. I told Chung to put napkins on the plants before he served their lamb chops. Very good. Chung, you, you in garden? What, uh, what, what you see in garden? Uh, Chung peek through window or Sir Stafford come in a study. Sir Stafford, very good. Oh, uh, Sir Stafford put paper on this. Very good. Oh, uh, Sir Stafford pull out gun and commit suicide. There's my alibi, Long Pan. Holy smoke. Chung, Chung, oh, Chung, oh, Chung, you see plenty through window. Oh, you bet. Oh, Chung, some kid, oh, peeking Tom. Chung, oh, oh, oh. Oh, long time they had lib. Long time funny bunny should be on lady. Oh, <laughs> get the big hooper. Oh, get the big hooper. Oh, big hooper. Big hooper. Long time. Okay, okay, okay. Break it up. Pipe down. Pipe down, boy. Joke over. Joke over, boy. What's wrong, long pen? Long pen, unless you, Mr. Nottingham, saw it a final time for murder, Sir Stafford Hips. But why should I kill Sir Stafford? This plan on a table. Long pan only now, just now, catch on. You see, plan X equal Y plus double loot divide by Z, multiply hypotenuse, plug in wall. You see, plan for super duper a magnet. Dad, you understand it? Long pan no small. Long <laughs> Long pan graduate CCNY. <laughs> Magna cum laundry. <laughs> Long time fly by night, Beta Kappa. You fetch up. Motive magnet. Yes, it was to be the biggest, biggest magnet in the whole world. Very good. Pointed from England in the direction of the United States, the magnet would have drawn all the gold out of Fort Knox. Holy <laughs> smoke. Holy smoke. Sir Stafford was giving it to Ernie Bevan for Christmas. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Nottingham? You kill Sir Stafford to use Magna catch him gold yourself. You plan a you you a long time catch you, you fetch up. But what about my alibi? Chung saw everything through the window. Chung say nothing. Alibi phony baloney. You mean? On window is Venetian, you see, Venetian blind. To look through Venetian blind must see through straight crack. But Chung Chung China boy. China boy eye slant. Impossible with slanting eyes to look through straight crack and Venetian blind. I give up, Long Pan. You're too much for me. Confucius say man who use Venetian blind for alibi, shady character. <laughs> Confucius spell backward, Joe Miller. Oh, oh Long Pan, hot tonight. Can you top this? Long Pan, oh, oh Long before I remind you to remember Blue Bonnet Margin and tender leaf tea on your shopping days, I want to thank Mr. James Mason for his visit tonight. Next week, our guest will be our good friend, Jack Haley. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Mr. James Mason.
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Lever Brothers Company, makers of Swan, the soap that gives you a wonderful new kind of suds, presents... Our friend Swan, with my friend Irma. Starring Mary Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. Friendship, friendship, just a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been forgotten, theirs will still be hot. My friend Irma. You know, when I went to school, I studied French, Spanish, and Latin. I always thought Latin was the most difficult thing to understand. Then I met my friend Irma. Now, don't get me wrong, because me, Jane Stacy, I love that girl. It's only that she... Well, for instance, the other night I was reading the evening paper, and I said, Irma, honey, imagine a man 84 years old just became a father for the first time. And Irma said... 84 years? Gee, what a long honeymoon. (laughs) I'll take Latin every time. Right now, Irma's staring at the calendar. Her watch has stopped, so she's probably trying to figure out what time it is. Irma, what's on your mind? Oh, Jane, honey, I just checked the calendar, and do you know today is one year since we started rooming together? A year already? Gee, I can't believe it. Let's see. Oh, of course, the 1st of December. We both agreed to share this room. Mrs. O'Reilly said the rent would be $25 for the two of us. You asked her to please make it 30 because you didn't know what half of 25 was. Well, in those days, I was much younger, didn't know as much as I do today. Yeah, yeah, honey. (laughs) Yeah, you've come a long way. Oh, thank you. Uh, But, Jane, we just can't ignore an anniversary. Uh, We should have some kind of a celebration. I know, I'll buy you a present. Oh, no, honey, it's not necessary. I appreciate the thought, but you don't. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Jane. Oh, Richard. Jane, would you mind doing me a favor? I'm away from the office, and I'm going to need some petty cash for this evening. So I've asked Peggy, you know, from the accounting department... Yeah? ...to drop $100 off at your apartment on her way home. Is that all right? Oh, sure, sure. I'll be glad to keep it for you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, I'll be by to pick up the $100 later. Bye. Bye, Richard. Uh, anything wrong, Jane? No, dear, it was Richard. He's coming by later. Let's see. Now, what were we talking about? Our anniversary... Gee, Jane, remember the fun we had when we first moved in together? Ah, I'll never forget it, Irma. We couldn't decide who would sleep in the bed by the window, so you tossed a nickel. It flew out of the window, was picked up by a fellow who was walking past. He brought it up to find out how big a reward we'd give. (laughs) Yes, wasn't that a romantic way to meet my boyfriend, Al? (laughs) Well, to me, it just goes to prove that if you don't hold on to your money, you can get into all kinds of trouble. Come in. Hello, Jane. Hiya, chicken. Hello, Al, honey. We were just talking about you. Ain't got no time for no chit-chat. Working on the hottest deal of my life. Oh, Al, not another deal. What happened to that wonderful process you had for removing the name from hotel towels? (laughs) Didn't work. Removed too much of the towel. In fact, was left with nothing but the name. But can't miss with my new deal. Well, what is it, Al? Have an invisible ink for printing the answers in school books. Can only be can only be read with special glasses. But Al, won't the teachers find out? The glasses will only be made in junior sizes. <laughs> oh, Al, you're wonderful. Gee, Jane, is it any wonder Al's my everything? Don't worry, you won't always be that poor. <laughs> oh, please, Jane, don't insult Al on our anniversary. Anniversary? Chicken, is there something about us I should know? Oh, not me and you, Al. It's Jane and I. We've been rooming together one year today. Well, this calls for a celebration. Why don't you girls make me a dinner? (laughs) No, no, we want this day to be different. You eat out. (laughs) But Jane, Al is right. We should celebrate. I know. I'll bake a cake. Irma, please, please, no. Uh, Not that you're a bad cook, but when most people bake a cake, no one can jump up and down or the cake will fall. When you bake a cake, we all have to jump up and down to get it loose from the stove. Well, I have a new recipe, and I'm going down to the grocer's and get some flour. 
I'd like to make an upside-down cake, but I don't know how to spell happy anniversary backwards. <laughs> well, just spell it the way you always do, and you can't miss. <laughs> All right, I'll... I won't say goodbye because I'll be right back. I'll just say Auf Wiedersehen. That's German for Gesundheit. <laughs> Great kid, ain't she, Jane? Oh, I think so. Of course, so many people wonder how I can keep living with a girl who thinks President Hoover invented the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and the DDT is a doctor of dentistry and teeth. And that sea biscuit was fish bait. <laughs> but then again, I've never in my life met anyone with a bigger heart with a greater warmth and an honesty of character than Irma has. I agree with you a hundred percent. Why do you think I want to make her my wife? That's because she's got a job. <laughs> Come in. It's only me, Professor Kropotkin. <laughs> Hello, Jenny and Al. Hello, Professor. Come on in. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Jenny, I hope you don't mind my stopping by for a minute. You see, the steam in my room is terrible. Steam? I didn't know you had steam in your room. Well, I haven't had it very long, but Mrs. O'Reilly just came up for the rent, and she found I couldn't pay her, so she started blowing off. <laughs> and I refused to stay in the steam room. Oh, <laughs> Professor. Well, listen, Jenny, in the steam room you get a massage, and Mrs. O'Reilly rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> Where is my darling little Irma? Well, she went out to some flour. That reminds me, if Irma's going to make a cake, I'm going to go to the drugstore and get something to go with it. Ice cream? No, bicarbonate. <laughs> I'll see you later. Ah, that Jane's a great little kidder, huh? And by the way, Professor, the girls are celebrating an anniversary. It was just a year ago today when they moved in here. Uh, and what a ray of sunshine those girls have been. When they first moved in, I was sick in bed. And then Irma came up. She rubbed my head, held my hand, and sang little songs to me. You know, to this day, I can't enjoy music unless it's off-key. <laughs> oh, hello, chicken. Back already? Oh, Al, look what I found on the street. A lady's handbag. Chicken, anybody see you pick it up? Al, I don't like the way you said that. I told you I found it. I wouldn't think of keeping it. That would be dishonest. Chicken, you're in the clear. It's only dishonest when you find something before it's lost. Oh, Al. <laughs> we must find out who lost it so we can return it. A good idea. Let's open up the handbag and find out who is the owner. Okay, empty the stuff there on the table, chicken. All right, Al. My, my, look at all the stuff a woman carries in her handbag. You know, it's the first five and ten cent store I've ever seen with leather walls. <laughs> Lady's handbag belongs to a man. What? Well, his name is right here on the watch, Ben Russ, probably short for Benjamin Russell. No, chicken. Let's let's keep looking. My my, look what she's got here: hair nets, hair pins, hair dye, hair ribbons, hair shampoo. Well, we know one thing: she can't be a bald headed woman. <laughs> now let's see: cigarette case, lipstick. Uh-oh, this dame's a dangerous woman. Why, Al? She's got a driver's license. <laughs> and here's her name, Mrs. R.L. McLean. Gee, Al, look at all the money in this wallet. Yeah, and here's her address, Ardmore Towers, West End Avenue. Classy neighborhood. Probably wouldn't even miss the dough. Al, I'm surprised at you. Would you think of keeping this money? Uh, only for a charitable purpose. Chicken... Did you ever hear of Robin Hood, the guy who took from the rich and gave to the poor? Yes. You think Robin Hood was a bad guy? No. You know anybody richer than Mrs. McLean? No. You know anybody poorer than me? No. <laughs> what do I have to do, learn how to shoot a bow and arrow? No, 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 we must return it. Honesty is the best policy. Uh, don't you agree, Professor? Well, I can only talk from experience. Once I knew a poor street cleaner who found a wallet with $50,000. He took it home, and for three nights he couldn't sleep. His conscience was keeping him awake. Finally, he couldn't stand it any longer, so he took the wallet back to the rich man, who gave him a reward, and he went home and slept like a baby. What'd he give him? Sleeping pills. <laughs> Is that the moral of the story? No, no. Then he overslept and lost his job. <laughs> you see, Irma? It doesn't make any difference, Al. We must return the money. Glad you came through, chicken. Was only testing your character. 
wouldn't touch the money myself. However, if this Mrs. McLean is so rich, I'm quite sure there'll be a reward involved. So we have to handle it on a business-like basis. we got to make her think we're rich, too. Then she'll be ashamed to offer us a small reward. Sounds plausible. Yeah. What are you doing, Al? Well, her number's on the card. I'm calling her. Oh, hello, Mrs. McLean, please. Here, Chicken, you talk to her. When I put on a high-class voice, they get wise too quick. But, Al, I don't know what to say. Well, say something ritzy. Uh, you were out walking your Pomeranian uh, because your butler was in the back. You happened to glance in the gutter, and there was her purse. You got it? Got it. Hello? Mrs. McLean? Well, my Pomeranian went for a walk because I happened to glance in the gutter when my butler was taking a bath in your purse. <laughs> Hold it, Chick. Let, let me talk to her. Uh, Mrs. McLean, did you lose your handbag? Oh, you did? Well, uh, will you please describe the reward? I mean, the, 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 the handbag. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh, that's it. Yeah, my fiance found the handbag, and we're prepared to surrender it. Yeah, yeah, it's sitting right here. Why don't you come down and bail it out? <laughs> oh, you're busy, but you'll send your secretary with the reward. Good, good. Yeah, we're at 8224 West 73rd Street. Oh, it's only a block away. Fine. <laughs> yeah, we'll be waiting for your secretary. Goodbye. Wonder how big a reward a dame like that will come through with. Chicken, when she comes, I'll handle it. Hello? Irma, this is Jane. Oh, hello, Jane. Where are you? Well, I decided to pick up my cleaning, honey. Listen, has anyone dropped by from Richard's office? No, why? Anything I can do? No, no. I better come home and handle it myself. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye. <gasps> Gee, I forgot to tell her about the reward we're going to get. You don't have to. She's got a rich boyfriend. Oh, Al. Well, you know, I feel so good that we're doing the right thing. You see, Al... I want to be honest, and I want you to be honest, too. Then when we get married and have children, they'll be honest. Fine thing to look forward to, a family of street cleaners. <laughs> Speaking of street cleaners, I think I'll go up to that fifth floor gutter I live in. <laughs> Goodbye. Pardon me, uh, where does Jane Safety live? Well, why, lady? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no, not at all. I'm from Mr. Rhinelander's office. I'm supposed to deliver an envelope here to him. Oh, I see. The apartment is 3B. Thank you. Come in. Hello, I'm... Sorry. I know. You're the secretary with the money. That's right. Uh -huh. I guess you know all about this envelope with $100. $100? It, it, it's not the amount, Chicken. It's, it's the thought behind it. Uh, we'll take it. Thank you, miss. And here's the handbag. Handbag? Well, nothing was said about a handbag. Just take it. Your employer knows all about it. Well, if you say so, I'll take it back to the office with me. Goodbye. How do you like that? Can't trust help. This Dane McLean sends her secretary, gives us the hundred bucks, and she don't even want to take the handbag back to her. Oh, Al, a hundred dollars of my own. Do you know what I'm going to do with this? What? I'm going to put it away for a little nest egg for us. Ain't interested in birds. Let's hatch it now, chicken. <laughs> And now, Susie Swan sings to us. Listen. My advice, says Susie, you like this brand new kind of lather, so be choosy. Swan gives you beauty lather, rich as cream. Your skin stays soft as any dream, and fresh as dew. I swan to you, says Susie. Yes, Susie Swan, and what a bath you get with Swan's wonderful new kind of beauty lather. Why, it makes every bath a real pleasure. Sure, it's a pleasure the way Swan's new kind of beauty lather feels against your skin. So soft, so gentle, soft as a cloud. And it's a pleasure, too, the way white floating Swan cleanses your skin. Gently, yet so thoroughly, you step from the tub with your skin fairly glowing with cleanliness. And you love the way Swan's new kind of beauty lather rinses away. So completely, your skin doesn't feel all over-soaked. Instead, it's left radiantly fresh. And ladies, no other soap gives you this wonderful new kind of beauty lather. Because no other soap has Swan's exclusive super creamed blend. So make your baths a real pleasure with Swan's wonderful new kind of beauty lather. It's 
funny thing, but when you're in a hurry to get home, the distance always seems twice as long. Maybe I'm being a little overcautious, but I'd like to be home just so Richard's hundred dollars won't fall in the hands of Irma and Al by mistake. Gee, a hundred dollars. I wonder what Richard's going to use it for. Take me out? Gee, as I walk along, I get a warm glow just thinking about him. What a wonderful guy. Too bad he has such a limited vocabulary. Seems he just can't say, Jane, will you be mine? But leave here's coming, and so help me, I'm going to have a speech ready for January the 1st. I think I'll rehearse it right now. But see, I'll say, good evening, honey. And then I'll say, sweetheart, will you marry me? Sorry, lady, I already got five kids. Try the other side of the street. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, after that, I stopped talking out loud and hurried home. I opened the door and called Irma. Irma! Oh, they're gone. Well, I guess I'll just wait around until Richard's secretary arrives with $100. Well, here's the bank, Al. I think I'll deposit my $100 reward. Chicken, I'm a little disappointed in you. I, I didn't think you'd be so cruel. Cruel? Yeah, you know what they say. Your best friend is the dollar. Well, is it right to take all those nice friends and lock them up like criminals? <laughs> Gee, Al, I, I never thought of it that way. Well, what do you think I ought to do with the money? Well, Chicken, if you really want to look at it honestly, that hundred dollars isn't yours to keep. It's yours to enjoy. Its purpose is to reward you. To make you happy. Now, does going out with me and having a good time make you happy? Yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, and you figured it all out by yourself. Oh, yes, Al. You know, when we think together, we're a great team. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a Svengali and Trilby. Huh? Uh, what I mean, Chicken, is I lead the way and you back me up. <laughs> you understand? Oh, sure. You're the engine and I'm the caboose. <laughs> Choo-choo, Chicken. Get out that hundred bucks and let's go. Come in. Hello, Jane. Oh, hello, Richard. You're a little early. Your hundred dollars hasn't arrived yet. Well, that's funny. I called the office and they said Peggy left with the money over an hour ago. Oh, well, well, it could have been delivered while I was out, but I don't see it any place, and I know that Irma wouldn't take anything that wasn't hers. Well, Jane, maybe I'd better go back to the office and check up. Richard? Why are you staring like that? What are you thinking? Oh, nothing. Don't uh, lie, Richard. You're thinking exactly the same thing I'm thinking. <laughs> Where do Irma and Al fit into this thing? Oh, now, please, Jane, I'm not making any accusations. It's just that, well, while I'm generally nervous when they're around, but well, when they're not, I get panicky. <laughs> oh, Richard, do you think Irma would take money that doesn't belong to her and spend it? Oh, of course not. Why, but... come in. How do you do? I'm Mrs. McLean's secretary. Yes? I've come for the handbag. I beg your pardon? The handbag. My employer described it over the phone for you. She did? Of course. Now, may I have it? This may come as a shock, but I don't know what you're talking about. My dear young lady, I'm here to claim the pocketbook you found and give you the reward. Now, where is it? But Richard, would you please tell me? Oh, that you don't have to tell me anything. I know what's happened. You had a change of heart. After looking at the contents of the bag, you decided to keep it. Well, it won't work, lady, and that goes for your accomplice, too. Well, I beg your pardon. And I'm going to sit right here until I get that handbag. Well, there she sits. One eye on me and one eye on Richard. I don't know how to describe the expression on her face, but she could very easily be Peter Laurie with a wig. <laughs> what this is all about is just beyond me, and to top it off, I'm beginning to feel guilty. Richard is shifting from one foot to the other and looking at me as though I'm a criminal. I'm trying to look back at him as if I'm not. Oh, Irma. Irma, wherever you are, won't you and Al please come back? We're trapped by sitting bull. <laughs> Please come in. Well, hello, Peggy. Oh, hello, Mr. Ryan Lander. I've been trying to get in touch with you. What? Well, I don't mean to be impudent, but does this handbag belong to you? I should say it doesn't. That's the handbag my employer sent me for. 
So you didn't know anything about it, huh? Now, just a minute, madam. I... Pardon me. Am I intruding? Oh, Professor Kropotkin. Oh, a professor, huh? You people have a better set up here than Murder Incorporated. <laughs> Please, uh, uh, Professor, can't you help us clarify this thing? You see, this woman accuses us of stealing somebody's handbag, and Richard's hundred dollars are missing, and I... I uh, Professor, I don't like the expression on your face. <laughs> I feel a little sick. Jamie, wait until you hear what I have to say. You'll have a relapse. Here, lady, take your handbag. Now you're being sensible. Goodbye. <laughs> Professor, if you know anything, please tell us. The Janie is simple. One, Irma found the handbag. Two, somebody brought her a hundred dollars. Three, she thought it was a reward. Four, she's out spending it without. Mr. Rhinelander, I'm awfully sorry. No, it wasn't your I... fault, Peggy. You go on back to the office. I'll see you later. All right. Goodbye. Oh, really? How could Irma make such a mistake? Janie, please, don't be so shocked. It's not such an impossible mistake, considering the fact that Irma has always believed the Flatiron Building is a place to take her laundry. Yeah, but Professor, it's Richard's money. No, that's all right, Jane. It's just one of those things. No, no, Richard. The money was delivered here, and it's my responsibility. And besides, when Irma finds out what she's done, it'll just break her heart. Richard, we've just got to stop them before they spend it all. Well, where do we look for them? Simple. Where would any normal person go? I don't know. Well, all we got to do is to find out where any normal person will go, and we'll go in the opposite direction. <laughs> Gee, let me think a minute. Let's see. There's the opera, the art museum, Carnegie Hall, and, of course, Coney Island. Come on, let's go. <laughs> All right, chicken, the night is still young. Sure, Al, we haven't even started to spend my hundred dollars yet. <laughs> well, Richard, Coney Island's an awful big place. Where do we start? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. Well, let's ask that man by the scales. Uh, uh, pardon me, mister. Oh, sorry, we don't guess ladies' weights anymore. Them long skirts is throwing us. Oh, well, I, I don't want my weight guess. I want to know if you've seen a blonde girl with a fellow with shifty eyes. Uh, yeah, yeah, come to think of it, I saw him get on a merry-go-round. You did? Yeah, I remember because most people look dizzy when they get off. She looked that way when she got on. <laughs> yeah, well, that's her, all right. Come on, Richard, we're on the trail. <laughs> Richard, I think we've picked up their trail. I'll give you two to one that Irma just left the archery range. How do you know? Four people just walked by with arrows sticking in them. <laughs> Come on, let's ask the man here, right here at the refreshment stand. All right. Oh, uh, pardon me, sir, but did a blonde girl and a fellow in a gray suit stop here for refreshments? Refreshments? Ten bottles of root beer, six mission orange, three seven-up, five hot dogs, three hamburgers, and two taffy apples. All that? Yep. Now, let's see, what did the girl have? <laughs> never mind, never mind, that's them Come on, Richard Oh, no, oh, look, there they are Going into the crazy house Let's hurry Oh, Al, isn't it fun here in the crazy house? These tricky mirrors are a scream Look how skinny I look <laughs> And you look so fat and sloppy I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm sorry, lady. I, I thought it was looking glass. <laughs> Come on, chicken. Let's try the echo chamber. Oh, it's so dark in here. Watch this. This is Al. This is Al. Oh, gee, let me try it. Hello. Hello. This is Irma. This is Jane. <laughs> oh, gee, I broke it. Chicken, I think your echo is being followed. Irma. Oh, Irma, thank goodness I found you. Oh, hello, Jane. Happy anniversary. Never mind that, never mind that. Before I explain everything, will you answer me one question? How much money do you have left of that hundred dollars? A hundred and two. A hundred and two? How come? Well, Al's got such a talent for counting out change. The 
other evening, I noticed Irma doing something very strange, even for Irma. And I said, uh, pardon me for asking, but why have you put a compass on top of those cakes of swan soap? And Irma said, well, winter is here, Jane, and you know how birds like to fly south, and I don't want our swans to get lost. <laughs> well, Jane, no matter what Irma says, she wouldn't be without white floating swan soap for her bath. And there's plenty of reason why a lot of women feel the same way. Now, you see, Swan gives you a brand new kind of beauty lather. Yes, a new kind of beauty lather that's soft and rich, that you smooth onto your skin like whipped cream. A new kind of lather that whisks away dirt, leaves your skin glowingly fresh and clean. And Swan's wonderful new kind of beauty lather means a wonderful new after-a-bath feeling, too. Yes, your skin is left soft and smooth, not all tight and over-soaked. Because Swan rinses away so completely. So, how about trying Swan's new kind of beauty lather yourself? You'll like it for your bath. better than I expected. Richard has his hundred dollars back, and me, I'm in bed. And although the mattress isn't moving, I'm still spinning from that trip to Coney Island. Oh, Jane, you know, after Al and I left the merry-go-round, I went to the fortune tellers. Oh, you had your mind read? Yes, and then the man gave me my money back. I don't know why. (laughs) Well, Irma doesn't know why, and Al doesn't know why, but you and I know why, don't we? (laughs) But we won't tell my friend Irma. My Friend Irma, presented by Swan, another fine product of Lieber Brothers Company, was produced and directed by Cy Howard. Tonight's script was written by Cy Howard and Park Levy. Folks, next Monday evening, tune in an hour earlier over most of these same stations for the Lux Radio Theater. And then stay tuned to listen to... Our Friend Swan. With my friend, Irma. Starring Mary Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. Hans Conrad was Professor Kropotkin. Mary Wilson can soon be seen in the Eagle Lion release, Linda Be Good. Ladies, listen. The shortage of fats and oils is still very serious. And it's worldwide. So please keep on saving every single drop of used kitchen fat. Your butcher will pay you for every pound. Frank Bingman speaking. It's news to sing about. Spry with Cake Improver gives lighter, finer, richer tasting cakes than any other type shortening. For no other type shortening has Spry's marvelous Cake Improver. So for lighter, more delicious cakes that stay fresh longer, try... Spry with Cake Improver. Spry with Cake Improver. again to my friend Irma next Monday evening at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia. Claudia, based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you, transcribed Monday through Friday, by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Yeah. 
So I get. Probably for me. Who'd be calling you at eight in the morning? Who'd be calling you? Lots of people. Oh, where are my slippers? You sure you don't want me to go? I'm sure. I know where my slippers are. Where? By the bed, yeah. Oh, you mind if I wear them? You'll break your pretty little neck. I'm coming, 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 coming. I'd really laugh if, if it were for me. Not a chance. Hey, I just found your slippers, but they don't fit me. Stay where you are. You'll catch cold. Hello? This is Mrs. Norton speaking. Oh, you have the wrong number. Oh. There's a wrong number, David. Hmm? You know, I think we ought to have a phone in here. You do? I think it's silly to always have to go racing into another room to answer the phone. Well, don't race. Let me answer it. That is not the point. Oh. The point is that I'm home alone all day, and I have no company except a little black telephone. You are breaking my heart. Well, seriously, why should I have to run back and forth to it all the time? Why, I ask you, oh, question of questions, <laughs> who will answer? David. I ask all of you standing there, your faces turned up to me like buttercups. Buttercups? Buttercups. <laughs> Why should she have to run back and forth? A person just can't have a serious discussion with you, can a person? Not any old person, no. David, look. Why was the telephone invented? So that little girls like you would be able to bother their husbands at the office all day long. Exactly. And so that when the husband decides he wants to talk to her, she can talk to him. You never spoke a truer word. But if I'm in the oven or the bathtub or in bed like now, I should have the phone with me. I don't think I'd like a baked phone or a <laughs> wet phone or... I mean, a phone is a convenience, so the least it can do is to be convenient. Is that your last word on the subject? No. David, if I could make a wish, one wish, and be promised by my fairy godmother that it would come true... I would wish for clean sheets every day and a phone in every room. That's two wishes. They're the same thing. Same thing or not, your fairy godmother doesn't know what she's talking about. I know. Laundries are so expensive. And there's still a shortage of instruments. Instrument? Mm. I don't want an instrument. I just want a phone. Well, technically, a phone is called an instrument. Oh, why didn't you say so? There's still no extra ones to spare. Any old fairy godmother knows that. I don't want an extra one. I want a regular one. Like the one in the living room. How many times And do in the I... second place, we're moving from here in a month, so there's no point in bothering to have them install one now. But we'll take them with us when we move. What? Well, certainly. You don't think I'm going to let them lie around here for some utter strangers to use any more than I'd leave my furniture? Claudia, if you'll just take a second to listen. Uh, you cannot take a phone with you. Why not? I'm willing to pay for it, so why shouldn't I? It's mine. But it's not yours. Since when? Since always. You don't buy a phone from the telephone company. You merely rent it. Like an apartment? Like. Oh. Why? Because. What? Because that's the way it's done. Seems awfully silly to me. Pay all that money, and in the end, you have nothing. I always thought you bought a phone. Well, you always thought wrong. Now, may I get dressed? Mm. Well, I guess I'll get up. And while your coffee is perking, I think I'll call Mama. <laughs> you just hate to see that phone lying around not being used, don't you? Oh, it's such a waste. You know, I don't think you have any idea how much I use a phone every day. I call Mama. Twenty times. You. Twenty-one times. The butcher, the baker, the grocer. The cleaner. When it's raining, I never have to go out at all. Except I like to go out in the rain. And that's one thing you'll have to stop. No more walking in the rain. Dr. Rowland wouldn't approve. It's raining today. It's pouring. Then you stay at home all day and use the phone as much as you'd like. David, hmm? I might, I just might, call the phone company and have them bring me an extension. Just one little extension? Would you mind? Call them if you like. It won't do any good. We'll see who's right. And darling, will you make my phone ring lots today? Because I'm going to stay in out of the rain. All day. And I'd love it to ring and ring and ring. Even when I'm in the oven. Coming. 
Oh, I hope it's who I think it is. Hello. I'm Fernley from the telephone company. And I'm Mrs. Norton. I've been expecting you. Please come right in. Well, thank you. I won't take much of your time. Oh, that's all right. I'm not going out today. I have nothing else to do. Well, now, you called the telephone company and ordered an extension. Is that right? I have the order here. Well, you certainly are fast. Well, I didn't think you'd be here for days. My husband will be simply amazed. I was due up here anyway, Mrs. Norton. You were? Your husband applied some weeks ago for an instrument to be listed in his name. Oh, that was before we knew we were going to move. We're catching up with orders. Pretty heavy going. There's a phone in this apartment listed under the name of Lee. Lee? Oh, they were the previous tenants. Exactly. Well, you have no right to their instrument, Mrs. Norton, and I've come to remove it. Remove it? Oh, well, I suppose it's all right, seeing as you brought ours instead, haven't you? Mr. Norton's order has been registered. I brought the new instrument with me, but the number's not yet connected. What does that mean? And why couldn't you just leave the old one and we could use it? We don't mind its being secondhand. Regulations, Mrs. Norton. We shall inform you when your new number will be connected. Well, I, I, I don't understand. I will install a new instrument when you... But you may not use it until you're notified. You mean it won't even ring? The phone will not be working. Mrs. Norton, consider yourself temporarily without a phone. And you're taking away the old one that works. The telephone company apologizes for all inconveniences. And services will be restored to you as soon as possible. Oh, that's a big help. And I thought you were going to put in an extension. I'll be right with you, Roger. I want to give Claudia a ring first. We done yonder in the Yankee tank. The bullfrog jumping back, back. We done yonder in the Yankee tank. Hello, Claudia. What's that, operator? I was dialing... Five Plaza five 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 nine seven. Yeah. But of course there's such a number. It's my number. I've been calling it all day. Well, I'm sure that's a mistake, operator. Please check it. We didn't get any gap back. Everything's so complicated. Everything's so complicated. Hello, operator. Yes, but I I, I know there is such a number. I tell you that. But I... Disconnected? Why, that's ridiculous. I'll be a... Oh, I am a dope. We done yonder in the gank tank. She nearly had me fooled that time. Two, da, 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 nine, seven. Hello. Claudia, now don't pretend you're an operator. I know better and you can't fool me. Oh, the number's disconnected. Oh, sure. Yeah, you nearly did fool me, though. What? What's that? Well, I'll be a... I don't understand. I simply don't understand. Claudia. Claudia, what happened? deserted island all day. I've been trying to call you, darling. You can't. We haven't got a telephone. Nonsense. I see it's sitting right there just where it was this morning. But, David, this telephone... Well, you wait till I get the other operator. She's been trying to tell me that there's no telephone at this number. There isn't. That one's a a, a ghost. Hello? 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 There's no dial tone. David, he took the one with the dial tone away. He what? Who, Who what? He, what, who, what? Sounds Chinese. Uh, Claudia, what's been going on here today? I've been trying to tell you. A man came from the phone company and took our, the one with the dial tone, hit phone away because you asked for the one to be listed in our name. Because I? Yes, because you. That's what he said. I get blamed because you wanted an extension and the phone company was paying you back for being so greedy. You talk as if the phone company were God. Well, they took our phone away, didn't they? What's this one doing here? It's a fake. It's just there to make us feel worse. It's going to sit there staring us in the face, reminding us that, oh, David, it never rings. Now, darling, wait a minute now. Now, don't let this get the best of you. People got along without phones for centuries. I don't see how. When he walked out of the house with our phone under his arm, 
Well, I felt as if our best friend had gone away. Well, personally, I'm not the least bit sorry. You're not? Not the least little bit. Yes, it's fine for you. You're at the office all day, and there you have dozens of phones. One. Well, right now, it seems like dozens to me. I'm alone all day. I know, I know. We'll get it fixed up in no time. Now, you'll see. I don't even want any extensions anymore. Just one little phone. And I still don't understand why, if we can have an instrument, we can't have one that works. It'll work. But in the meantime, you and I are going to have a most wonderful weekend. Just the two of us with no interruptions. Why, we'll be so private. Even Bluff and Shakespeare will feel their intruding. Mm. It'd be like going away, the two of us, on a on a desert island. No bells, no phone. No, no nothing. You make it sound nice. It'll be nicer than nice. You'll see. Mm. You know, in a way, I'm glad they took the phone away. At least if they took it away on a Friday and not on a Monday. Oh, David, it'd be an exciting weekend. David, something rang. So it did. The phone. It couldn't be. No one knows our new number. I told you that phone was a ghost. It's the phone company telling us it's connected. That's what it is. Oh. Uh, Darling, would you rather believe in ghosts? I would. Much. Let it ring. Let it ring its fool head off. These programs star Catherine Bard as Claudia and Paul Crabtree as David. And the entire production is supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. Parties are fun to give and fun to attend if the hostess feels completely at ease. One way you can be at ease when you're entertaining is to know that the bills won't be out of line. Simply order plenty of Coke, keep lots of it on ice, and relax in the thought that here... At five cents a bottle, you have refreshment for party goers of all ages. Coca Cola was five cents in 1886. It is five cents today. And it's the same delicious drink people have long depended upon for the pause that refreshes. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca Cola. So listen again Monday at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For ice-cold Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. crisp October evening, we bring you the Harvest Moon, better known as Bing Crosby. Well, why can't... How come you liken me to the Harp of Harvest Moon? Why for this poetic introduction? What well, you, you do remind me of the Harvest oh, Moon, Bing. Yes, you're so bright and cheerful. Oh, that's... 
true. That's absolutely right, yeah. <laughs> and when you sing, your voice is as soft as its moonbeam stealing across a deserted cornfield. Really? Well, thank you. And you're so round. Just a minute, just a minute. I, I really lost so much weight this summer, I turned all of my old slacks over to my brother Everett. Oh, um, is he going to wear them? No, he's going to alter them. Oh. He's got to be back Monday, too, with every one of them. I didn't know Everett was handy with a needle and thread. He's had me sewed up for years. <laughs> that reminds me, Ken, this year, let's not do a lot of jokes about Everett. If we can't say anything nice about him, we won't utter his name. Everett has just received his last ut. Ut, ut. <laughs> This may lead to a drastic new form of entertainment, silent radio. Might be good, yeah. Of course, we can always break the silence with some music, and now seems a propitious moment to start. If the rhythm airs will festoon themselves about me, and John Scott will arouse his melody makers, we shall do the number one song on the cute parade. Love somebody. It's really cute as the dick. <laughs> Somebody, yes I do. I love somebody, yes I do. I love somebody, yes I do. Love somebody, but I won't say who. Didn't take me long to fall. Now her picture's on my wall. Water for my baby doll. If she kissed me. I wouldn't mind at all I love somebody Yes, I do Love somebody Yes, I do Love somebody Yes, I do Love somebody But I won't say who Oh, love somebody Yes, I do But I won't say who Don't know why she acts so shy Really, I'm a harmless guy Hope she doesn't pass me by Cause if she did, I'd die I know I'd die I love, love somebody. somebody Yes, I do Love somebody Yes, I do Love somebody, yes I do. I love somebody, but I won't say who. Love somebody, tell us who. Love somebody, yes I do. You love somebody, but you never say who. If I told anybody, I wouldn't tell you. Too. I like that tune, but I do feel the lyric could be more specific. That was a very nice commercial, shortened to the point. Thank you. Now we continue uh, just a minute. on with the now, show. Now, hold it. Wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Big no, 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 wait. We're going to stop right now. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'd also like to tell the people about the new Philco phonograph, built especially for the new long-playing records. Long play? What are they, long-playing records? Well, Bing Modern Science has invented a new record that plays for 45 minutes. A record that plays for 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. It's going to open up a whole new field for disc jockeys. They can take in laundry between numbers. <laughs> While I'm getting my bundle ready, can you throw your bundle right in there? <laughs> well, who knows, Bing? Maybe next year's Philco's will do your bundle while they play your numbers. But meanwhile, Philco's opened up a whole new field for everybody who plays records. Philco's 1949 radio phonographs play two kinds of records. All your standard ones automatically, plus the revolutionary new long-playing kind that give you 45 minutes of music from a single 12-inch record. Not only that, these new Philco's assure you top performance from the long-playing record because they were designed in the Philco laboratories after a long program of close collaboration with the same engineers who developed the long-playing record. Now, you get this advantage only with a Philco. 
See your Philco dealer now and listen to the real thing on a Philco. Famous for quality the world over. Here's my admonition to Rose, the rambling one. Everyone knows she's a rambling rose. She's a beauty growing wild. I expect she's a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, so meek and mild. She's got the kind of affection that just winds around your heart. You better run for protection, or she might upset your apple cart. I hate to disclose that my rambling rose is gonna need her Waterloo. I let her play, but she can't get away, cause I know just what to do. Anyone knows you can train a rose to be a clinging vine. So from this day hence, to be a picket fence around that rambling rose of mine. Disclose that my rambling rose is gonna need her Waterloo. I let her play, but she can't get away, cause I know just what to do. Anyone knows you can train a rose to be a clinging vine. So from this day hence, there'll be a picket fence around that rambling rose. Inevitable time when we take the peep into the Philco guest nest, which this evening harbors a young, beauteous, and very brown eyed songbird who has also copped considerable kudos for some sterling dramatic in terms of Korean clicks and picks. Judy Garland, come and curtsy, Miss Judy. Hmm? Thank you, Mr. C. Just look at you. <laughs> Gosh, little Judy Garland. I can hardly believe it's really the little Judy I used to know. Oh, it's me, all right. Judy, I remember the first time I sang with you. It wasn't too long ago, and you, you were just a kid in pigtails then. Yes, I remember how you kept admiring them. Mm -hmm. You were so jealous, even in those days. <laughs> what happened to those pigtails? <laughs> what happened to my pigtails? Yeah. I cut them off. <laughs> What'd you do with your curls, Bing? Paste them in your scrapbook? <laughs> no, I pasted them in my hat. <laughs> My winter hat, too. <laughs> the old beaver fedora that I wear. <laughs> anyway, Judy, I just can't get over how you've blossomed. You've developed. You're a young lady, young woman. Young womanhood. <laughs> what did you expect, manhood? <laughs> no. I got to the queue. I came by way of uh, Ashtabula, though. <laughs> Seems to me only yesterday you were a mere child. Just think you're a married woman now and a mother. Oh, well, don't be so surprised, Bing. It happens to all of us sooner or later. We all become mothers. I didn't. <laughs> you always were one to shirk work. <laughs> Confid confidentially, Judy, now. Tell me. Tell me confidentially, yes, Judith. Yes, Are you happy with your new career as wife and mother? Well, I'm divinely happy. Luella. <laughs> Thank you, Susan Hayward. Let's see. 
Christy, uh, you had a little girl, didn't you? That's right, Bing. I had a little girl. Shirley Temple had a girl. Jean Crane had a girl. Betty Davis had a girl. Girls, girls, girls. Everybody's having girls nowadays. Yeah, well, we're just trying to balance up the score your team made, folks. I see. <laughs> see what you mean. That reminds me, uh, Judy, how old is Liza now? Well, how, how old is your Lindsay? That's what I'm getting at. I figure that if we can make a deal with my Lindsay and your Liza, I'd be willing to throw in the twins as household help <laughs> along. Very handy kids. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm afraid Liza's is too young to think about matrimony yet, Bing. She won't be ready to start looking for her husband for years. Oh, well, when she's ready, can you arrange for her to do some window shopping over around my trap? <laughs> but by the time she's ready, all your merchandise will be gone. It's real gone now. <laughs> oh, but they'll probably be married and living with their own little families and Oh, say, Houston, Texas. Houston? What's the matter with us right here in Hollywood? Oh, come now, Bing. Surely you don't expect Hollywood to still be here in 20 years, do you? Oh, it's got to be here. Where will they make the 10th Jolson story? <laughs> I know, but the way they're, they're cutting down expenses yeah. and pictures and everything, mm -hmm. well, if this current economy wave keeps up, Hollywood may soon be just a technicolor memory. I heard they're dropping people right and left, but I thought it was just a rumor. Rumor? Yes. Nothing, no. They're even cutting down on the people they're letting go. <laughs> this is a shaky state of affairs, I want to say, huh? <laughs> but right, uh, can you imagine what'll happen if this economy wave spreads to the radio? Imagine breakfast in Hollywood would become just a snack in Azusa. <laughs> or just a crawler in Cucamonga. Here now. <laughs> John would have to go back to his first wife or something. <laughs> The tobacco auctioneer could chant for a half an hour and wouldn't sell nothing to nobody. Not <laughs> oh, it'd be grim. Oh, awful. Awful. Imagine Gee. the effect of the economy away, but economy away. The economy away, but the economy. I tell you what. Where are you working? <laughs> the economy wave would have on all those quiz programs, Ben. Oh, cut them right to the bone. Yes. One night we're liable to tune in on our filters and we'd hear. This is Ken Carp welcoming you on behalf of our economy-minded sponsors to a brand new quiz program entitled Take It and We'll Break Your Arm. <laughs> this ten-minute half hour is sent your way with the compliments. This ten-minute half hour is sent your way with the compliments of smog cigarettes. <laughs> Listen to what Mr. J. Scott Trotter, a tobacco leaf feeler of Felt Tobacco Leaf, North Carolina. <laughs> has to say about our product. Well, sir, I've been chewing smogs for nigh on to 40 years. <laughs> and now, on with Take It and We'll Break Your Arm. Starring your genial, penny-pinching master of quizimonies, <laughs> Happy Harry Crosby. Oh, thank you, Ken Carpet. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. I had to walk. But enough of me and my problems. Let's get on with the show. This week, we're just loaded, just loaded to the gunnels with money and prizes. The same money and prizes we had last week. And remember, if you guess the answers to our questions, next week, organ music. <laughs> now, let us get along here with the first show. And who is our next lucky contestant tonight, Ken? And here she is, Happy Harry, this lovely little lady. And a good, good evening to you, Miss... Uh, or is it Mrs.? It's, it's Mrs. Mrs. Evelina Noodlesler. <laughs> that did it. <clears throat> okay, then. Here's your first question. What is the annual salary of the Vice President of the United States? Uh, mm, uh $15,000 a year, including tips. That is correct. Absolutely correct, Mrs. Yes. Noodlesmith. Yes. Absolutely yes. correct. And do you see that beautiful new Philco refrigerator standing over there in the corner? Yes, sir. Well, you win a handful of ice cubes from that refrigerator. <laughs> wave, you know. Well, well what, what do I get if I answer the next question? A beautiful vacation trip. A vacation trip? Mm -hmm. Where to? Well, if you answer the second question, you get a trip to Honolulu. Honolulu? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Here it is. Chicken a la king was named after an English monarch who originated the recipe himself. Which monarch was that? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh King Edward VII. Absolutely correct, Mrs. Noodle Slurp. And you win a one-way trip to Honolulu. That's right, and here are your swim fins. <laughs> but, 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 but a one-way one trip, how do I get back? Well, you get on a quiz show over there, you win a return trip. <laughs> but suppose I can't. In that case, Mrs. Noodle Slurp, aloha. <laughs> well, this is terrible, this is 
terrible. Can't I try winning something else on the next one? All question? right, but this is your last question, the big jackpot. That's what I'm waiting now, for. Now, on the jackpot question, you have your choice of prizes. Either $500 in cash, a presto cooker, yeah. or a mix master. Which would you take? Why, the $500, of course. Sorry, that's the wrong answer. Thank you. <laughs> Judy, that was a pretty grim picture we painted of what could happen here if the economy wave ever engulfs radio to such an extent. Well, you never know, Bing. They're even cutting down on the money they spend for music these days. They keep giving us all the old tunes. Well, that's very clever. I love the old tunes. Those are the only ones I know. <laughs> Judy, while we got you here, I think we ought to sing some of the old tunes, some of those great songs you did in some of your pictures. Oh, that's a good idea, Bing. It may stir up some old memories. Stir up some for me, too. All right. How about this one from The Wizard of Oz? Oh, I know what that is. I know what's coming. I hope Buddy Cole's... Aware? Are you aware? Are you there? Let's have that piano. Smelled like lemon drops away above the chimney tops. That's where you find me. Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. How about you and me bending uh, on uh, me and my gal? Hey, I'm with you, Ken. Well, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> the bells are ringing for oh, me and my gal. Birds are singing for oh, me and my gal. Everybody's been knowing to a wedding they're going. And for weeks they've been sewing every Susie and they're congregating, baiting, waiting for me and my gal. Parsons waiting for me and my gal. And sometime we're gonna build a little home for two or three or four or more. In love land for me and my gal. Have we got time for a half a chorus of who? Oh, that's a good tune, yes, who? Sir. That ought to go over big. Certainly. We'll get mail from owls all over the country. <laughs> <laughs> what, kind, what kind of letters do you get from owls? Night letters. Aye, aye, let's sing it. This material has got to go on the floor. Get out. <laughs> Night owl. <laughs> Ooh, so my heart away. Who makes me dream? 
dream on earth. Dreams I know can never come true. Seems as though I'll ever be blue. Yes, to when you are the guest who, who, no one but you. Well, it's cozy time now, Judas, so let's cuddle up with Embraceable You. Oh, it's too hot to cuddle. That remark was transcribed earlier for release at a time when everybody may be frozen blue. Let's sing that. Sing what? Frozen blue. Frozen blue, frozen blue. <laughs> these veins in my eyes telling you. <laughs> well, we better stick to embraceable you. Being the boy, I'll begin it. <laughs> Ma'am. What's the matter? <laughs> Embrace me, my sweet embraceable you. Embrace me, you irreplaceable you. Just one look at you, my heart goes tipsy in me. You and you alone bring out the gypsy in me. Papa do My sweet Embraceable You really was a very enjoyable few minutes. It seems like you sang all those tunes in no time at oh, all. Oh, no, pussyfoot around, Ken. Let's have your commercial in no time at all. I shall gab with the speed of light. Well, turbo jet the whole thing, <laughs> right? Well, Bing, it takes a turbo jet commercial to keep up with the new developments from the Philco Laboratories. Right now, Philco has pioneered the most revolutionary improvement in phonographs since the record changer. I mean the phonograph that plays the new 45-minute record, of course. It comes to you straight from headquarters. Developed in the Philco Laboratories, especially for the long-playing record. And what's that to you? Well, for one thing, it's the listening thrill of your life. For another, it's your assurance that Philco's new radio phonographs play the long-playing records the way they were meant to be heard, thanks to a new tone arm created for them by Philco. So visit your Philco dealer now. You'll get a kick out of enjoying all the music from a six-record symphony album or a whole program of dance or dinner selections played on a single long-playing record with new brilliance and fidelity. Figure it out for yourself. Doesn't your radio phonograph sound out of date? Compare it with the newest thing in radio phonographs from Philco, the leader. Oh, Judy, it was sure wonderful doing all those old tunes with you, but... I'd like to prove to people that we know what's going on right at present. How about doing a little duet on a current composition? All right, Bing. You mean something like Confess? Oh, yes, like Buddy Clark does it with <laughs> that little girl, Doris Day. Hmm? <laughs> right. Confess. 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 Why don't you confess? Say yes, say yes. I wish you'd reveal to me. Reveal to me. The way that you feel. Why Mine. Why don't you tell me you're gonna be mine? How long can I keep waiting for a tender word 
blood from you The sweetest rose starts fading When the sunshine won't come through Confess, confess, confess. Please don't make me guess Don't make me guess If you really care for me If you could care then that Judy Garland for her charming and melodious visit and to make the following announcement. Judy Garland appeared by arrangement with Metro Golden Mayor, producers of the Technicolor picture The Three Musketeers, starring Lana Turner, Gene Kelly, and June Allison. With every good wish, I am sincerely yours, Leslie Peterson, director of radio. <laughs> oh, I didn't have to read all of that. <laughs> what happened there? What happened? What <laughs> Oh, gee. Leo the lion's going to be so happy about it. I can hear him purring from here after that big announcement. <laughs> Who's going to be next week? Well, next week, Judy, is our big Vancouver, British Columbia show that we're going to send from north of the border. And we're taking quite a mob up there with us. Ray Milan, William Gargan, Joe Venuti, and, of course, Joe Venuti's violin. Oh, what a cast. I wish I could go with you. So do we, Judy. Well, have a nice trip, Bing, and so long. See you soon, Judy. Good night, kiddo. Good night. <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. was produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Bill Morrow and Murdo McKenzie. Tune in to Philco Radio Time next week and hear Bing Crosby, John Scott Trotter and his orchestra, the Rhythm Airs, and Bing's guests, Ray Milland, William Gargan, and Joe Venuti. And remember, keep your eye on your Philco dealer now for the newest thing in radio from Philco, the leader. Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, The Panama Hat. I was sitting in my office bombing the ashtray on my desk with paper clips, wondering what kind of a job a private detective gets when clients stop calling completely. I was seesawing between the picture of me as a well-starched huckster and the more comfortable portrait of Marlowe, author in English tweeds, man of distinction. 
and the telephone brought me to a rude awakening. Marlowe speaking. My name is Isabel Gordon, Mr. Marlowe. I must see you at once. My husband Bruce is in terrible danger. Could you possibly meet me in an hour at the Pelican Inn? It's a small roadside place on the way to Malibu. I'll explain everything then. Pelican Inn, one hour, Mrs. Gordon. <laughs> The Pelican Inn was strictly a liquor license with chairs and a bored piano player in one corner grinding away. The place was empty and I was about to order a drink when the front door opened and a woman entered. She was tall and thin and right out of Harper's Bazaar, from double ankle strap shoes to close cropped hair. One look at her fear-crowded eyes and I knew it was Isabel Gordon. I got up and introduced myself. Then we went to a table and she started to talk. For two weeks now, Mr. Marlowe, my husband, Bruce, has been receiving unsigned, threatening letters. I'm almost sick with worry. I, I don't know what to do. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Gordon. The first thing to do is to get hold of yourself. And tell me the whole thing right from the beginning. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, Bruce and I have only been married a little more than a year. We're living with my uncle, Avery Fairchild, on an estate out beyond Malibu. I see. What does your husband do for a living, Mrs. Gordon? Why... He's a photographer. Movie or commercial? Well, at present, it's neither. You see, Bruce has been terribly unsettled since the war. Lost, sort of, and mm -hmm. then recently he got interested in photography, and it's been a great help to him. But he doesn't exactly work at it, huh? Well, he's converted one of the rooms in the guest cottage into a studio, and he spends almost all of his time there experimenting with portrait work. But he doesn't actually have a job, if that's what you mean. How does that appeal to your Uncle Avery? Oh, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Marlowe. My uncle thinks the sun rises and sets on me, but with Bruce... It's total eclipse, is that it? I'm afraid so. All his life, Uncle Avery has been concerned only with dollars and cents. He, he simply doesn't understand or sympathize with an artist's viewpoint. Uh -huh. Now, what about these unsigned letters? Well, Bruce has been getting them for the past two weeks. They're always made up of words cut from newspapers and pasted on ordinary paper. That's a cheap stunt. What do they say? Each one threatens my husband's life. Yet both he and Uncle Avery consider them nothing more than the work of some harmless crank. In spite of the fact that for the last several days, I've seen a strange man lurking around our place every night. Can you describe him? No. No, except where he's about your height and build. Is that all? Yes. No, I... Wait a minute. There is something else. Each time I saw him, Mr. Marlowe, he was wearing a white Panama. Well, that's not much to go on. Tell me, why haven't you called the police? Uncle Avery wouldn't hear of it. He hates publicity, dreads it. That's why I suggested contacting you, a private detective. A sort of a bodyguard for Bruce, huh? Yes. However, Mr. Marlowe, Bruce is somewhat temperamental, and I know he'd rebel at the thought of being watched over, so I'd... I'd rather you posed as a, a house guest, an old college chum of mine, perhaps. My fee is 25 a day plus expenses, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, any price is all right, Mr. Marlowe. Let's see, it's a little after seven now. Can you be at our place at Malibu at nine? I think so. But as a fellow alumnus, Isabel, one last question. Where'd you go to college? Southern California. Why? Well, I was afraid you might say Vassar. <laughs> After Isabel left, I remembered that I was already on my expense account. So I had a tasteless, cold, hot blue plate special and a burned cup of coffee. Then I stepped out of the Pelican Inn and headed across the paved parking lot to my car. It was already dark, and I was admiring the full moon and the beautiful wash it made over the ocean when it happened. Hey, mister! What the... Are you all right, mister? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Thanks to your sounding off? That nut was aiming right for you. Yeah, yeah, looks that way. Did you happen to get his number? No, What no, about his I face? Didn't. Can you describe him? No, ma matter of fact, I, I only noticed one thing. What was that? The hat he was wearing. It was a white Panama. I tried to be broad-minded, but there was no other way to look at it. The gentleman in the white Panama hat definitely meant business. I returned to my apartment in Hollywood where I shaved, showered, and packed. And then I headed for Malibu. At a quarter to nine, I was inside the grounds of the Fairchild Estate. Another mile, and I was at the front door. When I entered, Isabel greeted me like I was a keg of brandy around a St. Bernard's neck. Then we waded through an inch-thick carpet to the library where Uncle Avery, fat, bald, and looking like he'd just bitten into an underripe persimmon, was waiting. I wasn't asked to sit down, and I wasn't offered a cigar. Avery Fairchild was not one to waste time. I'm a very rich man, Mr. Marlowe. As such, I'm the target for all kinds of fortune hunters, confidence men, and cranks. In my lifetime, I've been threatened and pestered by a score of crackpots, each one slightly more psychopathic than the last. It's never bothered me, and it never will. 
However, in this case, the approach is a bit different. Meaning you think somebody's trying to get at you through your nephew, huh? Never refer to him as my nephew. My niece's husband, if you please. And don't forget it. Uncle Avery. Isabel, my feelings about your husband are no secret. You're being unfair, Uncle Avery. Just because Bruce is an artist and he... Artist, is he? Why, Isabel, that man's no more an artist than I am a horse jockey. Good evening, everybody. Uh, hello, Bruce. Hello, darling. You were saying something, Uncle Avery? Bruce, um, I want you to meet Philip Marlowe. We were great friends at school, and when I heard he was in town for a while, I insisted that he spend a weekend with us. How do you do, Mr. Gordon? It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Marlowe. You're very welcome. I do the welcoming around here, Bruce. Uh, Mr. Marlowe's had a long trip, and I'm certain he'd like to turn in early. Bruce, darling, he's going to stay in the guest cottage, the room next to your studio. Will you show him there, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. By the way, Isabella, I'm going to work late, so I'll say good night to you now. Good night, dearest. Good night, sweet. Please, please be careful. Yes, Bruce, by all means, be careful. Remember, the true artist belongs to posterity or something. <laughs> The guest cottage was only a landscaped hop, skip, and a jump from the museum that Uncle Avery called home. And as Bruce and I strolled along a flagstone path, I feigned a deep interest in photography. That was all my host needed. He struck at the bait like a shark with malnutrition. Well, Mr. Milo, it didn't even occur to me that photography might be one of your hobbies. Isabel never said a word. Well, good for Isabel. I'm strictly a dabbler. Now, tell me, Mr. Gordon, how long have you been at this? Portrait work? Hmm. Oh, about six months. You see, I divide my time between my studio here and a school I attend in Hollywood. That way, I capture both the theory and practical experience at the same time. Oh. Well, here we are. Would you like to see the studio? Yes, I would. Yeah, let me get the light. Well, this is all right, huh? And larger, two cameras, dark room. Are these your pictures? Yes. What do you think of them? Uh, I don't know exactly. They're certainly different, huh? They are unusual, aren't they? Yeah. You see, Marlo, each picture is actually made up of two separate studies which are superimposed. I call it uh, interpretive photography. Uh-huh. Now, uh, uh, this one, a splash of light and a bent pipe cleaner? The sun and the plant shoot. It's called metamorphosis. Oh. Well, what about that one there in the corner? The uh, girl's face and uh, clouds, maybe? Clouds, huh? uh, Mr. Marlowe, you, you'll excuse me, but that picture isn't ready for display yet. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. I thought it was just another interpretive photograph. Well, it's not. That is, it, it isn't finished yet. Now, Mr. Marlowe, I'm afraid I've forgotten what my wife said about your long trip. Shall I show you to your room? Yes, please do, Mr. Gordon. My room on the other side of the guest cottage was wider than Hollywood Boulevard. After Bruce apologized for his display of temperament and bid me a polite good night, I climbed into the silk pajamas that were laid out for me, stretched out on the bed and tried to figure who belonged to the white Panama hat. About an hour passed and I wasn't getting any sensible answers. So I switched out the light, put my gun on the table next to me and snuggled into what felt like a mile and a half of mattress. I was almost asleep, and the clatter of a shovel falling on the walk outside brought me straight up in bed. I grabbed my gun and made it for the door. But the second I threw it open, I knew that I'd made a mistake. Whoever kicked over that shovel had heard me and met me with a large fist that came straight at my face. Oh! As I came back into the world... I was embarrassed to find myself alone and flat on my back. When I started to get up, I felt like the L.A. Dons, water boy and all, had run over my face. My gun was a few feet away, and when I went to pick it up, I stopped short. It was a souvenir from the man with the great big fist. A gold cigarette lighter. It was engraved to Skipper on his birthday. Putting it in my pocket, I picked up my gun and made for Bruce's studio. He wasn't there. I threw on some clothes and went back to the house and found Isabel in the living room. I was about to give her a biased account of the shortest fight on record when I noticed Uncle Avery quietly entering the house from a side door that led to the garden. What's the matter, Phil? Bruce isn't in the studio anymore. What? Now, Isabel, there's no reason for alarm. Why, Bruce often goes off into the night like this. Called it a search for beauty or some such rot. And what was it you were after just now outside, Mr. Fairchild? 
I was looking for my niece, Marlowe. Isabel, your cousin John telephoned to say he wouldn't be down this weekend. Oh. I didn't know there were to be other guests. Oh, just my cousin, John Martinfield. Not really a guest. He comes down often. Yeah, too often to suit oh, me. Oh, Uncle Avery, please. You know that I'm fond of him. Yes, but I don't know why. He's a chronic gambler and of no use to anyone. Living at the Wilshire Gardens when he can't afford it. Driving expensive cars. Oh, you're too hard on him. Skipper is Skipper? Bad... Yes. Do you know him? Uh, no. No, no, I don't. Well, you're not missing anything, believe me. Oh, I do believe you, Mr. Fairchild. I believe your every word. What? Good night, all. I left the house and headed straight for my car with the Wilshire Gardens in Hollywood in mind. It was just a chance that John Skipper Martin might own a white Panama hat. When I got to the prodigal cousin's bungalow, it was dark inside. So I pressed one hand close to my gun and the other against the doorbell. But there was no answer. A side window was open and I started toward it when a nasty voice greeted me from the shadow of a palm tree. Good evening. Lovely night, isn't it? I hadn't noticed. I've been busy. I know. We've been waiting for you for a long time. We? Uh-huh. Me and my nice shiny revolver here. 38. Oh, I see. Well, you make a handsome couple, and I hope you're both very happy together. Now, what do you want? I don't want anything. I'm here to give you something. Advice. Look, brother, I've already told you I'm busy, so if this is a heist, let's get it over with fast. You know, I think you're confused. I'm holding the gun, Mr. Martin. Martin? John Skipper Martin. Surprised that I know your name? Why, uh, yes. Yes, I am. I don't recall having had the pleasure. You haven't. People never forget me, Mr. Martin. My tag is Brock. Does that mean anything? No, what do you do? Sing, dance, tell jokes? Yeah, that's it. The last one. I tell jokes. I can't wait. You won't have to, Mr. Martin. I'm going to tell you one right now. It goes like this. Once upon a time, a young punk borrowed $10,000 from a generous gambler on his promise to pay the money back within a week. But the young punk never came across. So the gambler told a nice fellow named Brock to call on the young punk and tell him that he had 48 hours in which to get the money together. And that if he didn't, he'd never see the 49th hour. What's the matter, Mr. Martin? Don't you like jokes? Brock grinned, shoved his 38 into a shoulder holster, and walked away. As soon as he rounded the corner, I went to the open window and climbed in. I rummaged through two closets looking for a white Panama you-know-what. I was about to search a third when I heard something that brought me to a dead stop. There was a key in the front door lock. I closed my right hand over the gun in my pocket, moved flush against the side wall, and waited. But the moment the door swung open, the telephone rang. And the hulk of a man that entered went straight for it. He was wearing a gray fedora. Hello? Oh, hello, Isabel. What? Bruce? Are, are you sure? But that's impossible. I, I mean, things like that just don't... Excuse me, Isabel. I, I think I have a visitor. I'll call you back. Reach, Mr. Martin. Who are you? The name is Brock. You owe a client of mine $10,000. He wants his money in 48 hours. I'll get it. I, I swear I will. I'll have it right here, on time, all of it. How are you going to do that, Mr. Martin? I, I, I've got a way. Someone's going to give it to me tonight. Why? Why? Oh, because it's, it's the healthy thing to do. That's why. That, that's all you wanted to know, isn't it? That's all. Good night, Mr. Martin. <laughs> Marlowe, Isabel. I'm calling from a drugstore in Hollywood. Has Bruce returned yet? No, and he won't. He's been kidnapped. What's that? And whoever did it wants $50,000 before morning or we'll never see Bruce alive again. As I walked to my car opposite the Wilshire Gardens, I felt like my brain had spent the night in a cement mixer. I was about to head back for Malibu when I suddenly saw Skipper Martin dash out of his bungalow and pile into a long, glossy convertible. I followed him out to the Pacific Palisades, where he made a call at a little house which sat on a bluff overlooking the sea. Once he was inside, I moved up quietly and saw that the name on the mailbox was Miss Carla Winters. 
I crawled up to a lace curtain window where I could see what was going on. One look at Miss Winters made the damage I was doing to my tweeds worthwhile. She was strictly dragon lady, with flaming red hair and a waist you could span with two hands. If you were lucky enough to get that close. And the rest of the measurements oh, fit yeah. just perfect. Why, you sniveling coward, you wouldn't dare open your mouth about us. Wouldn't I? Listen, Carla, I've got myself Skipper Martin to look after. First, last, and always, you remember that. Why should I? You've always been cheap talk and no more. Look at you now. You're in trouble, so what do you do? You holler blackmail. Go on, get out of here. Get out of here before I kill you. <laughs> When Skipper slammed the front door, stomped to his car, and roared off. I couldn't figure any reason, legitimate reason, that is, for calling on Carla Winters. So I returned to the Fairchild place. Isabel was somewhere between hysteria and collapse over the fact that she and Bruce had less than $2,000 in their own name. Uncle Avery, of course, was more than reluctant to pay the ransom demanded for the return of a man he'd rather not have returned. But his niece won out. All right, Isabel, I'll give you the money. But understand, I'm doing this for you, not for yes, that no yes, good... Yes, yes, Uncle Avery, I understand, but can you get that much cash at this hour? The banks Who are... said anything about banks? You know, I don't like them. Money will be in your hands in 30 minutes. In the meantime, tell Mr. Milo here what arrangements you've made with your husband's abductors. One minute, Mr. Fairchild. What about the police? The police have already been notified, Mr. Milo. They've agreed not to interfere until tomorrow morning. By that time, I suppose we'll have Bruce return to us. To... To us, Uncle Avery? Um, that's a mere slip of the tongue, Isabel. I'm only paying for his return. You take over from there. I don't want him. A half hour later, Avery Fairchild handled me a bundle of bills which added up to $50,000 cash. The bills seemed slightly dirty. The old geezer must have had them buried someplace. For a moment, I couldn't help thinking... Boy, to get at this place with a shovel sometime. But then I got back to the more pressing matters at hand. I wrapped up the money in a shoebox and I drove north along the Pacific Coast Highway. I covered the 60 miles to the rendezvous, which was a junkyard near Ventura, in about as many minutes. Then, according to instructions, I slowed down to 10 miles an hour. I blinked my lights twice, tossed out the shoebox. I was just about to resume my speed when the headlights of an approaching car fell on a man as he darted back into the junkyard. And I saw what I'd been expecting all the time. The white Panama hat. But I was still playing by the rules. So there was only one thing I could do about it. I slammed my foot down on the accelerator and kept it there until I reached the nearest telephone where I telephoned Skipper Martin at the Wilshire Gardens. It was just possible that he owned two hats. But that little balloon exploded in a hurry. Mr. Martin? Yes. Who is this? This is Brock. Remember me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I've been hoping you'd call. You mean you got the money right now? Well, well, well no, not, not, not this minute, but I will have it in a couple of hours. You're sure, Mr. Martin? I'm positive, Brock. Now only one thing figured. The man in the Panama hat worked for Skipper Martin. It had to be... An hour later, I pulled in at the Fairchild Estate. And the moment I put my double A over the threshold, I knew that the kidnapper, too, had kept his part of the bargain. Bruce Gordon was back, safe and sound. It happened shortly after you retired, Mr. Marlow. I was working in my studio when a man wearing a, a white, white Panama... Panama hat. Yes. But how did you know that, Mr. Marlow? They're very popular this season, Mr. Gordon. Darling, Mr. Marlow was a private detective. Huh? But I'll tell you all about that later. Go on with your story. Well, this man was wearing a handkerchief over his face, and he forced me to go along with him at gunpoint. He took me to a car parked in the service driveway and told me to turn around. And I was hit from behind and went out cold. Oh, darling, how terrible. Oh, it wasn't pleasant to you. When I came to, I was bound hand and foot, blindfolded and gagged. I had no idea where I was. Oh, but didn't you see anybody before you were released? No, Uncle Avery. Before uh, they let me go, they, they hit me again. Uh, when I came to that time, I was lying on the road out near Ventura, untied. That's about it. I suppose you've told the story to the police already, huh? No, he hasn't, Mr. Marlowe, and what's more, he isn't going to. I'm sorry, but I was forced to lie to you earlier this evening. The police mean reporters, and they mean publicity. And I hate publicity. 
I'm sure you see my point. I wouldn't make book on that, Mr. Fairchild. Secrets like this only encourage kidnappers. Well, since we no longer see eye to eye, Mr. Marlowe, I'd suggest that we consider your services at an end. I'll have my check at your office in the morning. Good night, sir. Avery Fairchild wasn't the kind of a man you argued with. I threw my coat over my arm, tipped my hat to Isabel, and stepped outside. I hadn't once mentioned Skipper Martin to the family. That might have been a mistake, but I still wanted to look around before I yelled copper. As I walked past the guest cottage, I decided to go in and check Bruce's studio. Maybe the man in the white PH had left a few odd footprints on the ceiling. I tossed my coat in a corner chair and started through the clutter. Uh, ten minutes later, I'd found nothing. I was about to leave when I suddenly remembered the picture of a girl and some clouds that Bruce had been so careful to keep out of sight. Uh, it hadn't been moved. And when I brought it into the light, I didn't have to look twice. <laughs> It was the portrait of Carla Winters, a red-headed dragon lady that Skipper Martin had visited. Now things began to add up. At the chauffeur's quarters, there was an outside telephone, and I put through a hurry call to Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide in L.A. The best I could get was one Sergeant Neely. I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but the lieutenant's out on a call right now. There's some kind of a row up town. Well, do you know where he is, the address, I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's uh, one of those bungalows at the Wilshire Gardens. The Wilshire Gardens? That's right. What's so special about that? Maybe nothing. I'll know in a minute. Thanks, Neely. Hello? This is Marlowe Ibarra. What brings you to Skipper Martin's at this late hour? Well, it seems as though some person or persons unknown fired a gun several times a little more than an hour ago. Four shots, to be exact. Well, you think Skipper Martin fired them? No, Marlowe. I'm sure Martin didn't fire them. You see, he stopped them. Personally. Before I hung up, I gave Ibarra a quick rundown on the whole story. After making me feel like a schoolboy for keeping him in the dark so long, he told me to sit on the Fairchild's front steps until he got there. Well, that gave me a half hour to kill, most of which I spent walking around aimlessly, trying to get something close to four out of two and two. But I couldn't. Finally, I heard Ibarra siren up to the front door. I was about to head for him when the chill in the morning air reminded me that my top coat was still in Bruce's studio. I went back and got it. When I turned for the door again, I noticed a little slip of paper that had been under the coat fall to the floor. I picked it up. I must have held it for a full minute before I realized what it meant. Just a small slip of paper, and yet it made everything, the kidnapping, Carla, the murder, fall right into place. <laughs> I entered the living room at the house. One glance at Isabel and Bruce told me that she'd already knew about Skipper's death. Only Uncle Avery, who was not one to shed crocodile tears, hadn't changed. Ibarra, of course, was unhappy. Marlowe, we can't run any kind of a police department when every private detective acts like he's the commissioner himself. Why didn't you call me when this business first began to smell? You know better. I'm sorry, Ibarra, and I hate to sound immodest, but I happen to be one of the two men in this room who can name Bruce Gordon's kidnapper. And Skipper Martin's killer. Do you know what you're saying, Marlowe? I think so. The man in the white Panama hat who kidnapped Bruce Gordon, Lieutenant, is Bruce Gordon himself. In other words, Bruce Gordon kidnapped Bruce Gordon. No! What? You're out of your mind, Marlowe. Am I? Would you still say that, Gordon, if we paid a call to Carla Winters and asked her to hand over the $50,000 of so-called ransom money she's holding for you, too? Or would you stop, prefer... Stop, Gordon, stop right The window, here. he borrowed. Bruce! <laughs> Then in other words, Marlowe, Bruce, who eventually planned to divorce Isabel and marry Carla Winters, wanted to have a little stake, like $50,000 around first. That's right, Ibarra. But Skipper Martin knew about Bruce and Carla's plans to marry later, and he tried to blackmail them to pay off his gambling debts. That's why he came to Bruce's cottage on the sly. However, he got there just in time to see Bruce leave of his own free will and therefore knew later that he couldn't have been kidnapped, which gave him two holes over Bruce. That's right. But he made a mistake when he went to Carla's house and got too demanding because she told Bruce about it, and before he uh, released himself, he took care of Skipper with four gunshots, to be exact. Charming people, aren't they, Barra? Lovely. Sometimes I think I should shoot higher and save the state a lot of money. And he almost got away with it. Uh, by the way, Marlowe, how do you know 
that Bruce was the man in the white Panama hat? Well, I was pretty certain, but I got my proof accidentally. Promise not to repeat this, Ibarra? Yeah. Well, I practically fell over a little slip of paper in his studio. It was a receipt from a department store, and it was made out to Bruce Gordon. For one Panama hat? Uh-huh. Nothing else but. <laughs> When I finally got back to my place on Franklin Avenue, the sun was already up. And the people who work at nice, sane jobs were beginning to fill the streets. I'd been on the go for a steady 24 hours, so I could think of nothing but my bed. I was about to put my key in the lock when a next-door neighbor walked by, bid me a cheery good morning, and started down the corridor. Now, that alone wouldn't have disturbed my sleep, but why... Why did he have to be wearing a white Panama hat? The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's story were Jacqueline DeWitt as Isabel Gordon, Wilms Herbert as Uncle Avery Fairchild, Bill Lally as Bruce Gordon, Shep Menken as Skipper Martin, and Lou Krugman as Brock. Detective Lieutenant Ibarra is played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next week at this same time when Philip Marlowe says... When her will was read, everybody figured she'd been crazy when she wrote it, and that included me. But I changed my mind after spending the night on an island with a pig, a cat, and an ape. Because in reality, they were people. Tonight, Amos and Andy return to the CBS network. And along with all their friends, Kingfish, Lightning, and Henry Van Porter, they're settling down for a permanent stay. Be listening for them later this evening over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Take a look at this ad in Life magazine. Yes, I saw that. Isn't that Joan of Arc pattern simply beautiful? That's what I mean. No wonder everybody says, the solid silver with beauty that lives forever is international sterling. Solid silver with beauty that lives forever is International Sterling. From Hollywood, International Silver Company, creators of International Sterling, presents The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, starring America's favorite young couple, Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard. It's a pleasant family scene we find in the living room of the Nelsons at 1847 Rogers Road. Fire in the fireplace, Nick the dog stretched out on the hearth, Ozzie on the couch reading the evening paper, and Harriet curled up in the easy chair with a basket of mending. Ah, uh, this is the life. Look here, dear. Hmm? What is it? I want you to see what happens to Ricky's trousers. Oh, gee, they're getting pretty thin. How can he wear them out that way? He never sits down. Where are the boys? Out in the kitchen. I told them they could stay up a little longer if they promised to do their homework. Aren't these David's books here on the table? What are you fellas doing out there? Just getting the crackers. Why don't you go out and take a look, dear? Okay. Uh, how you doing, boys? We're okay. Well, Pop, this is a neat book. 
Well, wait a minute. What's the idea of reading comic books? Pop, these aren't ordinary comic books. They're educational. I suppose this first story is educational. Tommy Skunk lets them have it. <laughs> That's a swell story, Pop. Tommy Skunk well, is Never mind, Ricky. Why aren't you boys doing your homework? Well, you don't understand, Pop. You see, we're supposed to do a composition on animals and birds and stuff. And these comic books tell you all about it. They're very educational. We're going to read our school books, too, Pop. Well, nevertheless, you promised to get right at your homework after dinner. I thought a promise meant a little more to you guys than something to be said and forgotten. We didn't mean to break our promise, Pop. We didn't think you'd catch us. <laughs> I don't think you understand, Pop. The teacher told us to get these comic books. They're very instructive. All I can say is school certainly is a lot different than it was when I was a boy. Tape's a lot better, isn't it, Pop? I'm not too sure, Ricky. Back in those days, everybody walked ten miles through snow. <laughs> well, that's not what I mean. When I went to school, we didn't have to learn about nature out of comic books. We wanted to learn about animals and trees and plants. We went right out into the woods. Yeah, Pop, but that was back in the old days. Oh, they weren't the old days. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> we don't have any woods around here. Well, of course we do. There are plenty of woods around here. The hills are covered with trees. Well, what was easier for you, Pop? Grandma Nelson told us that your Pop used to take you on hikes in the woods. Yes, that's true. He did. Many an afternoon, I remember Pop would come in and say, Let's go, boys. We're taking a hike. Off we'd go up to the Pines or up to Phelps Woods. I'll bet you had a lot of fun. Yeah, we sure did. There weren't many dads like my father. There aren't any now at all. <laughs> Gee, Pop, why don't you ever take us on hikes? Well, I will. It, it's just... Oh, a... boy, when can we go? Well, any time. Let's happen. go tomorrow. Well... Can we, Pop? Can we go tomorrow? Well, I'll see, maybe. That's a promise. <laughs> okay, it's a promise. Do you think we'll catch a skunk? No. You don't catch a skunk, Ricky. You run in the opposite direction. <laughs> Why? Because they have awfully sharp teeth. Now, come on, let's get after that homework. And I mean the real school books, the spelling and stuff. Okay, okay Pop. Okay, Pop. <laughs> Bacon smells good. Well, good morning. I was beginning to get worried. About an hour ago, I heard you say you were getting up. Oh, I was. It was cold, and I wanted another blanket. You better get a blanket for the eggs. They're cold, too. <laughs> the boys eating yet? Oh, hours ago. They're upstairs changing their clothes. Changing their clothes? For what? They're going hiking today. Oh. Well, it's a nice day for a hike. Me, I think I'll do a few things around the house. Maybe I'll try out that new couch on the porch. It looks pretty comfortable. Well, perhaps I didn't hear the boys correctly, but aren't you taking them up to Indian Springs for a hike or something? They said you promised them you would. I promised? Oh, oh, that. Oh, well, we were just talking last night. I, I don't think it was anything definite. Well, they're upstairs getting out their camping stuff. They seem to think they're going today. Say, maybe I did mention that we might take a trip up there. Oh, they'll forget all about it. You know how they are. Enthusiastic about something, and ten minutes later, it's all forgotten. Well, I seem pretty enthusiastic about the hike. Well, you know how they change from one minute to the next. Remember last summer? That rocket ship they were going to build and fly to the moon in it? They never did go. <laughs> I hope they won't be disappointed when they find out you aren't going to take them. Well, who said anything about not taking them? They still want to go after I finish breakfast? I'll be only too glad to take them. Oh, that's wonderful, dear. I'm sure they want to go. They've been talking about it all morning. As a matter of fact, it'll probably be a lot of fun for me, too. Get a little exercise, some of that clear mountain air, hear the brown leaves crunching under my feet. Oh, isn't that lucky? What's the matter? Well, I'm so glad you enjoy the sound of crunching. I just burned the toast. <laughs> Well, what a coincidence. I was just on my way over to see you. Oh, gee, I'm awful sorry, Thorny, but as a matter of fact, I'm a little short myself this week. Oz, please. I just came over to pay a little neighborly visit. Here, have a cigar. Oh, is Catherine... I mean, I mean are you... No, no, Oz. No special occasion. <laughs> Here, enjoy a good smoke. What's the matter with it? Nothing's the matter with it. Well, he can't a man offer his neighbor a cigar without going through a third degree. 
Well, don't forget I know you pretty well. You sure it's not going to explode or something? Now, please, Oz, you have my word for it. Just a plain cigar. As a matter of fact, my boy Will bought it for me. Will? Isn't he a little young for cigars? I, I promised to do him a little favor this afternoon, and he bought them for me to show his appreciation. Oh. I don't think I've ever seen this brand before. That tastes kind of strong. <coughs> oh, what a rope. This is evil, Thorny. Oh, please, Oz, don't throw it away. Will may be watching from the window. I don't want to hurt his feelings. Well, I know, Thorny, but it smells like burning rubber or something. Well, the boy's young yet. Doesn't the one cigar from another? But the thought was there. I promise to spend the afternoon with my kids, too, but I certainly hope they aren't out buying me cigars. <laughs> you know, you and I are different, Thorny. But most parents don't realize how important it is to spend time with their children. Oh, sure. Especially boys. You'll find that the average boy patterns his entire behavior after his father. Oh, there's no question about it. That's the reason we've got to be careful to set him a good example. Well, I always say... <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right about that cigar, Oz. It smells horrible. See, I think so many parents make a mistake when they make casual promises to their kids and then wriggle out of them in, in uh, one way or another. It's no good. And then the parent wonders... <laughs> I, I think you can throw that away, Oz. Will probably isn't watching after all. It's okay. It's not bad. Now, take me, for instance. I promised to take my boys on a hike this afternoon, and nothing in the world could keep me from it. Hike? Oz, old man, you mean to stand there with that awful cigar in your mouth and tell me you don't know about the big professional football game this afternoon? Football game? Well, sure, down at the stadium. Well, isn't that next week? Of course not. It's this afternoon. Well, I thought it was next week. I wonder if it's too late to get tickets. Well, how can you go? You promised to take the boys hiking. Well, yes, but I'm sure they'd rather go to the football game. Don't you think? I don't know, Oz. Did they seem very infused about the hike? Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, Harriet said they've been talking about it all morning. Why don't I just ask them which they'd rather do? Well, don't you think that's a little unfair to the Mars? In what way? Well, naturally, they'd know you'd rather go to a football game, so they'd probably give up the hike just to make you happy. But inside, they'd feel that their pop let them down. You really think so? Oh, yes, I do, Oz. A promise is a big thing to a kid. I remember once my grandfather promised to take me fishing, and at the last minute, he changed his mind and took me to a movie instead, a Tarzan picture. And you never quite forgave him? Not only that, I've never felt the same about Elmo Lincoln. <laughs> Since that day, I, I, I don't seem to enjoy his pictures as much. Yeah, I see what... Elmo Lincoln? He hasn't made a picture in years and years. They haven't shown those. Oh, didn't I tell you, Oz, we got a television set? Oh. <laughs> I think you're right about the promise, Thorny. Oh, I'm sure of it, Oz. What's one football game compared to setting the right example for David and Ricky? I don't know what I could have been thinking of. A promise is a promise. Yeah, that's the way I look at it, Oz. Even if we don't have a good time this afternoon, we'll have the satisfaction of knowing that we've kept our promises to our boys. Yeah. Uh, where did you promise to take Will? I was a little smarter than you were, Oz. I promised to take Will to the football game. <laughs> Mom, is Pop pretty good about keeping promises? Well, if you're worried about him taking you on the hike, he's looking forward to it. Oh. Gee, what kind of talk is this? Well, Will Thornberry just said there's a professional football game today. His father's taking him to the game, and all we get is an old hike. Well, I'm surprised at you two guys. I think you have a pretty nice dad. You know, it isn't every father who's good enough to take his boys hiking. You don't want to hurt his feelings, do you? Well, golly, no, but... Well, do you think if we told him we'd rather see the game than go hiking and it'd hurt his feelings? You're taking a chance. Let's take the chance, David. Mm. <laughs> no, Ricky, we don't want to hurt Pop's feelings. I'll tell you what you could do. You might just hint that if he'd rather go to the football game, you'd be willing to postpone the hike. Hi, fellas. Hi, Pop. Well, beautiful weather for a hike, isn't it? Yeah. Nice day for football game, too. Uh, Ozzy, the boys have just heard that there's going to be a big football game at the stadium today, and... They thought that if you'd like to postpone the hike, well, they'd understand. We know how much you like football, Pop. Oh, come now, boys. Do you think your old dad would break his promise? Besides, on a beautiful day like this, who wants to sit in a crowded stadium and watch a football game? Shut up, Ricky. No, sir. 
This is a perfect day for a football, for the, I mean, this is a day for a hike in the pan, the hike in the, the woods. What I mean is we can go to a football game any day, but, but a hike is something that, well, Indian Springs, you, you can just imagine how beautiful it is up there at, at Indian Springs. The Indians and, and Springs. <laughs> We just thought oh, that maybe... Oh, thanks very much, fellas, but don't you worry. Your old dad isn't going to let you down. No, sirree. A promise is a promise. What silver pattern has had scores of letters written about it... What silver pattern have women all over the country been waiting for? What silver pattern is back once again in a triumphant return to make a thousand dreams come true? The answer, International Sterling's superb Joan of Arc. Yes, Joan of Arc is back once again. The silver pattern you wrote about, waited for, dreamed of. One of the most magnificent patterns ever to come from the hands of the famous international sterling craftsman. Every detail is finished to perfection, back as well as front. And each piece is crowned with a gleaming classical shell ornament. Here, in every way, is solid silver at its loveliest. You'll agree when you see Joan of Arc at your international sterling dealers. So don't miss it. Tomorrow, see Joan of Arc. The silver pattern you asked for. Created by International Sterling. Ever since Ozzie Nelson was a little boy, his parents taught him courage, determination, and a sense of honor. These are the virtues it takes to keep a promise. When little Oswald was eight years old, he was courageous. When he was 12 years old, he was determined. Don't worry, Mom. I'll finish eating this piece of chocolate cake. When he was 16, he had a highly developed sense of honor. Gwendolyn, I must confess, before I met you, I kissed another girl. Ouch! Yes, Ozzie learned early. At 19, he made his first important promise. I promise to pay the Blue Sky Auto Finance Company the sum of $30 or more. And he kept his promise. In fact, the finance company made sure of it. And so the Ozzie Nelson of today has the same grim determination to keep his promise. He's out in the garage now, dusting off his hiking boots. Meanwhile, Harriet has put in her daily call to her mother. Hello? Hello, Mother. It's Harriet. Oh, hello, dear. How are you? Oh, not so good, dear. My feet hurt, and I feel a headache coming on. Have you taken an aspirin? Yes, but my feet still hurt. <laughs> I went to that modern art exhibit today, and I warn you, dear, don't go. That bad? Dreadful. Simply a collection of three-cornered apples, women with six arms and purple hair. <laughs> the only thing in a frame that made sense turned out to be the fire hose. <laughs> Today's the last day of the exhibit, isn't it? Yes, thank goodness Oh, I'm glad you told me Ozzie promised to take me, but now I won't insist on it How is Ozzie, dear? Oh, he's fine He and the boys are going on a hike today Today? Isn't he going to the football game? No, he seems to prefer the hike Really? That doesn't sound like Ozzie Well, frankly, I think he really wants to go to the game But he's just sticking to his promise you know, it's silly because the boys want to go to the game, too. Well, dear, if Ozzie wants to go to the game and the boys want to go to the game, why don't they just go to the game and forget about the hike? It sounds simple. It's as simple as ABC. But this is an XYZ family. <laughs> I guess they'll all go on the hike and be perfectly miserable just so Ozzie can prove he keeps his promises. But you just said he promised to take you to the art exhibit. Yes, but he can't because it's closing today, and last night he promised the boys... Huh? Oh, Mother, I have a wonderful idea. Would you like to hear it? Now, Harriet, if it's some plan to trick Ozzie, I don't want to hear about it. Okay, Mother. 
You know, I never like to interfere in your little family squabbles. So I'd rather you would okay, tell me. I'll call you again. Goodbye, Mother. Of course, if you insist and you feel that you need my advice, Harriet. Harriet? Operator, operator, we've been disconnected. <laughs> You can go to the football game today. Oh. I'm not promising, mind you. It's just an idea. Oh, boy, David. Mom's got an idea. Well, don't say it as if it was the first one I ever had. <laughs> What's your idea, Mom? Well, listen to this. Daddy doesn't want to break his promise to take you hiking. But it just happens that he made a promise to me. Gee, are you stuck, too? <laughs> no, it's just that... A... Oh, here he comes, boys. Let me do the talking. Well, come on, fellows. Get on your hiking clothes. Dear, I'm terribly sorry, but I think you've forgotten something. Well, I don't think so. Here's my hatchet, my canteen, my toolkit, my collapsible drinking cup. No, I don't mean anything like that, dear. I mean, you made a promise to me. What's that? Remember, dear, you promised to take me to the modern art exhibit whatever day I wanted to go? I promised that? Yes, don't you remember? One night last week. Well, we'll go sometime next week. Today's the last day. Oh, that's a shame. Well, it'll probably be around another year or two. No, uh, dear. Mm-hmm. You promised to take me. A promise is a promise. But, Harriet, I'm taking the boys on a hike. Well, you'll have to postpone the hike. A previous promise eliminates any promise made later. That's the law. That's the law. David, don't hit the table with that walnut cracker. Harriet, <laughs> the boys are looking forward to this hike, aren't you, fellows? Oh, that's okay, Pop. You go ahead and take Mom to the art exhibit. Yeah. Pop, we don't mind. I'm sorry, dear, but you did promise to take me. I didn't promise, Harriet. I said I'd take you, but that isn't a promise. What is it, Pop? It's, uh, uh Ricky, your mother and I are talking. <laughs> you better change your clothes, dear. This is a fine couple of pals you two turned out to be. Well, gee, Pop, you promised Mom you'd take her. We can't do anything. Well, you didn't have to give up the hike so easily. You'd think you didn't even want to go. Gee, Pop. Why didn't you say something? You're only eight years old, Ricky. Why didn't you cry? Are you sore this, Pop? Oh, of course I'm not sore at you. I suppose the art exhibit won't be so bad. It gives a man culture, I guess. You don't mind going, Pop? Oh, no. If it'll make your mother happy, I'm only too glad to take her. It'll probably be very interesting. Well, I'll see you guys later. Where are you going, Pop? Outside to see if I can't find something wrong with the car. Oh, hello, Annie. Where are you going? I'm just getting the car. We're going downtown. To the football game? No, we're going to the modern art exhibit at Simon's Galleries. The art exhibit? Mm. Oh, I might have known. Those long, tapering fingers, no. those delicate hands, no. your white shirt splashed with paint. Uh, no, that's just a little ketchup. I had a sandwich. <laughs> No, no, no. I- I'm only going to the art exhibit to look. To look? Uh, yes, I'm not a painter. You're not a painter? Well, no. Only a student. No. You live in a garret, a uh, tiny cubicle, a Annie. niche, a cubbyhole, a dump. Oh, but... Your room is so tiny you have to paint with your hands in your pocket. Oh, I... <laughs> Where does my model sit? In the next room. You have to peek through the keyhole. Oh, I... <laughs> You work on your portrait day in and day out. No, it means fame. The world will soon recognize your genius. Just... And so you paint and paint I... and paint. It's... It takes form at last. Only a few more days. And that's finished. Your masterpiece is complete. What depth, what beauty. Your very soul is in this painting. Yes. Soon the world will go feet up past your garret. And so to the little art shop around the corner, not knowing that someday this painting will be famous, the dealer offers you five dollars. <laughs> $5? This is worth $5,000. But you're hungry. You must sell it. I won't. But you must eat. I won't sell it. I'll eat it. I... <laughs> Mr. Nelson, what are you talking My about? Man, what do you think that cheap dealer offered me? It's... Wait a minute. Emmy Lou, you're all confused. <laughs> I'm going to the art exhibit just to look at the pictures. But I don't want to go even. Well, then why are you going? Because I promised Mrs. Nelson I'd take her. I'll take her, but I won't like it. Is that being fair to Mrs. Nelson? Well, she wants you to take her to the art gallery, and you're being mean about it. I'm... You want yourself. What happened to the kind, gentle, loving Mr. Nelson? He's at the football game. <laughs> well, you're cheating. If you do something you don't believe in it, think of 
have your wife, Mr. Nelson. You're the Stanislavski method. What has Stanislavski been thinking of my wife? <laughs> it's a dramatic technique. You keep repeating something until you believe it. For instance, you say you're a leaf until you actually believe you are a leaf. You can do the same thing with the art exhibit. Keep saying, I want to go to the art exhibit until you want to go. I want to go to the art exhibit. I want to go to the art exhibit. Well? I think I'll try on the leaf. <laughs> For Mrs. Nelson's sake, keep repeating it. I want to go to the art exhibit. It'll be, It'll be fun. I want to go to the art exhibit. It'll be fun. You can do it, it, Mr. Nelson. You're strong. Good. You're brave. I'm strong. I'm brave. I want to go to the art exhibit. It'll be fun. You're a liar. No, I'm not. It's a liar. I want to go. It'll be fun. No, it won't. Yes, it will. I'm a leaf. I want to go. I want to go to the art exhibit. It'll be fun. I want to go. It'll be fun. The art exhibit. I want to go to the art exhibit. I want to feast my eyes on those beautiful colors. I want to run barefoot through those gorgeous paintings. I want to go to the art exhibit. You want to go? Yes, I want to go to the art exhibit. Why? It'll be fun. Who says so? Stanislavski. Well, what does a football player know about art? I'm all ready for the art exhibit, Harriet. You are? Yes, it'll be fun. You said that. You don't really want to go, do you? But I do. You didn't a few minutes ago. But I've changed since then. The football game today is supposed to be the best of the season. Yeah, I know. It, it's going to be a grudge game, and, and and I want to go to the art exhibit. I want to go to the art exhibit. I want to go to the... I want to go to the art exhibit. Beautiful day, isn't it, dear? Yes, but we'll be better off at the art exhibit indoors. I, I think it's going to rain. Rain? There isn't a cloud in the sky. Well, they're all hiding behind the mountains, waiting for the football game to start. Ozzy, if you'd rather go to the football game, don't be afraid to say so. Oh, you can go to a football game anytime. I want to go to the art exhibit. Uh, Harriet, you made the wrong turn there. The art exhibit's to the left. You're going to get into all the traffic going to the stadium. I decided I want to go to the game instead. But I thought you wanted to go to the art exhibit. This is the last day, and a promise is a promise. Harriet, I won't let you make this sacrifice. I made you a promise, and I'll stick to it. Dear, when the rules of living were drawn up, there was one rule that headed the list, and it supersedes all other rules. Harriet, nothing is more firmly established than the obligation to keep a promise. Oh, yes, it is. A woman's right to change your mind. <laughs> but I want to go to the art exhibit. You'd better quit while you're still ahead, Stanislavski. I might change my mind again. Well, what about the boys? Oh, they're going to meet us at the stadium. It seems they met Emmy Lou, and she convinced them they ought to hike down there. Harriet, are you sure you honestly want to go to the football game? Oh, definitely, dear. I want to go to the football game. I want to go to the football game. I, I want to go to the football game. I want to go to the football game. Football game. Football game. back in just a moment. Hey, that was a happy ending if there ever was one. But, you know, I sometimes wonder what it would be like if women didn't have that unalterable right to change their minds. You don't believe in it, Mrs. Smith? Well... Oh, you think a woman should decide one thing and stick to it, no matter what? Well, uh... Even if she's just about to buy a certain silver pattern, and then discovers at the last minute that International Sterling's Joan of Arc is back again, and buys that instead? Well, uh... Hey, did you do that? <laughs> uh-huh. And it was the best change of mind I ever had. Golly, it was wonderful to find I could get Joan of Arc again. I've been waiting for it for years now. You and thousands of other women. Joan of Arc is one of the most beloved patterns International Sterling ever created. During the war, when it wasn't being made, the postman brought scores of letters to International Sterling, each one asking for its return. And now, in answer to those requests, Joan of Arc is back, as lovely, as magnificent as ever. Oh, and Mr. Smith... I found out something when I bought my set the other day. I didn't have to pay for it all at once. The international dealer had a special payment plan, specially suited to my own budget. That's right. So you see, right now is the very best time to buy that silver you've been dreaming of. Joan of Arc, solid silver with beauty that lives forever. Created by famous international sterling. <laughs> Did we 
have a good time today. It was neat, boy. Well, what happened to you guys? I thought you were going to meet us at the stadium. We went over to Will Thornberry's instead. But I thought Will's father promised to take him to the game. Well, he did, you see, but he fell asleep on the couch, and Will didn't want to wake him up. Anyway, by the time the picture was over, it was too late. Picture? Yeah, we were watching a picture on television. It was real neat, boy. Tarzan of the Apes with Elmo Lincoln. <laughs> next week to another adventure of Ozzie and Harriet, starring Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard. And remember, the solid silver with beauty that lives forever is international sterling. Yes, Harriet, the solid silver with beauty that lives forever is international sterling. Appearing in support of Ozzie and Harriet were John Brown, Tommy Bernard, Henry Blair, Janet Waldo, and Maureen Tuttle. Original music was composed and conducted by Billy May. This program originates in the Hollywood studios of the National Broadcasting Company and is also broadcast over the Trans-Canada Network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This adventure of Ozzie and Harriet will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Friends, one day very soon a neighbor of yours will call on you for a contribution to your local community chest, and I hope you'll contribute generously. Because the service they render to your town or city is really tremendous. Homes for the aged, free medical care for the poor and sick, summer camps for children, work for the handicapped. All these worthy causes are helped by your local community chest. And because your community chest can treat problems as they arise, they're prevented from spreading and affecting the welfare of the nation. So when that doorbell rings, give all you can, won't you? Remember, everybody benefits if everybody gives. This is Burns Smith speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. It is Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Your level best. That's just how you'll feel when you light up a Lucky. Because Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense, puts you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's important to you as a smoker to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And every smoker knows. L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, smooth, mild, thoroughly enjoyable tobacco. No wonder more independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. It's good to know that fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense, by putting you on the right level to feel and do your level best. That's the Lucky Level, so smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Get on the Lucky Level where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of Luckies and get started today. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most popular restaurants in the country is the Brown Derby in Hollywood. So let's go back to yesterday afternoon and look in as the Brown Derby's head waiters handle the overflow luncheon crowd. Oh, Gus, did you see Mr. Gable at his usual place? No, Chilius. Mr. Gable joined Eve Arden and her party. Well, that's good. There's so many people waiting. Well, perhaps we can set up some more tables. Hey, Chilius, look who's coming in. Jack Benny. You take care of him. Uh, no, Gus. It's your turn this time. <laughs> no, no, it's your turn. All right, all right, I'll take care of him. He changed networks, why doesn't he change restaurants? <laughs> oh, Jack, here comes Chilius. Yeah, he'll get us a table. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Benny. Uh, hello, Chilius, I'd like a table. They have some lovely tables at Romanoff's. <laughs> I know. Uh, Romanoff sent us here. Oh. 
Good afternoon, Miss Livingston. I didn't see you. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Benny. You'll have to wait. Every table in the place is taken. Well, maybe we... Hey, Mary, look. Hey, look, there's Jimmy Stewart having lunch all by himself. I'll ask him if we can sit at his table. Uh, but, Jack, if he's eating by himself, maybe he prefers to be alone. Oh, don't be silly, Mary. He'll be glad to have company. Come on. Only, uh, let me do the talking. Uh, you know? Hey, Mary! Look who's here! <laughs> hmm? Oh, hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Well, if it isn't Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> you know... You know, uh... You know, Jack, uh, Hollywood's a funny place. You say, well, if it isn't Jimmy Stewart and everybody in the Brown Derby applauds. <laughs> Yes, yeah. By the way, Jimmy, we're in a hurry and all the tables are taken. Would you mind if we joined you? How can he say no? You're already eating his rolls. <laughs> There's enough for both of us. Sure, sure. Come on, just sit down here. Here, I'll make room for you, Mary. Well, thank you. There we are. Now, Jack, I'll move over so you... Oh, just sit here. still, Jimmy. You need move for me. I'll squeeze right in here and then we can... <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Jimmy. I knocked over the pitcher and spilled the water. Oh, that's all right. With this weather, it froze before it hit the floor. <laughs> that's right. It, it, here, Jimmy, let me hand you my napkin. And, whoop. <laughs> I, uh, I knocked over the ketchup bottle. Uh, better, uh, better wipe it off, Jimmy. You look like an ad for blood on the moon. <laughs> Gee, I'm sorry, Jimmy. You know, uh, Jack, I've been sitting here eating for 30 minutes. Uh, you've been here 10 seconds, and you've got more on me than I've got in me. <laughs> well, I... <clears throat> well, I, I guess it's because we're in such a hurry. May I take your orders, please? Yes, yes. I'll have a club sandwich and a, a cup of coffee. Yes, sir. Yours, Miss Livingston? Oh, gee, I don't know what to have. Uh, what's that you're eating, Jimmy? Oh, it looks delicious. Oh, this is something my mother always used to make for me. It's my favorite dish. What is it? Matzo ball soup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, Chilius, I'll have a Caesar salad and a pot of tea. Yes, Miss Livingston. Uh, by the way, Jimmy, I saw your latest picture. You gotta stay happy. And you and Joan Fontaine certainly make a wonderful combination. Oh, well, thank you, Mary. Uh, you made that picture for Universal, didn't you, Jimmy? Yes, yes. Before that, I made Rope for Warners, and then I made one over at MGM, one at RKO, one at 20th Century, and then one for Paramount. What's the matter? Can't you keep a steady job? <laughs> Just that Jimmy prefers to freelance. Oh, oh. Uh, by the way, Jack, uh, what have you been doing lately? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, uh, I've been rather busy with radio. Radio? Well, aren't you a little late getting into that with television and everything? <laughs> no, no, Jimmy, I've been in radio for 17 years. But I haven't made a picture since I was at Warner's. And I left there because there was always a big issue, you know, when it came to casting. Well, I can understand that, Jack. You and Errol Flynn are the same type. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Uh, Jack had the same trouble with MGM, but they decided to keep Lassie. <laughs> no, please. Anyway, Jimmy, I'm not appearing in pictures because I'm producing them now. Oh, I didn't know you were producing pictures, Jack. Oh, yes, yes. Matter of fact, I just finished my first one. It's called uh, The Lucky Stiff. Starring Dorothy L'Amour, Brian Dunleavy, and Claire Trevor. Soon to be seen at your neighborhood theater. Jack, uh, what are you yelling for? <laughs> Jimmy, if these people can eat here, they can afford to go and see it, you know. You know, a plug's a plug. And then... Mr. Benny, if you'd like, you can move over to this table here. Chilius, I thought you didn't have any empty tables. We've got a lot of them now. <laughs> Well, we'll just, we'll just stay where we are. Yes, sir. Here's your food. Who gets the salad, please? Oh, the salad is mine. Now, let's see. What were we talking about before the food came? The, the picture you produced, the lucky salad. 
No, no, the lucky stiff. Oh, oh. <laughs> Say, you know, Jimmy, I've just been thinking, you're a nice guy, and here you've been having a tough, not working steady at one one studio. So I'm going to do you a big favor and put you in my next picture. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, 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 what happened? <coughs> Jimmy. Oh, that's the first time I ever saw anyone choke on a matzo ball. <laughs> I probably surprised him with my offer. <coughs> yes, you certainly did. <laughs> uh, but, Jack, uh, uh, the only reason I can't accept it is because I have so many other commitments. Well, Jimmy, we can make it after you fulfilled your other commitments. But, Jack, after that, I want to take a vacation. No buts, Jimmy, my boy. Look, at I'll make a big star out of you. Now, you gotta let me make this picture with you. Now, what's the salary you usually get per picture? $200,000. <laughs> Water, it's on the floor. So are you. Huh? Oh, yes. Uh, Jack, uh, you better discuss this with Jimmy some other time. It's getting late, and the whole gang will be waiting at the studio for rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'll get the check. Waiter, waiter, our check. Waiter, waiter. Jack, just call him. Don't wave your toupee. <laughs> Jimmy, this isn't a toupee. It's just a small hairpiece. Hairpiece? I'd like to have a fur coat like that. I'd like to have you read your line right. <laughs> Look, Jack. What? Suppose I run along and start the rehearsal. Well. Well, see you later, Jack. Goodbye, Jimmy. So long, Mary. Say, Jimmy, have you heard the way people are talking about Mary lately? Talking about Mary? Yes, I hate to see this, uh, say this, really, but, but have you noticed... <laughs> Have you noticed how she always leaves the table just before they bring the check? <laughs> you know, it's embarrassing, you know? I hate to see it, too, you know? But anyway, Jimmy, getting back to the picture I want you to do for me. Now, I have a story. E excuse me for interrupting, but I happen to have a snapshot of you, Mr. Benny. Would you mind autographing it? Oh, I'd be happy. Say, Jimmy, would you mind lending me your fountain pen? Not at all. Here you are, Jack. Thanks. Now, let's see. With my very best wishes, Jack Benny. Here you are, lady. Uh, thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. Oh, wait a minute, lady. This is Jimmy Stewart. Don't you want his autograph? No, but 30 years ago I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Now, look, look, Jimmy, I've got to run over to CBS and rehearse my show. Suppose you come along with me, and we'll discuss a deal for a picture. No, uh, no, Jack, I'd rather not. Here's the check, gentlemen. No, oh, thank you, Julius. No, Jimmy, let me take it. After all, it was your table, and Mary and I barged in. So I insist on paying it. No, no, Jack, I'd feel better if I paid for it. Well, if your health is involved, go ahead. <laughs> I gotta run along and... See, my hands are kind of sticky. Where's my napkin? Oh, here it is. Hmm. I can't pull it up. What's the matter with this napkin? You've got my shirt tail. <laughs> no, no. Well, here, I'm, I'm through with it. Um... Go <laughs> so on, Jimmy. Goodbye, Jack. I didn't realize it was so late. I hope they started the rehearsal without me.
I'm here now. I'm here now. Oh, hiya, Jack. Well, hello, Jack. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, kids. Uh, by the way, Jack, did Jimmy Stewart agree to let you produce his next picture? Well, not yet, Mary, but I'm sure he'll come around to talk to me about it. <laughs> now, come on, kids. We've got a rehearsal to do, so let's get started. Mr. Benny, I've read over my part three times already. Well, good, Dennis. It's nice to know that you're diligent. Diligent? Are we doing a gangster sketch? That's diligent! <laughs> Well, don't I get nothing for being close? No. <laughs> and Phil, look at Phil, watch your cue. Now, you come into the sketch on page 21. 21? Yes. That's all your fingers, all your toes, and one more. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mary, in this sketch, you're going to play the part of Dennis's wife, and you've just gotten married. Uh, Dennis and I are newlyweds? Yes. And you're in Niagara Falls on your honeymoon. Where am I? <laughs> what? I don't know about you, kid, but I'm on page 22. <laughs> That's 21. I got 11 toes. <laughs> Phil, you miscounter. Try again. Now, Mary, as soon as we try... Jack, what was that? I don't know. Who fired that shot? I did. That reverberation you just heard was the result of a firearm that I discharged to test the acoustical quality of the studio. Acoustical quality? Who are you? I'm Herbert, your sound effects man. Oh, oh. Well, look, Herbert, don't try any more shots. All I want are the sound effects that are written into the script. Well, you can depend on me, Mr. Benny. For years, I have devoted my artistry to dramatic shows, and I have mastered the most difficult sound effects ever heard on radio. Really? Yes. Oh. One in particular baffled every sound effects man in the industry. But by perseverance and sheer ingenuity, I managed to reproduce it. I see. It was on the prudential hour. The scene was a moonlit night, and two lovers were dancing out on the patio. Oh, yes, yes, I heard that show. As the soft music filled the balmy summer evening, the two lovers drew closer and closer until his cheek lightly brushed against hers. That was the most delicate sound effect of all. Well, I should imagine it was. How did you get the sound of his cheek delicately brushing against hers? I slapped a hot water bottle with a piece of raw liver. <laughs> Gosh! <laughs> Say, those are the kind of effects we need on our show. Now, Mary, I'll write a scene where you brush my cheek, you know, against your, your cheek against mine. See? But, Jack, liver's 90 cents a pound. Uh, well, just kick me in the pants. It's cheap. <laughs> now, Don, let's take the rehearsal from that scene where we're in the house and there's a knock on the door. Okay, Jack. Herbert, uh, give us a knock on the door. No, no, Herbert, a little louder. Herbert, that still isn't loud enough. Uh, why is the knock so soft? I use Jergens. <laughs> oh. Well, then maybe we ought to have a doorbell instead of a knock. There, that's more like it. Well, I didn't do that. What? Jack, there's really someone at the door. Huh? Oh, oh, Don, you're near the door. Open it, right? Say, Jack, it's Jimmy Stewart. You see, Mary, what did I tell you? Came after me already. Come on in, Jimmy. Thanks. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, Jack, I hate to break in on your rehearsal like this, but there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, Jimmy, it's quite all right. We have plenty of time. Not me. I got to go to Niagara Falls and meet Mary. <laughs> Dennis, be quiet. Now, Jimmy, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? It's about the picture. You see, Mary? Now, Jimmy, we can start production on the picture just as soon I as I mean we... the picture you autographed at the Derby. <laughs> you kept my fountain pen. <laughs> Oh, oh. I wouldn't have bothered, but it's a lifetime pen, and I'm young yet. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, here's your pen, Jimmy. Thanks. Now, Jimmy, let's get back to business. I know you made a swell picture call. You gotta stay happy. But I can do so much for you that... Jack, why don't you leave him alone? Can't you see that Jimmy's not interested? But, Mary, I can help him. He doesn't need help. He's already won an Academy Award. An Academy Award, Jimmy? For what picture? Philadelphia story. Who cares about Philadelphia? I'm going to Niagara Falls. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> now, be quiet. 
You know, uh, Mary, you know, uh, you're just about the only sensible one around here. <laughs> and you know something else? I, I think you're very pretty, too. Oh, Jimmy, do you... Do you really mean it? Yeah, sure, of course I do. Come over here, Mary. You know, you have, you have such beautiful eyes and such a lovely complexion. Oh, Jimmy. And maybe sometime I could take you out dancing in the moonlight. Just the two of us, maybe, and out on the patio. He's getting close to her, Herbert. Get ready with the liver. <laughs> Get bigger laughs than comedians. Now look, Jimmy. Jimmy, let's settle, let's settle that picture deal we've been talking about. Well, Jack, I, I, you're supposed to be I, mad I, here. Oh, I, I, <laughs> uh, Jack, I just can't make with a picture with you this year. Got to be a ward. He can't read. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack, I just can't make a picture with you just you. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me yeah. I'm going over to dressing room G I have to look over a dramatic script Oh, that's right next door, Jimmy I'll show you where it is Kids, I'll be back in a minute So, Jimmy, as I pointed out to you, it'll be to your advantage to make this picture for me. Jack, now, you've been talking to me for an hour and a half since we came into the dressing room here. Now, will you please just let me lie here and relax? How about it, will you? Okay, okay, Jimmy. See you later. Yeah, da dee da dum da dee da dum da dee da dee da da dum He'll be back, da dee da da Oh, Don! Don, bring the quartet in now. We'll go over the commercial. Well, Jack, we're going to have a little difficulty with the sportsmen this week. They're having trouble with their wives, and they're all upset. What? Yes, yes, Jack. It's terrible. Their wives want to leave them. All four of them? <laughs> Don, I've never seen a quartet like that. When one has a cold, they all have cold. When one has a headache, they all have headaches. Don, I don't care if they're having trouble with their wives or not. We've got to have a commercial. Now, where are they? Well, they're in the dressing room talking to the wives on the phone. Oh, my goodness. Come on, Don. We'll go in and talk to them right now. And I can't imagine four fellas having the same trouble at the same time. Well, here's their dressing room. Let's go in. Look, Jack, they're still on the phone pleading with their wives. Yeah. Say it isn't so. Say it isn't so. Everyone is saying you don't love us. Say it isn't so. Gee, that's awful. I'm sorry. Everywhere we go. Boys, boys. Everyone we know. Fellas, fellas, look. Whispers that you're really going to leave us. Say it isn't so. Boys, I'm sorry for you, but I need a commercial. Please don't go away. Fellas, really, I need a commercial. Promise you will stay. Boys, look, a commercial. We will fill the house with lucky strikes. You'll get them every day. Thank heaven. Lucky strike is better than the rest. You'll feel your level best. Don't leave us, darling. <laughs> Say it isn't so. <laughs> Boys, I know you're upset, but look at, don't cry. Look at, I'll talk to your wife. I'm sure everything will be all right. Tell us, look at, right now I need a commercial. Tell us, it'll be all right. Look, I need a commercial, boy. LSMFT means fine tobacco, fine as you can grow. That's why we're happy. Baby, please don't go. Don, Don, you better take them home. 
better take them home. Don, take them home. Maybe they'll feel better tomorrow. I'll see you later, Don. Yeah, I hate to see those fellows so upset. I hope they settle things with their wives. But then that's their worry, not mine. Oh, Jack. Huh? Oh, hello, Jimmy. Jack, uh, I came out here to talk to you. Yes, yes, about the picture. No, not about the picture. Then what is it, Jimmy? Jack, I realize now that when you took my fountain pen and the brown derby, you wanted me to follow you around. What? So, uh, when you took me into the dressing room, told me to lie down and relax and put my feet up on the chair, I should have known you were up to something. Huh? Jack, uh, give me back my shoes. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, your shoes. Here you are, Jimmy. I'll thank you for my socks, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, your socks. Now, Jimmy, as long as you've got a few minutes while you're putting on your shoes and socks, let's talk about the picture. Now, if you will just... Now, try... no more talk, Jack. I told you I have too many commitments, and that settles it. Okay, Jimmy, but if you just change your mind, come around and see me. Well, I you? won't change my mind. Say it isn't so. <laughs> Little does he know. <laughs> la, 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 la. Now, come on, kids, let's finish the rehearsal and make it snappy. Rochester's waiting for me out in the parking lot with my car. Well, Mr. Benny will be out in about a half hour. I better start warming up the motor. <laughs> there must be something wrong with the battery again. I better take a look. Now, let's see. There's the battery, and it has the positive and the negative. Then there are the sparks. The sparks are supposed to go from the electrons to the electrodes. Or maybe they go from the generator to the distributor. Or then again, maybe they go from NBC to CBS. <laughs> yeah, I think this loose wire here is the trouble, so I'll just fasten it and... Hello, Rochester. Huh? Oh, hello, Mr. Stewart. Say, has Mr. Bennett come out of the studio yet? No, but he should be any minute. Uh, by the way, Mr. Stewart, I was over to your house the day before Christmas. Mr. Bennett had me drop off a package for you. Did you get it? Yes, but this time there was too much starch in the collars. <laughs> well, don't look at me. I'm rough dry. Mr. Bennett's the starch man. <laughs> oh, I see. You know, Rochester, your boss amazes me. How long has he been in the laundry business? Oh, a long, long time. Say, hey, Mr. Stewart, you were born May 8th, 1911, weren't you? Yes, that's right. How'd you know? You used to take our diaper service. I did? <laughs> yeah. It broke Mr. Benny's heart the way you and Gary Cooper grew up so fast. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Rochester, I still can't understand a man of Mr. Benny's position having a laundry service in his home. Oh, the laundry is just a sideline. A sideline? Uh-huh. Mr. Benny does more business in his living room than Eastern Columbia, Broadway at night. <laughs> yeah. On Dollar Day, you can't get near the joint. All right, Rochester. Are we ready to go? Yes, boss. All set. Good. Now, first, I want you to drive me to... Uh, Jack, hmm? I'd like to see you for a second. Oh, hello, Jimmy. So you finally changed your mind and you want to appear in my picture. Huh? No, 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 it's not that. There's uh, something I'd like to ask you. What is it? Now, look, uh, Jack, I, you've been using little tricks so I'd follow you around all day, hmm? Well, yes, I must admit I did. You're, you're not angry, are you, Jimmy? Oh, no, no, no. But tell me one thing. What is it, Jimmy? I, 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 I know how you got my fountain pen. Uh-huh. I can even figure out how you got my shoes and my socks. Yeah. But how in the name of heaven did you get the filling out of my tooth? <laughs> I'll tell you when we finish the picture. Come on, Rochester, drive us home. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment. But first, smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. You see, Lucky's fine tobacco picks you up when you're low, calms you down when you're tense. Put you on the right level to feel and do your level best. It's good to know that fine tobacco can do this for you. And that's why it's so important that you select and smoke the cigarette of fine tobacco Lucky Strike. For as every smoker knows, LSMFT, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. 
The experts, men who know tobacco, look to Lucky Strike for their own personal smoking enjoyment. Yes, more independent auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen smoke Luckies regularly than the next two leading brands combined. So next time you buy cigarettes, ask for Lucky Strike and get on the Lucky Level, where there's real joy in living, where it's fun to be alive. The Lucky Level, where you feel and do your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. Get on the Lucky Level, where it's fun to be alive. Get a carton of Luckies and get started today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Jimmy Stewart for following me around on my program today. And next Sunday, listen in to CBS lineup. The Prudential Hour, Spike Jones. Jack. Just a minute, Jimmy. And after Spike Jones comes Jack Benny, that's me, and my guest will be Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Jack. Jimmy, just a minute. Jenner's name is Nandy. Sam Spade. Jack, I've got to talk to you. And then there's Life with Luigi, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes. Jack. What is it, Jimmy? I want to go home. Give me my pants. <laughs> there you are. Good night, folks. Don't forget the new Lucky Strike program, your Lucky Strike starring Don Amici, heard every weekday afternoon over most of these stations. <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good health to all from Rexall. Yes, it's Sunday. Time for the Bill Harris Alice Faye Show. Presented by the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist taking a little time from behind the prescription counter this Sunday evening to speak for all 10,000 of us. The 10,000 independent druggists who have added the word Rexall to our own store names. You can always tell us by the orange and blue Rexall sign on our windows. The sign means that we carry the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. They range all the way from aspirin to penicillin, and they're as fine and pure and dependable as science can make them. We independent druggists recommend them to our customers because we know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show. Written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, Robert North, Janine Roos, Anne Whitfield, Walter Sharp and his music, yours truly, Bill Foreman, and starring Alice Faye and Phil Harris. Most of you must remember that first ordeal of your childhood having your tonsils removed. This minor crisis has struck the Harris family. And as we look in, Alice is trying to comfort her frightened patient. Now look, honey, you mustn't cry. Having your tonsils removed doesn't hurt a bit. You get to stay overnight at the hospital, and in the morning they give you a big heaping plate of ice cream. I don't care. I don't want my tonsils out. I don't want them out. Do you hear me? Why not? Well, because I've become attached to them. <laughs> They're part of me, and I've learned to love them. Daddy, there's nothing to it. When the doctor removed my tonsils, I didn't mind it. Didn't it hurt? Nah. <laughs> I didn't mind when he took mine out, either. You'll be at the same hospital we were. Oh, it's a lot of fun. They put you to sleep. And when you wake up, a beautiful nurse comes in with a plate of ice cream. When I'm suffering, I don't want a blonde or brunette. (laughs) Tutti frutti. (laughs) Tutti frutti? What kind of color hair is that? (laughs) Look, Alice, do I have to have my tonsils taken out today? Can't I put it off for a while? After all, I'm too young for this type of operation. Too young, he says. What do you want to do, wait until you're 60? No, no, but I think a man should have his tonsils removed when he's 40. Why didn't you? (laughs) Now, Phil, you can't postpone it. 
The doctor's made arrangements at the hospital. He's going to operate this afternoon, and that's that. No. Alice, look, I hate to talk about it, but... Well, I've got to know. Now, when he cuts my tonsils out, will... Will I lose much... (laughs) B-L-U-D? Not more than two K W A R T Z. <laughs> what do you think they're talking about, Phyllis? I don't know. They must have a language all their own. <laughs> now, girls, run along outside and play, huh? Oh, Alice, I'm scared. Now, Phil, the doctor said it's a very simple operation. It's ridiculous to fret about it. Ridiculous to fret, she says. What am I supposed to do before I go on my operation? Increase your life insurance, Philip. (laughs) One of these days, I'm going to dull his pinking shears. (laughs) Go further than that, I'll tear up every one of his butterick patterns. Philip, you're a fortunate man. It's a wonderful day for a tonsillectomy. Oh, the day's got to be nice yet. (laughs) Where do you think I'm having this done? At the Hollywood Bowl? No, but a nice day makes one feel more cheerful. By the way, who's performing the operation, Philip? Dr. Stanley Emmerman. Oh. Well, we all have to go sometime. <laughs> Personally, I prefer Dr. Arthur J. Rando. <laughs> You know Dr. Immerman is a wonderful surgeon. Why, he's been our family doctor for years. That's right. Only last year he treated Aunt Harriet for poison ivy. May she rest in peace. (laughs) He treated her for poison ivy and she cut. The operation's off. Let's forget it. We're a little late, folks. Good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting. Bong, bong, bong. Bill, come back here. Willie is just teasing you. Aunt Harriet was 102 when she died. Of what? Of what? (laughs) He was crowning the plate and Bob fell a beander with a fast one. (laughs) Now that I don't believe at all. Go ahead, laugh, laugh, make jokes about it. Nobody in this house cares. The only one who realizes the seriousness of this thing is Frankie. When I told him... Hi, Alice, I brought the beer over for Curly's wake. Too bad. Frankie. Oh, are you still alive? <laughs> Thought you were having your tonsils taken out today. Not until this afternoon. Gee whiz, Frankie, don't you feel sorry for me? Why should I? A simple operation. I had mine taken out last year. How was it? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Why, do you know that after the operation, I couldn't eat any solid food? I was on a liquid diet. <laughs> Oh, that must have been a harrowing experience. <laughs> well, it was. For two weeks, I had to send back the fruit out of the old fashioned. <laughs> but you have nothing to worry about if you have a good doctor with a steady hand. Who is cutting your tonsils out? Dr. Emmerman. Emmerman? Oh, you mean old Butterfingers. <laughs> Cut that kid. Dr. Emmerman is the best surgeon in town. How much is he charging you? $75. $75? That's highway robbery. You don't have to pay that kind of money. Well, where could I get it done cheaper? I know a guy. (laughs) Look, Remley, you can forget about a guy. No, no, he'll clip him out quick. He used to do all the clipping in the army. Well, what... What was he, a barber? (laughs) Of course not. He's the guy who used to go up ahead and snip the barbed wire. (laughs) Must you jest at a time like this? Pardon. No, but do you realize that an awful thing could happen to me, Remley? This operation could affect my voice, and I won't be able to sing anymore. True. (laughs) 
But what awful thing could happen? <laughs> now, wait. Just a minute, Mr. Remley. My voice happens now, to... Now, take it easy, Curly. I'm only kidding. I guarantee nothing will happen to your voice. How do you know? You're just saying that to make me feel good. I'll tell you what, Frankie. I'll sing for you now. And listen closely, Frankie. Remember, this may be the last time you'll ever hear me sing. Well, you're just saying that to make me feel good. <laughs> Now, Elmer Jones arose at dawn and put his hunt and britches on, then looked up at his shotgun on the wall. He made his mind up then and there to bag himself a hunk of bear at shooting. He had plenty on the ball. He milked the cow and fed the hog, then kissed his wife and called the dog, picked up his gun and started on his quest. He crossed the creek and hit the trees, threw back his head and sniffed the breeze, let out a yell and piled it on his chest. Here Here comes comes Elmer, Elmer. Elmer's got his gun. Here comes Elmer, run, bear, run. He hunted all the morning through, but not a bear came into view while Elmer's thoughts were on the kitchen range. For he was sick as he could be of lamb and chicken fricassee and craved a mess of bear meat for a change. Poor Elmer's mind was in a fog. He paused and sat down on a log to get his faculties back in the groove. He heard a noise, and standing there before him was a grizzly bear and figured it was time he made his move. Here comes Elmer. Elmer's got his gun. Here comes Elmer. Run, bear, run. Grabbed his gun and turned around, but Mr. Bear just stood his ground, and Elmer said, it's either me or thou. The gun refused to go, and so he knew that somebody had to go and said, farewell, I'm leaving as of now. Then Elmer's shoulders sprouted wings, his feet developed inner springs. To linger longer, he was disinclined. He ran so fast through muck and mire, his ankles set his socks afire, and still that bear kept coming on behind. Here comes Elmer, Elmer's got his gun. Here comes Elmer, run, bear, run. A deer with antler eight feet wide got in the way of Elmer's stride as both of them went heading for the brush. And Elmer said, now listen, son, if that's the fastest you can run, move over, because I'm really in a rush. The bear was gaining inch by inch and finally reached out for the clinch as Elmer saw the fence around his place. He leaped the fence and landed hard, jumped 60 feet across the yard and slammed the kitchen door in Bruin's face. Here comes Elmer, Elmer's got his gun. Bear was trying to get inside while Elmer sought a place to hide, and Mrs. Jones began to pull her hair. She said, this fuss has got to stop. Why don't you let that matter drop? And Elmer said, honey, you go tell that to the bear. Then Elmer's wife said, listen, goon, how come you think you're Daniel Boone, whose appetite on bear meat used to thrive? He said, I'm sure that you're aware that Daniel always killed his bear, but honey, I done brought this baby home alive. Here comes Elmer. Elmer's got his gun. Here comes Elmer, run, bear, run! Bill, you'd better get ready. We'll have to leave for the hospital in a few minutes. No, honey. No, I don't. Oh, Frankie, I'm afraid to go to the hospital. Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, Frankie, I don't, I don't want to go. Well, I just, I never wanted well, what's to... wrong with Stella Dallas? I just... <laughs> Go away, Julius. I'm a sick man. Oh, that's a shame, Mr. Harris. What's wrong? I'm going to the hospital for an operation. <laughs> what's so funny? I'm having my tonsils taken out and everybody's laughing. I'm frightened. Frightened about having your tonsils taken? There's nothing to it, Curly. It's a cinch. Yeah, it's easy for you to say that. You don't have to go. Oh, gee. I feel like a condemned man. Well, Phil, it's time to go. (laughs) I don't... I don't... I don't want to go, do you hear me? I ain't gonna go! There's no use fighting it, baby face. Go with the warden. (laughs) Don't crack up now, pal. Walk that last mile like a man. <laughs> Harris is getting his tonight. I can't bear to watch it when the lights dim. Swing low, sweet child. <laughs> Coming for to carry me. Will you guys stop? Oh, oh leave him, Phil. Leave him. 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 Leave
him alone, fellas. Come on, Phil, the chair is... Re I mean the doctor. <laughs> Let's get to the hospital, huh? Hollywood Memorial Hospital. Oh, Mrs. Daniels is resting very comfortably. You're welcome. Nurse, hasn't my wife had her baby yet? No, not yet. Oh, how can she be so inconsiderate? <laughs> how can she torture me like this? Now, Mr. Phillips, just go back to the father's waiting room and relax. I'll call you. Okay, thanks. This is the third time and she always keeps me waiting. I'll never learn. <laughs> Phil, come on, will you? Don't rush me. I want a little time to think it over. Oh, see me drag you. You haven't acted this way since the day I led you to the altar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Is there anything I can do for you folks? No, thanks. We're just browsing. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm Mrs. Harris. Mr. Harris has a reservation for a tonsillectomy. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you. You'll have to wait a few minutes, Mr. Harris. The doctor isn't quite ready for you yet. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Oh, Alice, I feel a little weak. I'm going to sit down. You go ahead, Phil. Never felt so shaky in my life. Oh, here's a waiting room. I'll just go in and sit down and... Oh, hello, mister. Hello. You waiting, too? Yeah, I'm here oh, for... Oh, you don't have to tell me. I recognize the symptoms. <laughs> You look shaky. This must be your first time, huh? I've been through this three times. <laughs> you mean this can happen again? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been known to. Uh, how big are they as a rule? <laughs> The first one weighed seven pounds, three ounces. <laughs> Didn't you have trouble finding collars to fit you? <laughs> what did it look like? It was the image of my wife. <laughs> Your wife must be a very unusual looking woman. Ah, oh, but what a thrill you'll get when they put the little thing in your arm. <laughs> they give it to you? <laughs> what are you supposed to do with it? Wrap it in a blanket and take it home. <laughs> what do you expect to do with yours? Well, I hadn't made any plans for it. <laughs> well, I guess there's time for that. What are you hoping for, a boy or a girl? Do they come in sexes? <laughs> Do they come in... Oh, mister, I'd better have a little talk with you. <laughs> How soon do you expect this event to take place? In about 15 minutes. See, my wife said she'd come in and let me know when the doctor's ready. <laughs> She's coming in and let you... The doctor's almost ready. Oh, okay, honey. Oh, by the way, mister, this is my wife. This is your wife? And in 15 minutes? Oh, excuse me, I gotta get some air. What's the matter with him? He acted awfully peculiar. You'd act peculiar too if you had a wife that looked like a tonsil. <laughs> well, Phil, you'll be going up to the operating room in five minutes. Alice, how can you be so matter of fact about it? Don't you have any feelings? I don't think you care. Oh, you know I care. If you don't believe me, look at me. Once I cared for no one I didn't care if the moon fell apart I went around with a chip on my heart Now look at me Take a look at me, a miracle has happened, 
You sing at a time like this. Gee whiz, how can you be so heartless? Now, Phil, please believe me. I'm not being heartless. Harris, we're ready for you in the operating room. The operating room? Oh, no. No, I'm not going. Oh, I can't go. I could just see them all standing around the table, and the doctor and the nurse and the anesthetist. <laughs> Now, Mr. Harris, lie perfectly still while we administer the anesthetic. <laughs> doctor, I tell you, I don't want my tonsils down. I want to get out of here. Oh, doctor, I want to romp in the fields. I want to feel the sun. I want to feel the rain in my hair. I want to... Oh, feel... shut up! <laughs> doctor, that's no way to talk to an invalid. <laughs> now, Mr. Harris... I'm putting this ether cone over your face, and I want you to count slowly. By the time you reach 15, you'll be asleep. Now, count. 5, 10, 15. I'm not asleep yet. It didn't work. Operation called off on the count of bad ether. See you around, Doc. You're looking good. Get back there. Now, count to 15. Or can't you count that high? <laughs> Don't be a wise doctor. I can do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Jack, Queen, King, A. I'm floating through space. Where are they taking? Oh, oh, today's the day I'm going to be operated on. <laughs> oh, they're all laughing at me. Alice, Frankie, Julius, and Willie. They don't care what happens to me. Look at me. I'm on the operating table and nobody's here. Nurse! Nurse! What's on your mind, kiddo? <laughs> Alice, what are you doing in a nurse's uniform and why are you talking like you used to before you got into picture? <laughs> Here comes the doctor now. <laughs> Thank goodness you're here, doctor. I... You're the doctor? You shut up, Max. <laughs> I'm Dr. Barrett. Julius. No, Paul. Paul Barrett. <laughs> and I'm his assistant, Dr. Seidel. Frankie. No, Homer. Homer Seidel. <laughs> wants the first baseman or the catcher's mitt. <laughs> now, Mr. Harris, what do you want us to take out? We're having a special today. Adenoids, $25. Appendix, $35. Liver, $45. 
With onions, 15 cents extra. <laughs> Fellas, all I want is my tonsil down. Oh, of course. Nice, take his shoes off. My shoes? My tonsils are in my throat. We're doing it the hard way. <laughs> Mr. Alcide, nice, what's the patient's temperature? 101. Pulse, 74. Blood count, 93. <laughs> Only 90 proof somebody's been watering it. <laughs> We're ready, nurse. Hand me my knife. Better sprinkle some ashes on it. Ashes? Yeah, it keeps slipping. <laughs> now open your mouth, Harris. Wait a minute now. Aren't you going to give me ether first? Nah, let's rough it. <laughs> Now, nurse, this is a very delicate procedure, and I'll need your help. I'll approach the tonsil through the esophagus, I'll bypass the larynx, and at that precise moment, you're to apply the suture quickly to the pituitary gland. No kidding! <laughs> I disagree with your prognosis, doctor. There's a more professional way to remove this man's tonsils. How? You tie a finger on him, and I'll open the door fast. <laughs> Never mind, I'll do it the right way. Oh. Forceps. Forceps. Knife. Knife. Scalp him. Hug. That's scalp him. <laughs> oh, he big joke. Tommy Hug. Big joke. Big joke. Shall we go around once more? <laughs> All right, nice. You can help now. Get suture in. Suture in. Suture in. Clamps down. Clamps down. Fire torpedo tube number one. <laughs> Oh, let me out of here. What are you people doing to me? Oh. What happened? Well, they operated on you last night, Phil, and you're doing fine. They took out my tonsil. Tell me, Alice, who does it look like? Oh. <laughs> well, he, he's still a little delirious, I see. But if you want to see your tonsil, Mr. Harris, I uh, have it right here. May I hold it? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, it's cute. So you're my little tonsil. Good morning, Philip. Oh, no, I got a tonsil that talks like Willie. <laughs> Alice and Phil will be back in just a moment. But first, here's your Rexall family druggist. Every year, accidents in the home and on the highways continue to take more lives than any disease or illness. Yet many of these lives could have been saved by proper first aid. That's why the National Association of Retail Druggists has proclaimed next week National First Aid Week. And during this week, the 10,000 independent Rexall Druggists of America invite you to do two things. First, do everything you can to prevent accidents, but when they happen, be prepared. First, by knowing what to do, and second, by making sure your medicine chest contains all the things you need to do it. Now, your own Rexall family druggist will be glad to tell you the essential first aid items you should always have on hand. What's more, he carries Rexall's complete first aid line. Everything from sterile cotton and handy gauze pads to the proper antiseptics, surgical powder, burn remedies, plus certain Rexall exclusives, like Rexall's new ProCap adhesive tape and Rexall quick bands. He'll also be glad to show you the specially designed First aid kits, priced at 98 cents to $2.10. These always ready, room saving Rexall kits contain all the necessaries for simple first aid, including a manual of first aid instructions. 
Look for these products wherever you see the orange and blue Rexall sign on the window. And remember, when accidents do happen, it's good to know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Alice, honey, I'll be home soon. I'm going down to the taxidermist. What for? I'm going to have my tonsil mounted. <laughs> I think it'll look much better over the fireplace than that moose head. <laughs> this program was produced and directed by Paul Phillips. Included in today's cast were Jacqueline DeWitt, Ted Von Els, and John Beale. The part of Frankie Remley was played by Elliot Lewis, and Julius was played by Walter Tetley. Alice Faye appeared to the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. This is Bill Foreman wishing good health to all from Rexall. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, many of us find it extremely difficult to get up early every morning, but Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, has been doing it for years. Yes, and I've learned one thing about early rising that's helped me immeasurably. Once I jump out of bed, close the window, and do my setting up exercises, there's only one more thing I want to do, and that's to get right back in bed again. <laughs> Last Friday morning, though, I was up and almost dressed by the time my landlady knocked on the door. Time to get up, Connie. I am up, Mrs. Davis. Come on in. I'm trying to get to school early so I can chat with Mr. Boynton for a few minutes before our first class. Is Mr. Boynton still as unapproachable as ever, Connie? I guess so, Mrs. Davis. But you know something? During this past week, I've gotten closer to him than ever before. Really, dear? How did you do that? I've been wearing my sneakers to school. <laughs> I hope I've got time for breakfast before Walter Denton comes to pick me up. There's something he wants to talk to me about before school starts. Well, he can talk to you at breakfast, Connie. My goodness, you've got to keep your strength up some way. We both know you don't get enough sleep. Well, I didn't last night. Minerva slept in here with me, and she was very restless. I don't know what's the matter with that cat lately. Between you and me, Connie, I think she's got something. Between you and me, I think she's got several. <laughs> Maybe it's a mistake to let her get so friendly with the collie next door. They play together all the time, you know. Oh, so that's the source. Mm -hmm. Minerva had me up half the night with her pounding. That's just her tail beating on the floor while she's hunting. Well, I don't mind her tail thumping so much, but every time she catches something with one paw, she applauds with the other three. Suppose we join Minerva in the breakfast nook. I've just given her some milk. Fine, I'll have a saucer full, too. <laughs> Sit right down, dear. I'll boil you a couple of eggs. And just one egg will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. Well, I... Oh, <coughs> Walter... That must be Walter Denton now. Just six eggs will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. The door isn't locked. Come in, Walter. Ah, oh, hiya, Miss Brooks, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. How do you want your eggs, Walter? Uh, quickly, please. <laughs> you have any breakfast yet? Oh, sure, but it's 7.30 almost, and we eat an awful early breakfast at my place. How early? Quarter to seven. <laughs> I don't know how you're still standing up. <laughs> I'll whip up an omelet for all of us. Miss Brooks, I'd like to ask you about something. What's that, Walter? Well, as you know, Halloween is usually celebrated tomorrow night, Saturday. But Harriet Conklin's going up to her folks' bungalow at Crystal Lake for the weekend, so we wondered if it would be all right with you if we celebrated the holiday tonight. Well, why come to me? Shouldn't you contact the Goblins Union? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to sort of have a little party. You know, Harriet and my pal Stretch Snodgrass and I, and... Uh, we were planning on inviting you, too. Oh? Uh, where were you planning on holding this party, Walter? At your place. <laughs> How nice of you to invite me along. But I'm afraid we couldn't have any Halloween parties here, Walter. After all, I don't own this cottage. I just rent a room for Mrs. Davis. Oh, we've already got her permission. She's going to the movies tonight. Harriet asked her on the phone yesterday. 
It's just up to you, Miss Brooks. Well, I'm afraid I'm not interested in Halloween parties, Walter. I've got quite a bit of work to catch up on, and tonight looks like an ideal time to do it. Sorry, but you'll have to hold your party someplace else. Gee, Miss Brooks, Harriet and Stretch will be awfully disappointed. And so will Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? Yeah. I was talking to him yesterday, and he was saying what swell fun he always thought Halloween was when he was a kid. And then we invited him to the party, too, and he accepted. And now there's no place to have the party. What's wrong with having the party right here? <laughs> Hello, Principal's office. Osgood Conklin himself speaking. Hello, Osgood. It's me, Martha. We've been married 18 years, woman. I know your name. <laughs> Do try not to be so testy. Do you realize that you left home this morning without even saying goodbye? Well, that's easily remedied. Goodbye. <laughs> Wait, Osgood. I just called to remind you about your doctor's appointment this morning. He said he wanted to see you before we go to Crystal Lake tomorrow. I am well aware of that fact. I've had plenty of time to think about it during the sleepless hours I spent listening to your dog thumping his tail at the foot of our bed all night. <laughs> but Prince was so lonesome, dear. After all, we've got each other. He's all alone. Well, he wasn't alone last night. <laughs> I never heard such scratching in all my born days. What's he got, anyway? Well, he can't possibly have anything, dear. You know he doesn't play with other dogs. In fact, he would have died of loneliness last week if I hadn't taken him over to Mrs. Davis's to play with her cat, Minerva. <laughs> well, you've got to keep him away from me. My blood pressure is higher than it's been in years. To make my morning complete, when I bent down to tie my shoelaces, my glasses fell off. Did they break? Not until I straightened up and stepped on them. <laughs> Crystal Lake, that will make a new man of you. Now go down to the doctor's and get a nice sedative to take with you. Very well, Martha. It's a good thing I have an extra pair of glasses with me or I couldn't find my way to the door. Now, whatever you do, Osgood, don't break those. Thank you, my dear. I think that's sterling advice. <laughs> Goodbye. No, it's later than I thought. I'd better hurry. Walter, if we all meet in the cafeteria at lunchtime, we can make the plans for... Oh! Good. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I presume. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Conklin. I didn't see you coming. Oh, dear, I seem to have broken your glasses. Do you have another pair? No, Miss Brooks, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps I could get you a long stick and let you smash the windows in my office! <laughs> You seem to be in quite a hurry, Mr. Conklin. Could I maybe take you somewhere? Who is speaking? <laughs> it's me, Walter Denton. Your daughter Harriet's dream boat. <laughs> My daughter Harriet's... I'll talk to you later, Miss Brooks. Denton, pick up that shattered glass. Yes, sir. Well, what should I do with it, Mr. Conklin? Eat it, you lame brain gun! <laughs> Gosh, Mr. Conklin's sure in a bad mood today. He looks pretty purple, doesn't he? Even for him. He certainly is excitable. Hi, Walter. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hi. Hello, Harriet. Did you run into Daddy yet this morning? It's in the hands of the insurance company now. <laughs> His temper's pretty miserable today. Yes, I know. Poor Daddy's been depressed all week long. I don't know what it is. We all try to please him. What he needs is some recreation and diversion. Say, I have an idea. What is it, Miss Brooks? Well, instead of my place tonight, why don't we have our Halloween party at your house, Harriet? That way we could surprise your father and cheer him up a little bit. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Miss Brooks, you've done it again. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. Eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over two years. 
One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate's right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate dental cream is directed, using Colgate's exclusively, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research indicates decay is caused by mouth acids which are at their worst after meals or snacks. Brushing teeth with Colgate's as directed helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Yes, Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. So remember, always use Colgate dental cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Anxious as I was to get back into Mr. Conklin's good graces, I determined to make the Halloween party Friday night a roaring success. I had asked the kids to meet me in the school cafeteria at lunchtime, and the first one to show up was Madison's star athlete, Stretch Snodgrass. Although a whiz on the football field, Stretch's outstanding scholastic achievement occurred during a test last week when he spelled his name correctly. <laughs> I was having a cup of coffee when he approached my table. Here I am, Miss Brooks. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, Stretch, but wouldn't you like to bring some food over before we discuss the party? Oh, no, ma'am. I already ate. Please, Stretch. <laughs> I've already eaten. Oh, good. Then we can get right down to business. <laughs> Walter said he thought we all ought to masquerade as something tonight. That's a fine idea, Stretch. You could come as a student. <laughs> I got my outfit all set, Miss Brooks I got some chaps home and spurs and, and two six-shooters that shoot real blanks I'm coming as Hopalong Cassidy That is, if nobody minds Why should anybody mind? Unless Roy Rogers shows up <laughs> What are you going to masquerade as, Miss Brooks? Oh, I haven't made up my mind yet, Stretch Of course, every good Halloween party should have a witch Yes, I might come as a witch Perfect <laughs> Don't sound so enthusiastic. It's pretty short notice to get a costume made, and I may not... Why go to all that trouble? Why don't you just wear what you got on? <laughs> Big as he is, I'll have to slug him. Now, look, Stretch, I... Hi, Miss Brooks, Stretch. Well, things are sure shaping up. Look at these swell noisemakers I bought this morning. When did you find time to get all this junk, Walter? I sneaked out of one of my morning classes. Walter, you didn't. Well, it was important, Miss Brooks. Besides, there's no harm done. Nobody even noticed I was gone. That's what I like, a nice, observant teacher. Oh, it wasn't the teacher's fault. You were facing the blackboard at the time. <laughs> hey, look at this horn. It's got a siren in the mouthpiece. Listen. Please, Walter, you're in the cafeteria. So what? One more blast like that, and the beef stew will pull over to the right. <laughs> Now, tell me, how are you going to the masquerade? I got a terrific idea, Miss Brooks. I'm just going to put on an old sheet. Do you think Mr. Conklin will get a kick out of me as a ghost? If he thought it was on the level, it would add ten years to his life. <laughs> <laughs> what are you coming as, Miss Brooks? Oh, I haven't quite decided yet. Any suggestions? Well, just one. I don't want you to think I'm being fresh or anything, but, well, this is going to be a Halloween party, and, well, I'd be glad to furnish you with a broom. <laughs> I guess I'm a natural for it uh, Look who's coming over Oh, it's Mr. Boynton Hello, Mr. Boynton Hello, Walter Hello, Mr. Boynton Hello, Stretch Hello, Miss Brooks Hello, Mr. Boynton Goodbye, Walter Goodbye, Stretch <laughs> We ain't going nowhere Stretch Don't you know the old expression Two's company, three's a crowd well, Sure I do But there's four of us <laughs> Come on, Stretch. we got to help Harriet figure out a costume for tonight. Huh? See you later, folks. Yeah, see you later, folks. Oh, so long, boys. Well, Miss Brooks, I think it's a splendid idea you're giving this little surprise party for our principal tonight. It should do him a world of good. It should do us a world of good, too, if he brightens up a bit. What kind of an outfit do you think you'll wear, Mr. Boynton? Well, I've got a skeleton costume home that I used to have quite a bit of fun with in my college days. It's just a black, tight-fitting garment with a bunch of bones hanging on it. Bones? <laughs> yes, they're treated with a phosphorescent paint that makes them glow in the dark It's quite a startling effect, the more so since I gathered the bones when I was an anatomy student From anyone I know? <laughs> I, 
I don't mean to dwell on it, Miss Brooks, but I find bones a rather fascinating subject, don't you? That depends on what they're wrapped up in. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, how, how are you masquerading tonight? Oh, I don't know. If you're coming as a skeleton, maybe I'll come as a bottle of vitamins. <laughs> I'm really a little stumped, Mr. Boynton. What do you think I should be? Well, the two most popular figures associated with Halloween are a black cat and a witch. And I'm much too tall for a cat. <laughs> Walter! Oh, Walter! Yes, Miss Brooks? Get a lube job on that broom, boy. Constance Brooks rides tonight. <laughs> I'm glad we're going away in the morning, Martha. Dr. Benson told me I'm very close to the breaking point. Yes. Of course, Oswald. <laughs> Don't shout so. <laughs> he said that some of my trouble was caused by my blood pressure, but that part of it was due to an overactive imagination. He wants me to be calm, relax more. <laughs> I'd like to see him relax with that recurring dream I've had. You mean the one where the ghost visits you at night? Yes. yes. Only the last couple of times it's gotten worse. Instead of a plain ghost, I've been getting one with Walter Denton's head on it. Really, Osgood, I, I just don't know what you've got against that poor boy. Harriet's very fond of him. Then she should see a doctor, too. <laughs> Where is she, Martha? Well, she's in her room, dear, getting dressed. She said something about a party tonight. Party? It's all kids nowadays think about there won't be any parties at Crystal Lake. There won't be any nightmares either. Why, Martha, do you realize that while I was sitting in the doctor's office today, I saw a bulldog by his desk? A bulldog? It was the shadow of his umbrella stand. But I almost jumped out of my skin before he explained it. Things like that happen to people every day, Osgood. Not to me, they don't. At least they'd better not. How do you think the Board of Education would like it if they thought one of their principals went around seeing bulldogs? <laughs> Just don't mention it to anyone, darling. Now I'm going to get you a glass of warm milk, and you stay right comfy in your chair till I get back. You're very well. <laughs> yes. That thing looked like a bulldog. <laughs> Martha's right, though. I'd better not mention it to a soul. Now, who in the world can that be? Coming! Good evening, Mr. Conklin. May I come in? There's no tactful way I can refuse you admission. <laughs> Come in, Miss Brooks. Have the others arrived yet? Others? What others? You'll see when they get here. Is Harriet at home? Yes, yes. She's putting on her party dress. Oh, then you know about it. It should do you a lot of good, Mr. Conklin. There's nothing like a house full of people to get your mind off yourself. A house full of... Uh, Miss Brooks, is this party to be given in this house? Of course. I see. Then if you'll excuse me, I'll just take my hat and coat and beat an orderly retreat. But, Mr. Conklin... My doctor has forbidden any excitement whatsoever. Your doctor? This is a fine time to tell me. I mean, I didn't know you were in such bad shape, Mr. Conklin. I am on the verge of a nervous collapse, Miss Brooks. But I don't want to spoil everybody's fun. I'll just leave quietly. Leave? But, Mr. Conklin, where will you go? What's the difference where I go? I'll just wander around the park like a homeless gypsy. You can't do that. You wouldn't look good in earrings. I mean, <laughs> you're not a well man, Mr. Conklin. Look, Mrs. Davis is going to the movies tonight. Now, why don't you let me drive you over to our place until I can eliminate the horde of pests, uh, guests who are coming here? <laughs> You'll love it over there, Mr. Conklin. You'll be able to relax completely. If it will stave off my breakdown, Miss Brooks, it's the least I can do for my family. Miss Brooks left right after dinner, Mr. Boynton. I guess she forgot to buy a few items for the party tonight. I'm sure she'll be right back. Fine. Swell. This way our surprise will work out even better. Surprise? Yes, ma'am. We thought we'd try out some of our Halloween tricks on Miss Brooks before we go over to Mr. Conklin's house. That's a wonderful idea. I hope I didn't scare you in my ghost outfit. No, I thought you were the laundry man. <laughs> How do you like my costume, Mrs. Davis? My, 
You've lost weight, haven't you? <laughs> this, this is a skeleton suit in honor of Halloween. <laughs> Isn't that terrifying? And who's this cowboy with you? I'm Hopalong Cassidy, Mrs. Davis, but I'm really Stretch Snodgrass. <laughs> I'd never have known. Well, if you'll all go into the house, I'm sure Miss Brooks will be delighted to see you. I've got to get down to the theater now. Oh, what movie are you seeing tonight, Mrs. Davis? Jolson sings again, again. <laughs> again, again? I saw it last week also. <laughs> Have a nice time, children. <laughs> what should I do with this bucket of water we're ducking for apples in, Waller? Oh, just put it down by the piano, Stretch. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Before Miss Brooks comes back, let's all hide somewhere so we can really surprise her. Good idea, Walter. Now, why don't you get behind that couch, stretch you, hide behind the kitchen door, and I'll get into the hall closet. Great. Then we'll all come out when I blow this whistle. <coughs> okay? Got you, Walter. Hey, look, out the window. Miss Brooks is coming up the walk, and she's got Mr. Conklin with her. Mr. Conklin? Oh, she probably wanted to get him out of the way while we were getting things ready at his place. So much the better. We'll surprise both of them at the same time. <laughs> now, first I'll put the lights out. Quick, let's get out of sight. Well, here we are, Mr. Conklin. I guess Mrs. Davis has left for the movies. The lights are all out. But it does seem quite deserted in here. I'll turn on this hall light so you can see to hang your things up in the closet. I'll turn some lights on in the living room while you put your hat and coat away. Thank you, Miss Brooks. What? <laughs> Miss Brooks! Miss Brooks! What is it, Mr. Conklin? What's the trouble? Your closet! In the hall! What do you keep in there? <laughs> Just my coat, Mr. Conklin. I see. I see. Tell me, Miss Brooks. Is it a long black coat with luminous bones? <laughs> luminous bones? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, please wait right here, Mr. Conklin. I'll investigate. Oh, it's me, Miss Brooks. You should have seen Mr. Conklin's face when Get he Get was... behind those other coats immediately, Mr. Boynton. But, Miss Brooks... I you... can't explain now, but don't you dare come out of there until you get a signal. Well, Miss Brooks, what did you see? See? Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything, Mr. Conklin. It must have been your imagination. My imagination? <laughs> and the doctor was right. Is that, Mr. Conklin? I'd, I'd rather not talk about it, Miss Brooks. If I could just lie down somewhere. Oh, of course, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> just stretch out on this couch. I'll go get another cushion for you. All right. Uh, uh, that's better. I must be quite a sick man. <laughs> if I weren't sick, I wouldn't be moaning like this. <laughs> On the other hand, it's better than try... What am I saying? I'm not the one who's moaning. I've returned. I've come back. Who's that? Where are you? Look behind you. Behind the cow. Behind the cow. Are you all right? What happened? Miss, Miss Brooks, how long have I been asleep? Asleep? Yeah. You just hit the couch, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Which reminds me, maybe you'd better see a good psychiatrist. This screaming of yours can lead to something dangerous. Just, just do me a favor, Miss Brooks. Look behind that couch. Certainly, sir, if it'll make you feel any better. But I assure you, there's absolutely nothing behind this couch. <laughs> I'm sorry if I startled you, Mr. Conklin, but my cat Minerva's back here. With a sheet? She was making her bed. <laughs> Stay out of sight, Minerva. There's a good <laughs> girl, good boy. A girl. 
If you don't mind, Miss Brooks, I'd like to take a couple of pills my doctor prescribed. May I have some water, please? Certainly, sir. If you've got an extra pill or two, I'll be happy to join you. <laughs> Just sit right here, Miss Conklin. I'll go into the kitchen and get some water. Now, on second thought, you'd better come with me. I don't want you to get nervous again. Yes, I, I think you're right, Miss Brooks. It doesn't do for me to be alone lately. Now, where is that light switch? Well, dog might catch if it ain't roundup time. <laughs> Was that? What was what? Miss Brooks, do you mean to tell me I've actually taken leave of my senses? Oh, it isn't a real leave, Mr. Conklin. You're just on a weekend pass. <laughs> oh, lots of people get temporary hallucinations. Maybe we'd better go back to your house. Yes, yes, at a time like this, I suppose I should be near my loved one. Happy Halloween, Mr. Conklin. Look, it's me. Denton, when did you... How did you... What's this? It's just my coat coming over. Get back to the closet. <laughs> it's me, Mr. Conklin. I'm a skeleton, see? Look at me, Mr. Conklin. I'm hop along Cassidy, and I'll plug the first ombre that makes a move. Snodgrass. i <laughs> Stop that! <laughs> oh, I must be calm. I must control myself. What's wrong, Mr. Conklin? You don't seem to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, you act all jumpy and funny. Gosh, Miss Brooks went to a lot of trouble to get this thing organized. Walter, please. Oh, Miss Brooks organized it, did she? Sure, she planned the whole thing. She deserves every bit of credit. Well, she's certainly going to get it. Miss Brooks, I want to... Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks, get your head out of that bucket. This is no time to be ducking for apples. Well, who's ducking for apples? I'm trying to drown myself. <laughs> Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks. Returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Luster Cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable, even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was so glad to find out that the things he thought had been happening to him had been happening to him that he excused us all and hurried home. Shortly afterwards, I excused Walter and Stretch, which left just Mr. Boynton, the parlor sofa, and me. Well, here we are, Miss Brooks. You know, with that lamplight shining on your hair, you're, you're absolutely... Well... Yes, Mr. Boyne. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo, folks! What's that? Look, at the window, it's Mrs. Davis with a pumpkin head. Just what I needed. Happy Halloween, Connie. Trick or treat. I've got a trick, Mrs. Davis. Here's 60 cents. Treat yourself to Jolson Sings again, again, again. <laughs> Week, we into another Armis Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> Men, here is actual, factual proof of more comfortable, actually smoother shaves by using Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream. 
1,251 men tried the palm olive lather way to shave, described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try palm olive lather shaving cream. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves, the palm olive lather shaving cream way. Be sure to listen to Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's time for My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. Hello, everybody. Yes, it's the new Gay Family series starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning, brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. The puddings. Yes, sir. And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning as Liz and George Cooper, two people who live together and like it. As we look in on the Coopers, it's morning, and there are seven shopping days left until Christmas. George is eating breakfast, and Liz is in the kitchen with Katie, the maid. Katie. Yes, Mrs. Cooper. Have you any idea what George is going to give me for Christmas? Has he said anything? Not a thing. Oh, darn. I've got to find out. Why? Well, I'm knitting him a sweater, and, and if he's giving me something wonderful, maybe a measly sweater isn't enough to give him. Oh. On the other hand, if, if he's giving me some dinky little thing... Why should I knock myself out knitting him a beautiful sweater? <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Cooper. Oh, Katie, you don't think I'm serious. It's the thought behind the gift that counts. It doesn't make any difference to me what kind of a fur coat George gives me. <laughs> well, I wish I could help you. Well, don't worry. I'll find out before he leaves that breakfast table. Here, give me the coffee. I'll take it in. Ooh, jingle bells, jingle bells, dee dee dee. Good morning, dear. Good morning, Katie. What? Oh, oh, I was reading. Uh, good morning, Liz, darling. Mm, how's my little husband this morning? Hmm? Uh, fine, thanks. Well, is there anything I can do for my sweet little ever-loving baby boy? Yes. Hmm? What? Stop trying to find out what I'm giving you for Christmas. <laughs> oh, you. Come on, George. Iris knows what she's getting. Mr. Atterbury's giving her a mink stole for Christmas. How does she know? She already picked it out and charged it to him. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good clue. Are you buying me a mink stole? Mm, if I bought you a mink, it would have to be sole. <laughs> I made a funny. But it wasn't very. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, if you won't tell me what I'm getting, at least you could tell him, give, sort of give me a hint. Oh, all right. It's, uh, it's big. Yes. And it's small. Huh? It also has long, shaggy hair and three wheels, takes out ink spots, and runs eight days without winding. <laughs> That's what your mother gave us last Christmas. It is not. <laughs> Say, we never did find out what that was uh, for, did you, did we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, George. Tell me what I'm getting. Uh, well, I'll tell you this much, though. I've bought it, and it's in the hall closet, and I want you to stay out of there, understand? Understand. All right. Well, kiss me goodbye, honey. I'm late for the bank. Okay. Mm. <laughs> mm. Now, hurry down to the bank. What bank? Uh-oh. I gave him too many volts for this early in the morning. <laughs> goodbye, dear. Bye. Mrs. Cooper. Hmm? Mrs. Cooper. Why are you standing there staring at the hall closet? George told me my present was in the hall closet and then made me promise to leave it alone. Only a man could think of a mean thing like that. 
What are you going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. And then what? <laughs> Katie, you won't find me stooping to snooping. I'm sure I won't. Of course, if there happened to be something in there I needed, I'd have to look in the closet, wouldn't I? Huh? Yes, ma'am. What's in there that I might need? Well, there's your um, umbrella, but the sun is shining. Oh, and... how do you like that, Katie? Suddenly it looks like rain. <laughs> it has seemed to cloud up a little, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, there's my umbrella in back of this big Christmas box. Ooh, look, there's a little tear in the paper. Where? There. <laughs> oh, clumsy me. Well, now it's open. I guess there's no use turning back. Oh, I'm so excited, Katie. I'll bet it's a dress I was hinting about from Miller's department store. <gasps> it's empty. There's nothing in this box. Oh, yes, there is at the bottom. It's a car. Oh, oh, yeah. Let's see what it says. Well, I like that. What's it say? It says, I thought I told you to stay out of here, nosy. <laughs> Well, that settles it. He's going to get a sweater and like it. Pearl one, knit two. Pearl one, knit two. Oops! I dropped a stitch. Oh, dear. Well, I can save it if I just put my needle through this loop. Oops! There goes another. Oh, I guess I should have pulled this through. Oops! Oh, well, I was going to do that row over anyway. Darn it, this is slow work. Are you having trouble, Mrs. Cooper? Oh, I'm having an awful time with this sweater I'm knitting for George. Is that a sweater? Well, what does it look like? That's a very good question. <laughs> oh, I know it's a mess, Katie, and I can't understand it. I followed the directions exactly. Let's see. What's this thing sticking up here? It looks like a sock. It is. It is? Yes. The direction said, purl three inches and then knit a foot. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Cooper, it didn't mean that. I thought it seemed odd. I, I thought maybe I was knitting socks to match the sweater and I could cut them loose later. <laughs> I see. Well, the rest of it is... Wait a minute, what's this hole for? That's the neck. Oh, then what's this hole next to it for? <laughs> oh, how do you like that? I left two openings for his head. <laughs> Mrs. Cooper, you'd better rip it out and start over. No, it's a shame to waste all that work. I ought to give it to someone. Do you know anyone with two heads, Katie? <laughs> Not offhand. Oh, wait, I know. I'll knit a belt on the other end of it, and he can use it for pants. <laughs> No. Oh, I'm not good for anything. I wish I could knit like George's mother can. She doesn't even look at it, and it comes out just perfectly. Oh, that reminds me, Mrs. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Cooper's mother called before and said she was coming over this morning. Oh, Keen. I wonder what nosy Rosie wants. <laughs> she didn't say. Maybe she's just coming over to visit. Ha! Huh? Mother Cooper never comes over just to visit. She comes over to see what I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, what I'm not doing that I should be doing, what I'm doing that if she were doing it, she'd do it a lot better. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Cooper isn't that bad. Let's face it, Katie. She only lives to see how badly I keep house. An unmade bed is like a transfusion to her. Gives her strength to run her finger along a table and see if there's any dust on it. Well, she won't find any dust in this house. Oh, you dreamer. <laughs> No, oh, you can't win, Katie. Sometimes I think she's got dirt tattooed on the end of her finger. Oh, why did she ever move to town? I don't know. But brooding about it isn't going to get this sweater finished. I guess I'll have to rip most of it out. You'll never finish it by Christmas. Well, George will understand. I'll give him, get, give him what I have done and tell him I'll finish it later. Yes, ma'am. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? There she blows. <laughs> Mr. Cooper's mother. Who else walks in without ringing the bell? She knows if she rang it, I'd pretend not to be home. The old, uh, in here, mother. <laughs> I'll sneak upstairs, make the beds in case she goes up there. Oh, 
There you are, Elizabeth. How are you, dear? Fine, Mother Cooper. How are you? Well, here's a sight I never thought I'd see. Elizabeth Cooper dusting. <laughs> I'm not dusting. Oh, then why are you holding that dirty old dust rag? <laughs> That's a sweater I'm knitting. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, dear. I didn't look very closely. Whose dog is it for? <laughs> Yours. <laughs> huh? It happens to be for George. For George? Oh, no! Oh, I could die! Yes, but you won't. <laughs> I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I've hurt your feelings. How could you tell? Uh, come on in, Mother. Pull up a dust ball and sit down. And... Um, Elizabeth, I came over to talk to you about something. Yes? You remember you invited me to spend Christmas with you? Well, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. Oh? Aunt Bessie wrote and told me she's going to be all alone for Christmas. So I think I should go there and spend it with her, don't you? Yes. What was the bad news? <laughs> what? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Well... Gee, I don't know. It means quite a change in our plan. Oh, well, then I... But uh, anything for dear old Aunt Bessie. <laughs> yes, the poor soul was wondering if you and George would mind giving me up just this one Christmas. Only one, huh? <laughs> well, I'll force myself. Uh, go to poor old Aunt Bessie. Oh, well, then it's all settled. I'll go right home and write Aunt Bessie. Aunt Elizabeth... Yes? If I may make a suggestion, dear, I wouldn't bother finishing that sweater if I were you. Oh, you wouldn't? Oh, now, please, Elizabeth. It's no disgrace not to be able to knit. You have other talents. I have? You must have. <laughs> I mean, uh, some wives can knit and some wives can cook and some are beautiful and some are intelligent and you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, um, well, I have to run along, dear. <laughs> Are you driving, or shall I call the Yellow Broomstick Company? <laughs> oh, my Elizabeth, you're so sensitive. Now, if I've said anything, it's just for your own good. My goodness, if I can't make a suggestion, then what am I here for? Oh, you're beginning to wonder, too. <laughs> I'm only trying to help you, dear. I don't want you to be embarrassed. You see, I knitted George a beautiful cashmere sweater. Oh, you did? Yes, and I don't want you to suffer through any comparisons. Well, goodbye, dear. What are you running your finger around the table for? Forget where you parked your gum? <laughs> Would you look at my finger? It's just black with dust. Well, there's only one thing for you to do. Talk to Katie? No, wash your hands. <laughs> that doesn't make your house any cleaner, dear. Oh. Goodbye. Don't bother coming to the door. Oh, Katie. Well, what's the matter, Mrs. Cooper? She's knitted George a sweater for Christmas. No. Yes, yeah, so I have to finish mine, and it has to be better than hers. Give me that knitting. Knit one, purl two. Knit one, purl two. Knit one, purl two. Oops! <laughs> It's dollars to a dish of jello that Liz will have a tough time getting out of that spot. But look, here's a holiday treat for your family they sure won't want to exchange. It's Christmassy jellied mincemeat made with rich red cherry jello. Just prepare cherry jello as usual, and when slightly thickened, fold in one cup of moist mincemeat. Chill until firm in individual molds, and garnish with rum flavored sweetened whipped cream. Good? Why, it's the zestiest holiday dessert that ever made Christmas merry. Sparkling red cherry jello, luscious with tempting mincemeat. All six delicious jello flavors fit right in the holiday mood. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. They're rich with locked in goodness, and they're bright and gay as a Christmas tree. So look for those big red letters on the box. They spell jello, 
And Jell-O is a registered trademark of the General Foods Corporation. J-E-L-L-O. And now back to the Coopers. Liz is still busily working on the sweater that she has vowed to finish for George by Christmas time. Knit one, pearl two, knit one, pearl two, knit one, pearl... Mrs. Cooper. One, pearl two, knit one, pearl... Are you still up, Mrs. Cooper? It's three o'clock in the morning. What day? Oh, I can't help it, Katie. I have to finish this sweater. How's it coming? I don't know. I haven't been able to see for two hours. It feels all right. Let me take a look. Well, you've licked the neck problem. Only one neck hole. Goody. <laughs> What's this thing? What? Oh, that's the sleeve. Oh. And what's this one? That's the other sleeve. Mrs. Cooper. Yes? What's this one? <laughs> oh, no! Three sleeves! Katie, do you know anybody with three... No. No. Well, here I go again. Liz the Ripper. I'm losing ground, Katie. By Christmas, I'll owe the sweater three balls of yarn. <laughs> More coffee, Mr. Cooper? No, thanks. I'm late now. Uh, tell good, uh, Liz goodbye for me, will you? Oh, here's Sleeping Beauty now. Morning, Mrs. Cooper. Morning, Liz. Hello. Uh, uh, um. Open your eyes, dear. They are open. Well, maybe some food will help you. Try this. No, thank you. I don't like tomato juice. Well, that's not tomato juice. It's milk. Why is it red? <laughs> It isn't. That's the glow from your eyes. Ooh. Uh, what were you doing last night, Liz? Oh, just working in Santa's sweatshop. Hmm, making something for me? No. Oh, come on, what is it? Well, give me a hint. Now look who wants a hint. All right, I'll give you the same kind you gave me. It's got three arms, two necks, and a foot sticking out of its back. <laughs> You're knitting me a sweater. What? Oh, that was a pretty wild guess, wasn't it? <laughs> Imagine you knitting a sweater. <laughs> Katie, hand me a knife and tell me where he is. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got to run. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. I thought he knew for a minute. Oh, he's so smart. <laughs> That's just another reason why I have to finish the sweater. Will you get me my knitting, Katie? It's in the hall closet. All right, but I think you should give your eyes a rest. I can't help it. I've got to finish. Mrs. Cooper, did you rewrap that box and put it back here in the closet? No, why? Well, there's another one here. Let's see. Oh, how do you like that? I didn't even see it. That must be my present. Open it, Katie. Me? Yes, then when George asks me if I open it, I won't be lying when I say no. All oh, the things I do. <gasps> oh, it's from Miller's. I, I hope it's... It is, Katie. It's the dress, but it's red. Bright red. Oh, that man. What was he thinking about? I can't wear red with my hair. If I put that dress on, I'd look like an unguentine ad. <laughs> Well, you can get it exchanged for another one after Christmas. No, I can't. They only had one green one my size. Katie, I'm going down and exchange it right now. But what will Mr. Cooper say when you open the box on Christmas and the dress is green? Uh, I'll tell him the color ran. So long, Katie. <laughs> One, pearl two, knit one. Pearl. Yes, ma'am, your name. Uh, just a minute till I finish this row. Knit one, pearl two, knit one. There. And when you get that sweater finished, are you going to try to exchange it? No. No, I'd like to exchange a Christmas present. Yeah, I beg your pardon? I'd like to exchange a Christmas present. Aren't you a little late for last year? 
It's this year's Christmas present. Oh, well, in that case, what day is this? The 20th. (sighs) For a minute, I thought I'd overslept. I uh, just happened to receive this present a little early. Ooh, we've been snoopy, haven't we? Never mind. I'd like to exchange this for a dress that's the right color for my hair. Well, I don't think we have a dress that shade. Why don't you take a black one and give it a henna rinse? (laughs) Oh, I'll bet you're a scream when you get out your chicken inspector badge. Will you exchange this dress or not? Well, I'll exchange it on one condition, that you return my telephone cord. Now, what would I be doing with your telephone cord? Well, I don't know, but you've got it knitted into your sweat. Oh! Well, I'm back, Katie. Did they exchange it? Yes, I got the most beautiful Kelly Green dress you've ever seen. Good. I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Liz. I just talked to Mother, and she's leaving a day earlier than she planned. Oh, how wonderful. For Aunt Bessie. I'm going to bring her by the house uh, to pick up her Christmas presents. You'd better have it ready. Okay, where is it? I put it in the hall closet. (laughs) You did what? I put it in the hall closet. It's a big box from Miller's. Miller's? Yeah, yeah. we'll be there in about an hour, honey. Goodbye. Well, wait a minute, George. Uh... Oh, Katie... I exchanged the wrong present. That dress was for Mother Cooper. No. Yes, and they'll be here in an hour. I'll have to rush down and exchange it again. Wait a minute. Why not let her take the new one? Oh, no, she can't stand green. It clashes with her complexion. I'll see you in an hour, I hope. Uh... Uh, pardon me. Uh, yes, madam. What can I do for... <laughs> uh, I'd like to exchange something, please. Well, what goody have we poked our nose into this time? Now, look. I'm in a hurry, and I want to exchange this dress. Uh, didn't you just exchange a red dress exactly like this? Yes. I- I'd like the red one back in exchange for this green one. Uh, don't tell me. I know. You've rented yourself out as a stop signal. <laughs> Please, I don't have time to explain. Uh, Won't it still clash with your hair? No. Oh, I get it. You're going to dye your hair green. No. You're going to shave your head. All right, I'm going to shave my head and paint it green. Now, may I have my exchange slip? It's certainly here. And this. What? Will you bring your head in and let me see it? I made it. Did you get the red dress back? It's safe in this box. Are they here yet, Katie? Yes. Mr. Cooper and his mother just came in the front door. I told them you were upstairs. Thanks. And, Mrs. Cooper, I worked on the sweater while you were gone. There's only one row left to do. Oh, Katie. I put it back in the desk drawer. Oh, you're a darling. I better get in there and give Mother Cooper her present. (laughs) Hello, Mother Cooper. Elizabeth. Hi, Liz. Hi, honey. Well, Mother, here's your present. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, uh, wait a minute, Liz. You've made a mistake. I've what? Oh, that's not Mother's present. It isn't? No, that's yours. No, 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 no. Well, it's nothing to get excited about. No? I'll get Mother's present. It's up on the shelf in the closet. What are you looking so glum about, dear? It's Christmas time. Be gay and happy. Jingle bells, jingle bells. Oh, go jingle your own bells. (laughs) How's your sweater coming, dear? Or did you give it up? (laughs) No, I didn't give it up. (laughs) It's right here in the desk drawer. Would you care to see it? Yes. Right here. You... Oh, you bought this. No, I didn't. It isn't even finished yet, see? Your cab is here, Mother. Come on. Uh, Coming, baby. Um, Elizabeth, let me see how you finished that neck. Ah, yes. Wonderful. Well, let's go. You just have time to get to the station. Here's your present. Oh, thank you both, you dear children. Goodbye. Bye. See you after the holidays. Goodbye, Mother. Oh. What's the matter? Well, there's something cutting my ankle. Huh. 
It's a piece of yarn. Yarn? Yeah. Look, it goes all the way down the stairs and along the walk and into the cab with Mother. Oh, put your foot on it, George. Break it, quick. Oh, there it broke. I never should have let her near it. I wonder where it comes from. Look, it goes right in the door and along the hall and... into the living room and across the carpet and up on the desk and all. Liz, you are knitting me a sweater. And isn't it wonderful? You've got two inches finished already. Yes, Lucille, where to tonight? Come, Robert, we're going back, back, back to the dawn of civilization, the days of the caveman. Of course, no one will understand caveman language, so I will translate. Wilbur, a little prehistoric music. Oh. Translation. Get up, Neanderthal. Civilization just dawned. Translation. You don't love me, Neanderthal. You haven't hit me on the head with a club lately. Huh? Oh, sorry. I want Jello with its six delicious flavors: ugly, bugly, babby, oing, boing, and lime. Translation: strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and poop. Jello make you think of the real right ogobug itself. Translation: fruit. So look for big red letters on the box. They spell Jello, and Jello spells a treat. Oh, oh. Because the. <laughs> because the flavor is locked in and can't get out till your first delectable spoonful. Translation: Yum yum yum. Good night, Neander Bob. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Christmas and New Year holiday season is a period of neighborly getting together and renewing community ties. It's a time when every American should be even more aware of the individual liberties he enjoys in the United States. And this freedom demands that each of us fulfills our duties as a citizen. To vote, to serve on juries, and to participate in community, state, and national affairs. By making our form of government work better here, we strengthen democracy everywhere. We provide an example of a free government which preserves the rights and the dignity of the individual. So remember, freedom is everybody's job. You have been listening to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning and based on characters created by Isabel Scott Rorick. Tonight's program was produced and directed by Jess Oppenheimer, who wrote the script with Madeline Pugh and Bob Carroll, Jr. Original music was composed by Marlon Skiles and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The part of Katie the Maid was played by Ruth Parrott. Watch for Lucille Ball in the Columbia picture, Miss Grant Takes Richmond. And be sure to listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband again next week. Presented by... J-E-L-L Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O cut. The Oka puddings. Yes, sir. Cabin syrup for mine, 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 mine. With that real Northwoods flavor, so fine, oh, so fine. Blended cane and good maple, it's tops on your table. That real maple flavor does pancakes a favor. It's log cabin syrup for mine, 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 mine. 
Yes, Log Cabin is the syrup with that delicious Northwoods maple flavor. It's America's most popular quality table syrup. Enjoy it on waffles or pancakes for Sunday night suppers, as well as at breakfast. It's Log Cabin syrup for oh my, 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 my. Listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband again next week. Bob Amon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.